Ken Burns, the National Parks. Wednesday night at 9 on Jack's PBS. Can you all live the ultimate retirement? You can. Acclaimed personal finance expert Susie Orman provides essential advice to make your retirement more successful and secure. Every little action that you take can make a tremendous difference. It's never too soon to begin. Fear no more. Susie Orman's Ultimate Retirement Guide. Wednesday night at 11 on Jack's PBS. Celtic Thunder returns to public television with a review show that combines 10 years of Celtic Thunder's greatest hits. Celtic Thunder Ireland features the songs and performances that launch Celtic Thunder into the hearts of public television viewers across the U.S. Tuesday night at 8 on Jack's PBS. Join me on this journey of hope as I celebrate the people, the places, and the cultures that have inspired me. Music and dance, universal languages that can help us unite. Thursday night at 9.30 on Jack's PBS. She's the White House correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, former reporter for the New York Times and USA Today. Join me for a critical look at this week's top news stories. Yamish Alcindor. Our mission is to renew the tradition of firing line for a new generation. Please join me. Friday night at 8.30 on Jack's PBS. Join the American legends of rock, pop, Motown, and doo for a celebration of America's greatest songs. Forty great vocal groups and legends join PBS in an American celebration of freedom. You're watching Jack's PBS More, WJCT Jacksonville. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. The school board of the Duval County School District is now convened in an emergency meeting. Pursuant to board policy 2.26, I, along with and at the request of other board members, have called an emergency meeting to discuss COVID-19 mitigation measures 
an amendment of the section of the student code of conduct previously adopted August 3rd, 2021 pertaining to face masks. This emergency is urgent, is an urgent public necessity as defined by the law, the reasons of which will be set forth in detail at a point later in this meeting. This meeting was properly noticed on August 22nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. and amended and reposted at 9 a.m. on August 23rd, 2021. As a show of courtesy and respect to each other, we ask that all mobile phones be turned off and that no flash photography be used during the meeting. For those wishing to address the board during our public comment portion of the meeting, please note that pursuant to board policy, we accepted speaker cards for this meeting until the published start time for the meeting. In an effort to mitigate against the spread of COVID-19, we have placed hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes at the podium. We ask that each speaker wipe down the, excuse me, wipe down the microphone and the podium before you address the board. The CDC currently recommends that facial coverings are worn while in public if you are in an area of substantial or high transmission, regardless of vaccination status. Thank you for taking the time to join us and for your interest in the operation of the Duval County School District. Approval of the August 23rd, 2021 agenda that the Duval County School Board approved the August 23rd, 2021 agenda as submitted on August 22nd, 2021 with the following changes. Amendment of the section of code of student conduct previously adopted August 3rd, 2021 pertaining to face masks item added. I ask for a motion. So moved. Second. Moved by board member Coker, seconded by board member Jones. Any discussion? Seeing none, I call for your vote. By your action, you have approved the agenda seven to zero. We are now onto the public comment portion of our agenda. The school board welcomes your comments on matters that are before the board for consideration. It is not the board's intent to respond, but to use the input in our deliberations. To give everyone appropriate respect and courtesy, we ask that the audience refrain from audible comments or applause. When you come to the podium, please state your name for the record. Please limit your comments to three minutes. If your concerns exceed that time, you may present written comments to the board. Board policy 2.26 provides for an orderly and efficient meeting without disruption by words or actions. You are asked to refrain from references to specific individuals and to follow expectations for civil discourse. Any speaker or audience member that does not comply with these expectations will be subject to warning and removal from the meeting. In an effort to mitigate against the spread of COVID-19, we have placed hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes at the podium. We ask that each speaker wipe down the microphone in the podium before you address the board. The CDC currently recommends that facial coverings are worn while in public if you are in an area of substantial or high transmission, regardless of vaccination status. Please remember that speaker cards were only accepted until this published start time of this meeting. Thank you for taking the time to address the board. Vice Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. We will start with our first couple of speakers. We'll start with Callie Orr, followed by Hillary Lovelady. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I know we all care deeply about the welfare of our children. My name is Callie, and I'm a mother of two here in Jacksonville. I'm here to say that I strongly oppose any mask mandate for our children. Studies have shown that children are at a low risk of contracting a serious illness due to COVID-19, and they do not play a significant role in the spread of the, the virus. Additionally, there is no statistically significant evidence to suggest that schools with mask requirements have fared any better than those without mask requirements during the 2020-2021 school year. Schools are not hospitals, and you all, the board, are not doctors. 
it should be up to the parent to make the medical decisions for the children and continually masking our ch children is a medical decision with real risks. Countless parents have reported recurrent staph infections, hypoxia, chronic headaches, increased bacterial infections of all kinds, and incalculable psych psychological harm yet to be fully seen by caused by masking our growing and developing children. Not to mention the incredible disservice and barrier wearing a mask does to a child's educational process, which is really what we are here for. By reinstating a mask mandate, you all are violating the Parents' Bill of Rights signed into Florida law June 2021, along with Governor DeSantis' executive order ensuring parents' freedom to choose. I will close with the statement that we won't allow our children to be pawns in some bizarre political theater. It seems we have forgotten that we live in a constitutional republic. While we elect you in a democratic process, your job is not to give or take rights but it is instead to uphold the Florida Constitution that you are sworn to under oath. Thank you. You may not have applause. We have been able, listen to me, we have been able to have these meetings for months without disruption. I am asking for you to be respectful of this process. If you need to have spirit fingers, have spirit fingers. But please be silent and pr respect the decorum that we have in this meeting. How about the First Amendment? Jasmine. Ms. Mayors, would you like yes. to address the First Amendment? Thank you. Yes, I, I think it, at this time, we have gone all of this time and everyone has been respectful of one another and the comments that they've made. If we're unable to have a civil meeting, we will have to clear the room, which is not at all what we want to do. But this is not appropriate and it's not a safe environment if you can't follow the rules of the board chair. And it's not just the rules of the board chair, it's actually a second degree misdemeanor to disrupt a board function. Um, and obviously we have police presence here. So I'm just asking that please let us get through and let everyone say what they need to say in a respectful and civil manner. Before you start, thank you so much for being here. We have 68 speaker cards on file. We would like to hear from all of you. Please just let us have a process where we can hear you and not cause a lot of del delay and disruption. Please continue. Thank Good you, Ms. For our last speaker. Now we'll have Hillary Lovelady followed by Tim Miller. Yes, that's correct. My name is Hillary Lovelady. I have three sons, two of which are students in the Duval County school system, and they go to elementary school. And so my first point that I would like to bring to the board's attention is that this meeting, in my opinion, is an embarrassment to democracy. You called it less than 48 hours after noticing it, 2 p.m. on a Monday when parents have to work and when elementary schools start lining up to pick up their kids at 2.20. That does not give parents the opportunity to be heard in any sort of meaningful fashion. I don't see what emergency this is based on when we've been in a COVID state for 18 months, when only 0.4% of students in the district have tested positive for COVID, and we don't even know the conditions of these students. We don't know if they have symptoms, and we don't know if they're in the hospitals like you're trying to scare us into believing. We don't even know if the kids who tested positive were mask wearers. Therefore, it's unclear if wearing a mask is going to solve your problem. Holding a meeting with such little notice and at a time of day when you cannot get full participation from the entire school districts, all of the parents, it appears that you want to actively uh, try to discourage participation. What you're talking about affects about 7% of the student population. And by setting a time where you would expect low participation, you're not, all, not only trampling my parental rights that were outlined and given to me by the state of Florida, but also trampling on the rights of the minority. Now, as to the quick, quick brief statistics, there's no mask mandate right now in St. John's County. But as of Friday, they have the same rate of positive students as you do in Duval County, 0.4%. Mask mandates don't work. Look at Dr. Martin Kuldruff, a professor of medicine at Harvard University, an epidemiologist and professor at the Karlanka Institute in Sweden. He's demonstrated that open schools and no masks for the last year and a half in Sweden have resulted in zero deaths in the one to 18 year old range. Teachers had a lower risk of contracting than the average profession. So we know early on that masks don't make a difference. 
There's a German study of negative impacts of masking children, and you can find that in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, published in April 2020. And from our own CDC, as of August 18, 2021, the under-18 deaths involving, not just because of COVID, but any death where the child had COVID, was 361 deaths out of 73 million children in the United States. Pneumonia in the same time period killed 865 children. Since August 11th, 2021, a total of seven children have died. Seven children out of 73 million. And we're sitting here today acting like this is an emergency. It's not. You made the right decision back at the beginning of August and there's no reason to overturn it here today. Thank, Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss Lovelady. Next we'll have Tim Miller followed by Katie Wisner. Good afternoon, my name is Tim Miller. I'm not here to advocate for or against masks. I just want to make sure all of our students have an effective educational experience in school, <clears throat> especially our ESE students. There are some students that, as I'm sure you're all aware, have issues with masks. And they're not all ESE, but a, a large number of them are. Sensitivity issues, fear issues. <clears throat> you know, some people feel like they can't breathe, whether that's accurate or not. <clears throat> People have irrational feels, fears all the time. A lot of people are scared of the dark. It's irrational, but it's a fear nonetheless. <clears throat> we need to make sure that we don't add additional stress to these students. <clears throat> the data that we've received, there are increased cases, yes, and that's, that's not a good thing. I understand that. But do we have the source data for that? Where, where is this transmission coming from? I've heard from a lot of people that have said, yes, they're in school, but the transmission was outside of school. So we need to find out where the transmission is actually happening. Is it in school or is it not? <clears throat> this is a complicated decision for many families, and I think we need to allow the parents to have the choice. <clears throat> Lastly, if this is, truly is an emergency and we need to start locking things down again, then we need to lock things down. And that means we don't need pep rallies, we don't need assemblies, we don't need extracurricular activities, especially contact sports. You know, I know nobody wants to touch sports, I understand that, but if this is truly is an emergency, let's make it an emergency and get it done, okay? <clears throat> if we're only gonna do it halfway, there's really no point, okay? Thank you for your service. Um, I'm glad I'm not there up there making the decisions, <clears throat> but thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Next, we have Katie Wisner, followed by Debbie DeCipio. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Katie Wisner, and I have two children in the Duval County Public School System. My eight and six-year-olds both attend Fishware Elementary. I'm very grateful for our principal, our teachers, and the staff that work every day to care for my children. First off, I have to say I'm not a public speaker, <laughs> but we're at a point where rational voices need to be heard. I'm here today because my children are too young to be vaccinated. I'm here today because my mother and father-in-law are two of the most important people to myself and my children, and they deserve to be protected. I'm here today because I spent the morning with my mom, and sitting with her and her oncology appointment just reminds me that while she is a warrior, she is also immunocompromised. Our Department of Health reports a 19.8% new case positivity result across the state. Mortality due to COVID is at an all-time high, and we can't continue like this. My message is similar to many, but as a responsible member of this community, as a parent, a wife, and a daughter, I must add my voice. I urge you to implement additional mitigation protocols. Change contact tracing from middle and high schools to line up what was announced Friday for elementary schools. Allow students to keep their school choice or magnet spot if they enroll in Duval Virtual and extend that registration. Improve classroom sanitation. Increase the number of teacher leave days due to COVID. Modify emergency drills to support social distancing. I hear people go on about their rights, but what many of these privileged individuals fail to recognize is their responsibility. We have a responsibility to protect those who cannot protect themselves. You have a responsibility to make the hard decisions to protect our children and our community. Please, as a parent, as a mother, 
I plead and I urge and I beg for you to listen to the science and the experts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wisner. Next, we'll have Debbie DeCipio, followed by Melissa Bernhardt. Hi. Good afternoon. The particle size of SARS-CoV-2 is about 60 to 40 nanometers. I can't even, I can't even fathom that size, or 0 0.1 microns. The pore size of face masks are 200 to 1,000 times that size. Face masks are not going to stop the SARS-CoV-2 particles from entering the respiratory system. Face masks do not fit tightly around the nose and mouth, thus allowing viral particles to, to enter the airway. Unless you're going to require N95 respirator masks and ensure a perfect fit on a child, there's no guarantee the mask will work as intended. Masks are worn all day and for several days. Face masks are taken off, they're put in their pockets, they're put back on again. Children are constantly touching their face, like many of you, many of us do when we have those things on, further contaminating the child with even more viral particles and bacteria. Bacteria gets trapped in the mask and the children breathe the bacteria all day. The box of mask states that they do not prevent viral particles from entering. You're violating the governor's executive order. What happens when teachers violate district policy? I'll tell you, they're rewarded $300,000. That's what happens. Why do we have rules and regulations? Why develop a student code of conduct? Why develop policies for teachers to follow? Why do we have any rules or regulations or laws? The reason we have rules and regulations and laws, otherwise we will have a lawless society. We saw what happened in this country last year when lawlessness was across our cities. Your role is not as a doctor, nor is your role as a parent. Parents decide what is to be put on their child's face and into their body, not you. Consider what has happened in this country under the Biden administration. Illegals are absolutely flooding our borders every day. Joe Biden closed the pipeline that was allowing the U.S. to be energy independent. Now, as a result, gas prices have soared and thousands have lost their jobs. Now he's begging other countries to produce more oil. Just last week, Joe Biden pulled out the U.S. military out of Afghanistan and has left tens of thousands of American citizens, not to mention Afghan Christians. You get the point. This administration is not for the benefit or the best interest of our students Thank or for Thank us. you, Mr. Scipio. Thank you, Mr. Scipio. Next, we'll have Melissa Bernhardt followed by Joe Myers. Um, good afternoon. My name is Melissa Bernhardt, and um, I'm going to have to put on my glasses because I need to read a little bit. One board member was reported by two news sources to have sent an email to Dr. Green and the chair, Anderson, demanding this emergency meeting. That person had no authority to call an emergency meeting because only the chair and four board members have that authority. Clearly, the media was used to bully the schools into this meeting. During last week's workshop, Chair Anderson asked several times if the board would like to revisit the mask mandate opt-out decision that was already made. Five members were present. Four members voted no. Even if the other two board members were present during that discussion, the answer would be no. In addition, this issue was already decided by our governor, who supports parents right of choice. Apparently, that board member doesn't want parents to have rights of choice. This was a closed discussion until Biden offered schools money to defy Republican governor's executive order. It is not about our children's health. This is about political bullying. That's why we're here right now. The person I'm referring to is putting the school board in violation of ethics. 
that all members have agreed to when they were voted in. And violating that oath, that person is trying to bring the entire board down with defiance to the governor's executive order. That violation of ethics are subject to independent investigation of each person under, the const under our Constitution. Board members, please do not violate your code of ethics. COVID is not going anywhere. We must learn to live with it. We must not run nor hide behind opinions and false facts. In Duval County, 503 students have tested positive for COVID. We don't know what their degree of sickness is. I would love to know that. 1,209, sorry, 1,209, 129,181 students are part of this body. 0.3%, not 3%, but 0.3%. You cannot make a choice for all those other children on 0.3%. 20,000 students last year were enrolled in Duval County Virtual Homeroom. Those students are in classroom right now. Don't you think that means the number's gonna be higher? Please consider all the facts and relevant data. Please do not base fear-reaching decisions on fear, or sorry, far-reaching decisions on fear, or without thinking critically and doing a fair analysis of all the data at your disposal, which I know you have received thousands of emails that give the data that masks don't work. If they worked, we wouldn't be standing here right now. We need to keep our children in schools, and if you are afraid, stay home. Thank you, Ms. Bernhardt. Next, we'll have Joe Myers, followed by Katie McNeil. My name is Joe Myers, and I have the, um, these uh, emails that I'd like to pass out to all the uh, board members. I sent it yesterday to all of you to put you on notice. Uh, what's going on is unconstitutional. Our founders, uh, they, they fought a revolution to give us life, liberty, and property. And I think what's happening is uh, everybody's just usurping the rights of people and uh, that's what this uh, email was for. And uh, the email can be found at wethepeopleparty.net on the action page um, and, and the notice and demand letter that I sent as well. And there's uh, court documents, um, court rulings that talk about unconstitutional mandates. Um, uh, all laws which are repugnant to the Constitution are null and void. That's Mayberry versus Madison. That's 1803. An unconstitutional act or uh, is not law. It confers no rights and imposes no duties, affords no protection, it creates no office. It is, it is in legal contemplation as inoperative as though it had never been passed. That's Norton versus Shelby. That's 1886. Uh, it is a duty of all officials, whether legislative, judicial, executive, administrative, or ministerial, to so perform every act as not to violate the constitutional provisions. William versus uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, 1991. Uh, you know, I respectfully ask that you follow the Constitution and do not usurp my grandkids' uh, constitutional rights of life, liberty, and property. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Next, we'll have Katie McNeil, followed by Leanne Parker. My name is Katie McNeil, and despite what you may think, those of us who advocate for parents' right to choose have the exact same desires as those of you who wish to first mask on other people's children. Our shared desire is for children to be happy and healthy. The difference is in how we view our current situation. It's human nature to want to do something to intervene, even when that something is ineffective. Those who would push masks believe they are keeping children safe. You are not. The primary means of spread of SARS-CoV-2 is via aerosols. Aerosols stay aloft in the air for hours, or breathe deep into the respiratory system, are less than 0.2 microns per lu et al. 2020. Cloths and paper masks do not stop aerosols. If you want to do something that actually does impact the spread of SARS-CoV-2, Ventilation that dilutes the volume of infectious aerosols in the air is the only effective way to accomplish our shared goal of keeping children safer. Two air changes per hour and opening the windows is a simple, actually effective intervention. Prior to 2020, you probably would have thought forcing kids to cover their mouths and nose for eight hours a day was abusive. Today you promote it because you are scared. I don't blame you for being scared. I do blame you for letting your fear overtake your sense of proportionality and reason. The UK never put masks on kids under 11. As of May, they stopped requiring them for all school children. In Sweden, they never mask kids. Sweden hasn't had a single COVID-19 death in over a month. These control groups show masking is unnecessary for keeping kids safe. Daycares have been open this entire time without masking kids. My son has been in daycare since July 2020. 
I wish desperately that the staff had the choice not to wear a mask so he could see their faces and learn from their expressions and mouth movements as he starts to talk. The American Academy of Pediatrics once knew the importance of facial expression to the brain development of children and infants. The way you and others relate to your infants affects the many new connections that are forming in your baby's brain. These early brain connections are the basis for learning behavior and health. As your baby grows, social, social smiles lead to conversation. For example, when, you're, when you smile, your infant will smile back. Social smiles are important. Make time for FaceTime. That means taking time to smile at your baby's face. FaceTime interactions are important for all kids. Over 70% of all communication is nonverbal. Communication is key to learning. Masking is damaging for the well-being of children for no benefit. These are weeks and months that, you will that they will never get back. I support your personal right to put a mask on your child. I think it's misguided, but I know you think you're doing what's right. You have no right to tell anyone else that their child must wear a mask. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNeil. Next, we'll have Leanne Parker, followed by Anna Irby. Hi, my name is Leanne Parker. I am here because the board has decided to revisit a one-size-fits-all, no exceptions, mask mandate for all public school students in Duval County. Words cannot express my bewilderment and disappointment that you are even considering taking a position which would be in violation of state law, appellate law, which is Green versus Alachua County, June 11th, 2021, Florida's Parents' Bill of Rights, and scientific evidence. When pressed for evidence to support the position of a one-size-fits-all mask mandate, you provide none. The only statements publicly made refer to COVID case numbers. Absolutely no context is given or considered. By this logic, you would also be discussing prohibiting students from driving automobiles to school since more than 2,500 teenagers die per year in motor, in motor vehicle crashes. Case numbers and hospitalization numbers alone do not support the idea that requiring masks ensures lower rates of these stated numbers. If you intend to re-implement a mask mandate, it is incumbent upon Duval County School Board to explain to all of its stakeholders why masks are absolutely necessary. Prove to us that COVID infections will be lowered because of a mask mandate. I can already tell you, you will not be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Next, we'll have Anna Irby, followed by Elyria Peterson. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Anna Irby. I'm a mother of two. I'm a mother of two special needs children. They're autistic, so I'm here speaking on specifically behalf of the ESC CSS program. Um, my children are three and five years old, and the program that they attend is phenomenal. However, uh, whether you're for or against masks, um, placing the mandate to make it necessary to wear masks or go to school will completely take my children out of the education system. So what does that mean? That they do online classes? It doesn't work for them and they're on the border. So I just wanted to re reiterate a little bit of the uh, educational requirements. So with the CSS program, children have the opportunity and it's a phenomenal program to um, to either go on a standard track or a non-standard track. Well, the standard track allows you to go into the military and get a college education, all those things. However, you have to meet certain standards. Those are in kindergarten and third grade for elementary school children. Well, just my children just won't wear masks. And, you know, if, if people feel more safe and comfortable wearing masks, more power to them. But because of this, they, they wouldn't be able to attend school. And they have, I'm, I'm just a very emotional because it's not just a question of wearing a mask or not. It's their future because they have the potential of learning to talk and, and meet the standards and, and, and graduate with a degree that would allow them to go into the military. But if they don't, if, if this mask mandate were put in right now, it completely takes away their future. So please consider an exception when thinking about mask mandates for the school because my, my children literally would not be able to attend. They would fall behind and then they're trying to catch up to meet the standards now. So there's just, it, 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 there's just a very there's a there's a large group and I have a play group that I'm a part of and there's a lot of other moms in in the same boat that we are that our children are right on the border and they have the potential and they can have a bright future but if you take them out of the school system and the we tried virtual learning it just did not work and my health insurance is federal insurance so then we don't get anything other than the school board today because the states my, my two insurances are don't even recognize autism so 
the, their education and what they're receiving. I'm not trying to argue whether the teachers wear masks or the other students wear masks, but if you make these special needs children wear masks, you're just, you're condemning them to a future that I, I can't even, as a mother of two autistic children, all I can do is have hope for my kids. And we do everything we can to be safe, but it's just critical that you understand that there are exceptions to some policies. And, and, and if, my, if my kids could wear masks, I would make them if that was a requirement, but I'm not even in that boat. And so I'm literally pleading here for the future of my two children that please consider exceptions when, when making this vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Irby. Next, we'll have Alira Peterson, followed by Paula Murray. Hello, my name is Alira Peterson, and as a fellow parent, I know that there's nothing we want more for our children than for them to be safe, happy, and loved. I know that a lot of the tumultuous energy on both sides of this argument, to mask children or to not, stems from the desire to feel as though you as a parent are able to do something, anything, to help scrape out a measure of control in the face of a future that has been made to feel uncertain. But the anger and frustration on both sides has turned toxic, as in-person bullying, cyberbullying, and virtue signaling have become common and with devastating results. We've seen our community divided, we've seen friendships ended, and this is all due to lines being drawn in the sand regarding what used to be considered personal medical decisions. Vaccinate, don't vaccinate, and now mask, don't mask. This poisonous strife and division of our communities has been fomented by misinformation and misunderstandings of how the virus spreads, of how to correctly read a study, about the importance of randomized controlled trials, and about the difference between models and reality, as well as through a startling degree of dehumanization of the people we don't agree with. If you want to send your child to school with a mask, I believe that as their parent, that's your choice. I don't agree with you, and my heart aches that you've been put in a position where you believe it to be a necessary course of action. But what I don't support is your desire to remove my right to parent and protect my child the way I see fit, and your role in attempting to help instill a precedent that will allow the government and institutions to decide what's best for the health of myself or my family. There's little to no scientific evidence showing the effectiveness of cloth masks in general population, let alone a classroom or school setting. The introduction of mandatory masks couldn't contain or slow the epidemic in our country or other countries. And when used improperly, which most masks are, and we as adults don't figure it out, so why would we assume our children could do it too, masks can actually increase the risk of infection. If I've learned anything from the past 18 months, it's that I likely won't be able to change your mind as an individual. While I wish desperately that I could, that's not why I'm here today. I'm here instead in hopes that I can at least give you pause. The CDC has flip-flopped its position multiple times on masks throughout this ordeal, including the obfuscation of previous studies showing the ineffectiveness of masks and changed the medical definitions on their website, which should alarm you. The FDA has rushed through an approval for a vaccine that hasn't even completed its clinical trials, which should alarm you. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC are recommending more extreme measures than the World Health Organization, which should also alarm you. And you today are advocating for the violation of the medical rights of myself and my children by trying to take away parents' choice for a protective measure that isn't effective. It's not the school's decision or another parent's decision what's best for my child. Just as you believe you have the right to make an informed choice for yourself and your children, so do I. The difference is that you're trying to remove my choice and my voice while I'm speaking out to protect the rights of us both. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Next, we'll have Paula Murray, followed by April Carney. Hi, everyone. I appreciate you all for your service that you are doing um, for our community. Um, this is a very delicate situation that we are here for. Um, me, I am a mother of three. I have three children, one in elementary, and I have I'm sorry, two in elementary and one in high school. Okay, the problem is we all here trying to dictate and say who's the blame. Instead of us saying who is the blame, what we need to do is come up with a resolution so we all can stand together in this because I'm quite sure everyone has lost a loved one during this pandemic, okay? Also, we have 503 students who have been tested positive for the COVID. Also, 86 staff members. The point is they were tested positive for COVID. We all know that at the end of the day, COVID is a disease. 
And this disease can be contained if we all abide by the rules. When it came out from COVID, day one, last year they said we're gonna wear a mask. The mask will help prevent, it will not cease it, it will prevent, because as we talk, droplets from our mouths come out. So for your protection, I am here today with my mask on. We're not in school. We have parents in this room right now. We're not in school. That's the school rule as in that, that the governor said that he don't want them to wear, the children to wear masks. But we're in a public place. And we have people in this room coughing right now as we speak. Okay? And they are not wearing masks. So for the safety of any disease, let's all come together. Let's all come together. That means that if we have to have more teachers, if we make the classroom smaller, let's all come together and help each other protect and come up with a resolution for this disease that is taking people out by the millions in every country. I'm not coming here with no paper, no pen, no tablet, nothing. I come and I'm standing on faith. I'm standing on faith and I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Next we'll have April Carney followed by Mark Spencer. Hello, board. My name is April Carney. I am a mother of two children, daughters in sixth grade and in 10th grade. I stood before you back in May with the same stance I have now. We're talking about 0.3% of our community that's taking a faulty PCR test that's run for 45 plus cycles that's being admonished now because it's faulty. It picks up allergies. It picks up a regular virus that has nothing to do with COVID. The FDA has said now in December, we will no longer be using the PCR test because they don't work. So my question to you is how many of these cases, cases are sick? How many kids are being forced to be quarantined for being healthy because of a faulty PCR test? That's number one. Number two, I would like to know how we think that a piece of flimsy cloth is going to prevent a virus from, from spreading. We all know it doesn't work. But what I do know is that the University of Florida back in June did a study because parents were sick and tired of their kids coming home sick from wearing the mask all day. This is the list of the pathogens they found in those masks, pneumonia, meningitis, some things here I can't even pronounce. Some of them are fatal. I'm happy to provide this study to you guys. It was done at UF. This to me is a lot scarier than a disease, quote unquote, virus that has a 99.99% survival rate for children under the age of 18. This is insane. It's against our rights. We as parents decide what's right for our children, period, end of story. You are violating the very reason why we live in the United States of America. We're here to be in a free country. We do not live in a communist country and this is tyrannical behavior. The decision was made, why are you pushing this? Part of me would like to go ahead and file a Freedom of Information Act request and find out exactly what's going on here because quite frankly, this is way beyond our kids. This has nothing to do with them. Nothing. And you all know it. And I think it's about time that everybody knows. I'm tired of you all thinking that you can use our children, our sweet children, as political pawns because you don't like our governor. Well, you know what? We like our governor and we like what he's doing. We like that he's standing up for our right to choose what's right for our children. I don't really have anything else to say, but I'm happy to send this to you guys. I will send you the link 
This is a lot worse, a lot worse than COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carney. Next, we'll have Mark Spencer, followed by Katie Peltier. Hello, I'm Mark Spencer, um, Dr. Green, my, uh, and all of you. I've got a, a 2020 graduate from Stanton who's just left yesterday, so some tears at the house uh, to go back to school up in Tennessee. And he's prepared for the schooling at Tennessee because of the education he got at Stanton. And Miss Mama was awesome, Miss Machova. Um, I also, though, and, and the 2020 graduate like him, because of the mitigation, ex, um, useless mitigation, um, uh, it ruined his senior year. He didn't get a redo on that. I have a junior at uh, Mandarin High School. This is not going to happen to him. Uh, a second ago, uh, someone said DeSantis banned masks. He did not ban masks. Okay, let's, keep, let's stay accurate here. It is likely the cognitive distortion regarding your beliefs that masks actually do anything other than signal your inability to understand evidence-based science will prohibit you from hearing any data or points I would make with any kind of clear or intellectually active mind. So we're going to take a different tact here, all right? So the reason I'm here is to get all of you on the record. Let's go for it. Today, you currently, all of you, currently allow unrestricted access and the unlimited amount of sugary drinks that the CDC currently says causes the following deadly diseases, weight gain and obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, non-alcoholic liver disease, and if you're lucky, only tooth decay, cavities, and gout. People can buy sugary drinks at the schools at athletic events unlimited. Where's the meeting for that? Okay. Today, you're going to vote to demand masking, to be enforced by non-medically trained personnel, I might add, okay, which the CDC currently says about masking, and I quote, improper use might increase, increase the, the risk of transmission. You're also pushing vaccines, as if that slows community spreads. On July 30th, the CDC said vaccinated people can transmit the virus with the same viral load as unvaccinated people. This is important. Think about this for a second. If you're sick, if we're all sick, we have symptoms, what do we do? We stay home. We don't want to infect our loved ones. We don't want to infect other people. But guess what happens? When you're vaccinated, you don't have those symptoms, but you carry the same viral load. So what's going to happen? You're going to go to the school. You're going to go out in the community, and you're going to be spreading this. That's why we are seeing this increased spread. Israel's data, they're about two months ahead of us in vaccination rates. You're going to start to see more and more as the numbers have increased now in local hospitals, vaccinated people getting sick. Vaccinated people are spreading this virus because they have the same viral load. Lastly, per the data here in Florida, masks increase spread district by district. Thank you, Mr. It is proven the data is irrefutable. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Next, we'll have Katie Peltier, followed by Margie Berrettino. I'm nervous. <laughs> Good afternoon, board members. First, I'd like to point out that having a meeting at this time of day is very difficult for us parents who have children getting out of school in the next hour. Let's hope that that same decision process used to pick the time of this meeting is not used to defy the governor's executive order, take away our fundamental liberties and our rights as parents to make health care decisions on behalf of our children. I am against a mask mandate for our students. I am 100% pro-choice on whether another child wants to wear a mask. It is the board's obligation to follow the governor's executive order because it's the right thing to do. It's a shame that the governor would have to write such an order to keep our rights of freedom from further government intrusion. I have the right to make health care decisions for my children, not the board. By making a mask mandate, you are taking away my children's right to a normal education. In fact, I know some children who have social anxieties that masks have become a crutch for them to be able to hide their face and not make human connections. If anything, masks are doing more damage than good. Let's be realistic. A child wears a mask but touches the same mask with their hands. The mask goes up, the mask goes down, the mask is below the nose and covered in mucus. This is creating more of a bacterial hazard than anything else. If you believe the masks work, then a child wearing the mask will be protected against other unmasked students, assuming they have COVID. If it's the board's decision to defy the governor's executive order, then you are also defying the House Bill 241 Parents' Bill of Rights, the right to make health care decisions for our children. 
Again, it is a shame that such a bill has to be passed to block more government intrusion. Furthermore, by defying the governor's order, the board will be responsible for the withholding of state funds, grants, and lottery funds. Duval County is already in need of funding, as demonstrated by the half-cent sales tax recently approved. The governor is not the bad guy. The governor is fighting for our freedom. Thank you. Can you state your name for the record, please? Uh, sorry. My name is Katie Pelletier. Thank you, Ms. Pelletier. Next, we'll have Margie Barant Baranto, followed by Brian Kennedy. Hello, my name is Margie Barrientos. Um, I'm a, a grandmother of two, two children in the Duval School System. Um, I have a study from the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. It's out of Germany. It's 42 pages long. I am going to email it to you so you can read it. It states clearly that masks do not work and they are harmful to our children. I'm going to simplify this. There are hundreds and hundreds of journals, such as this study, that has proven children, that has proven children are at risk mentally and physically by mask wearing. They decrease the oxygen levels to 82%, causing headaches, fatigue, memory loss, and brain damage. They trap bacteria as children are sloppy, touching the masks with their dirty hands, and this bacteria is inhaled into their lungs, causing pneumonia and bronchitis. Children are not at risk. Their immune systems produce vital, enormous amounts of B and T cells, which fight viruses far better than adults, and they carry this all the way to the age of 21. They're not at risk. Um, adults can choose to vaccinate or wear masks if they are fearful. Other parents can choose to mask their children if they are fearful. This comes down to choice. We as parents make for our children based on our knowledge of medical sound advice from experts, not a public school system. This is where our tax dollars go to teach our children not to give medical advice. Respect our wishes, please. These are our children, they are precious to us, and they deserve a proper education. Thank you, Ms. Barantino. Next, we'll have Brian Kennedy, followed by Rosie Duca. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you, school board members. Dr. Green, I want to thank you last year for your leadership during the original outbreak. Uh, my son and I participated in Duval Homeroom, and I saw your allocation of resources to make sure that children had laptops take home material, lunches, and everything that they could possibly need. And I want to thank you for that personally. We ask that you use the same skillfulness in making sure that we use all avenues of mitigation, of transmission, of viruses, which I've emailed to each of the school board members. Those include air filtration, positive and negative air filtration systems like used in the hospitals, uh, ozone generators that have been proven to uh, mitigate and uh, deactivate viruses, also UV sanitation. <clears throat> I speak on these topics because I work in the restoration industry. I do trauma scene cleanup. I do mold remediation. I do smoke and odor remediation. I work in hazardous environments. I'm certified and trained using standards and protocols from the EPA, OSHA, IICRC, and we use these standards to stay safe. I work around pathogens that are way more deadly than COVID-19. And I've passed this information on to the school board so we can not only focus on the mask, which I'm totally against, that's a medical decision that should be made by parents, um, but so we can find another avenue to mitigate the transmission of this virus. Thank you, board. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Next, we'll have Rosie Duca, followed by Melina Gay. We have Rosie Duca. All right, we'll move on to Melina Gay. 
Melina Gay followed by Shannon Shanklin. Good afternoon, school board members. My name is Melina Gay. I'm not here today to speak to you about masks and vaccines. I'm here today to speak to you about the law. The Constitution of the State of Florida, specifically Section 8, subsections F1 and 2. Section F1 defines school board members and superintendent of schools as public officers. Section, subsection 2, a public officer shall not lobby for compensation on issues of policy, appropriations, or procurement before the federal government, the, legisla the legislator, or any state government body or agency, or any political subdivision of this state during his or her time in office. We are here today because the Duval County School Board has been offered a bribe. It's a bribe from the Biden administration to violate Governor DeSantis's executive order in return to be fully compensated. Section 8 prohibits this. School board members doing anything other than abiding by the law is illegal. Not only is it illegal, it's a violation of the Parents' Bill of Rights, which means this emergency meeting happening right now equates to, meeting, equates to a meeting to plot and commit a crime. As a law-abiding citizen and parent of school-aged children, I encourage you all to take this into consideration before voting. I fully support the removal of any school board member who knowingly violates the law, and I pray that anyone who participates in unlawful activity be punished to the fullest extent of the law. I strongly encourage every school board member to abide by the law, and I demand that each of you not infringe upon the rights of thousands of your constituents and their minor children. The criminal activity being contemplated by the Duval County School Board is not a victimless crime. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gay. Next, we'll have Shannon Shanklin followed by Katie Hathaway. Dr. Green and honored school board members, I know how difficult your job has been and I thank you for your tireless work to keep kids safe. My name is Shannon Shanklin and I come to you as a tired critical care nurse at Mayo Clinic and I'm here to advocate to remove the opt-out option for masking in schools while the tra transmission rates are so high in our community. During this current surge, I have watched people my age and younger suffer and die and there is little we can do for them once they get to the ICU. We place these pandemic victims on high flow oxygen and nitric gas to improve their oxygen levels. We tell them to lay on their bellies as much as they can. We assist them to call their loved ones on the phone and try to distract them with television and music because breathing is so painful and air hunger is so frightening. When their oxygen levels drop, we add another mask on top of the high flow, hoping we can delay or prevent the inevitable, knowing they will have an 80% chance of dying if they are placed on a ventilator. With medication, we medicate them for pain. We set up Zoom meetings when the patient can no longer talk. When there is no hope, we allow family, family members to come in and say goodbye dressed in gowns and N95 masks. At the moment they code, we do CPR to try to restart an oxygen deprived heart that will never beat again. We repeat this every day that we work. On a good day, the rare intubated patient improves and we are able to take them off of the ventilator, but rehab will be excruciating for them. As hard as it is for adults, I can't imagine even one child going through this horror. Although I feel reasonably safe for my own kids who are vaccinated, I fear for the kids who are ineligible to be vaccinated because of their age or lack of consent. I fear for their families, both the unvaccinated and the high risk vaccinated. I fear for the mental health of hospital workers who are watching this play out with no end in sight. School is supposed to be a place where our kids learn social responsibility and can feel safe. I know the state has placed you in an impossible situation, just as the opt out has put teachers in an impossible position. However, you must put the health of our school community first and make changes today that will help our community heal. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Shanklin. Next, we'll have Katie Hathaway, followed by Joanne Brooks. Thank you. 
good afternoon. Um, school, school board members and Dr. Green, thank you all for calling this emergency meeting today. My name is Katie Hathaway and I am a mom of two DCPS students. While we are discussing the health, safety and well-being for all today, I would like to raise an issue of conducting emergency drills at this time. Last week I was made aware that there is no waiver in place from the Florida Department of Education this year to cease or at least modify these emergency drills. This is a recipe for disaster and a perfect storm for a massive outbreak in our schools. If emergency drills are conducted in a manner of pre-COVID, they will be in direct conflict with CDC recommendations to maintain six feet of distance from others. Bottom line, the risk reward is not worth it. These drills can easily be replaced with a teacher-led discussion about what to do if and when an actual emergency arises. As a DCPS volunteer, I participated in code red drills and witnessed the anxiety and trauma they can cause for students. It is unfathomable to think of children being squeezed into closets doing active shooter drills and jam packed into hallways do, doing tornado drills right now during a pandemic and with the Delta variant raging and cases skyrocketing in our community. I understand that DCPS is bound by statute to conduct emergency drills. I'm respectfully asking all of you today to please request a, wa a waiver from the Florida Department of Education to exempt our schools from conducting emergency drills that directly contradict CDC guidelines as we continue to discuss the safety measures during this pandemic. Thank you all so much for your time and for your leadership. Thank you, Ms. Hathaway. Next, we'll have Joanne Brooks followed by Sarah Evans. I smell smoke, fire, fire. Oh, nobody's excited about that. I guess it doesn't matter if we live or die, <laughs> right? Anyway, good afternoon to all school board members. This is an emergency. And sometimes we don't think that an emergency is just what it is, maybe because we don't understand it or because we're not in that situation. So we, if we hear things from our family members or our friends about life or death situations, we become more concerned. But as far as this situation goes with the school and our children, it's very, very important for us to make the right decisions. And we can stand up here and talk about how we feel about what rules and laws govern this state. But right now, this is a state of emergency. And if you would like to check and uh, see about numbers and statistics and data, that's fine. But right now, we can see by the news that this is a serious situation <laughs> with everybody. And even though it's propaganda sometimes, and yeah, you can laugh, but then the Bible tells us a lot of things about plagues and things that go on. And maybe you don't believe that either, but still check the morgue and see it. Check the graveyards and see if those people have something to say to you. Maybe, but since they're dead, they can't really talk back, right? So with this situation, we believe that it's very important to have a mandated mask uh, uh, emergency program somewhere in our school system because our children are important. Adults are important. Remember when people were dying that were in their 60s? Oh, but now it's changed. Well, what happened? Why? We have to really investigate this, but in the meantime, we need to appreciate our professionals, those that have the medical degrees that are able to determine what the problems are and how we can go about uh, uh, making solutions happen, resolving things. We care about each other. I see all of you have masks on, whether you want to or not, but it, I'm sure it helps to save lives. And yeah, it is a, 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 an uncomfortable feeling sometimes but at least we know that we can save lives this way. It's not permanent, but if we all try to do something together, I know when we were mandated to put masks on, it did help the numbers go down. It did, well look, I'm glad we're alive to be able to say that. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to move forward in Florida and have a mask mandate for a certain amount of time, at least to consider what we can do next for everybody to be happy, okay? 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Next, we'll have Sarah Evans, followed by Heetal Gandhi. Good afternoon, board members. Thank you for your time today. My name is Sarah Evans. I'm the mother of two elementary school students in Duval County. I'm here today to defend our rights and freedoms as Americans and my individual right as a parent to make decisions that affect the health of my children. This mandate will not only violate Executive Order 21175, but also infringe on the rights of us as parents. I'm sorry. To make health care decisions for our children. Scientifically speaking, School outbreaks have not been a prominent feature in the COVID-19 pandemic, and school-aged children are in the lowest risk category for mortality from the COVID-19 virus. When masks are used properly, they're used in medical settings by trained professionals who have undergone years of education on strict hygiene protocols and procedures. These masks are also specifically rated and FDA regulated for their intended use and are worn intermittently as necessary for certain procedures. Unregulated, unrated, or cloth masks have been scientifically proven as ineffective and are not intended for use in children for eight plus hours per day. Children are not wearing masks properly regardless of training by their parents or teachers and are subsequently spending seven, hours, seven plus hours a day breathing in dirt, snot, bacteria, and whatever else may be on a young child's mask at any given point. This mandate does not protect our children. As I said, the mortality rate in children from ages zero to 18 from COVID-19 is statistically lower than that of the flu. And we have scientific journals now posting data that shows a 0.01% difference in COVID-19 virus transmission for the masked versus unmasked in a controlled study. I implore you all to look up the Danish mask study and make your own informed decision. Masking our children does not protect the adults either as they now have the option to be vaccinated and the opportunity to protect themselves. I understand that we have children that go home to families that are high risk and my heart goes out to them sincerely. I do not wish this virus on anyone. We're in trying times and I have seen firsthand my family be affected by this as well. However, if you're sending your children to school, you are accepting that risk and possible exposure, masked or unmasked. And if you're not comfortable with that risk, I am grateful that Duval County has offered a virtual option. I ask that you seriously consider the adverse health effects of extended wear of masks on young children and their developing immune system as well as the psychological effect of a developing child's mind as you make this decision. If you're looking for ways to reduce transmission in confined spaces, Physical distancing, improved ventilation, regular hand washing, and proper respiratory etiquette are all measures that have proven just as effective. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Next, we'll have Heedle Gandhi, followed by Pastor Kimberly Pullings. Hello, I would like to thank the board for calling this emergency meeting. My name is Hedel Gandhi. I'm a Jacksonville native and Stanton graduate and a proud product of the Duval County school system. I love this community. I grew up here and I care about everybody in this community, even people that disagree with me. And I'm tired of watching my neighbors go off in ambulances because they are getting wrong information about what's happening. We have been sounding the alarm on the fact that our city is in trouble and we are concerned for our children. My three-year-old son just started in the Duval County school system and he wears a mask to school every day. And he understands at three years old that that mask is to protect his friends from getting sick. Now, those other friends may not wear a mask, but that doesn't protect my son. Last year in this same school, the teacher told me they had no problems with any of the kids, three, four, five years old, wearing masks. They were all in it together. This year, it went from one opt-out to five opt-outs. There is no policy to strongly encourage masks. In fact, teachers that otherwise were talking to parents about how to do better mask wearing aren't even allowed to do that. 
And I don't think these are bad parents. I think a lot of the parents want their kids to wear a mask, but may send them to school and, and they don't wear them for whatever reason. And the teacher can't even say, hey, let's pull that mask up or let me encourage you to wear it. Or these are the right types of masks that you should be buying for your kids that might be more comfortable. And so as parents, that's what we've been doing. The 90% of parents that want to do the right thing, we've been teaming up together to educate each other about what are the right types of masks. Let's pitch in together to buy HIPAA filters for our classrooms. Let's start our own voluntary COVID reporting Facebook websites until we get the system that we need. So we need you to do the right thing for the 90% of the people in this community that are willing to do the right thing for everybody. It is not us against them, it's all of us against the virus. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gandhi. Next we'll have Pastor Kimberly Pullings followed by Leslie Kaplan. Good morning. I'm Pastor Kimberly Pullings with Live Church. I'm not here as a pastor today, I'm here as a parent. I am a mother of six children, five who have graduated out of the Duval County School System. I have a senior who is at First Coast High School. So I'm listening to everyone, I'm listening to what they're saying. However, I'm looking also at the numbers that are being reported to Duval County Schools. Baldwin High School has 27 cases. Beauclair Elementary, 14. Du uh, Darnell Cookman, 15. Fletcher Middle, 17, which my senior graduated from. Um, that's just a few of the numbers. I'm not gonna go through them all. Landmark Middle, 14. Laredo Elementary, 13. Mandarin High School, 16. School's only been open almost since the third week. It's ridiculous that we have to continue to have this debate. We're talking about children. My husband's a paraplegic. His, his, my son is concerned about bringing COVID home, but he also wants to enjoy his senior year. But we have people that are walking around without masks. We have people that don't understand that, yes, it may not be the perfect solution, but it is a solution. It is a, it's some portion of a solution to help us keep our children and our people safe. My husband has to eulogize his cousin from COVID because he believed it was a good thing not to get the vaccine. But guess what? People that believe that are dying every single day. The majority of people that are dying have, are unvaccinated. So I want to read to you just this parent's comment, who I'm praying for. I wasn't going to share this, but I prayed that it prevents someone else from suffering. I'm sick and tired of the vaccine un unvaxxed fight. While our children are, ri are at risk without a choice to be vaxxed, the only protection they have is for you selfish imbeciles, especially our governor. Excuse me, this is somebody else's words, it's not mine. And I respected you and I was silent, respect me. To wear your mask, wash, sanitize, and stay home as much as you can. It's not about your freedom, it's about our children. My two-year-old contracted this monstrous disease on April, uh, August 8th. Symptoms appeared on August 11th still testing positive on 820 and nothing, I, I mean nothing compares to a mother having to watch her baby suffer. Fevers, screaming, headaches, chills, sweating, pure exhaustion, loss of appetite, just crying without being, being able to properly communicate what's wrong. This is a child that goes to child care, daycare. So this is the thing that we have, the issues that we have. We're not paying attention and not listening to the parents. We're not concerned about one another. Ma'am, we're not concerned. Ma'am, if I can interrupt you another. just one moment, if you could keep your comments just directed toward okay, the board, I'm we sorry. would know you're fine. We appreciate it's just, that. It's just by habit. I apologize. Thank you. So I'm just basically saying, this parent is crying out. We've had people constantly crying out in regards to this situation. Thank you, Ms. Pullings. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate you. Thank you, Ms. Pullings. Next, we'll have Leslie Kaplan, followed by Chris Hand. Ms. Kaplan, while you are coming up, I just want to remind the audience, please keep your comments to yourself. We are trying to have an orderly meeting that is respectful of your opinion and all opinions. No cross-talking while someone is providing comment. Please keep the noise level and proper decorum in place. I, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. 
I'm a parent of a high school freshman, but I'm also a college teacher. Like K-12, there is no mask mandate where I work. After a week with my students, I've discovered that although we started with virtually every student in a mask, as soon as three students stopped wearing a mask or wore it as a chin diaper, the dominoes started to topple. None of us wants to be wearing a mask, and seeing others unmasked makes it harder to maintain resolve, especially for children and teenagers who are particularly sensitive to peer norms. Masking is a decision that you have to make every day, every hour, every minute, over and over and over, exhausting anybody's determination. The more students who lose that determination, the more pressure on the rest. A friend with a fifth grader saw the same thing, a rapid drop off suggesting that students need our support to maintain their resolve. Given our level of community spread, we are part of the epicenter of this Delta virus and the perilous need of our overburdened hospital system, our community needs an enforceable mask mandate in the K-12 schools to remove that daily, hourly decision burden and raise compliance rates. Children are less likely than adults to be hospitalized or to die, but we have already seen hundreds of children sickened in the less than two weeks since school started, and Jacksonville led pediatric hospitalizations this month. Every day that children enter a school building with unmasked peers, we risk that they will contract a life-threatening virus. Parents and students demand a free and safe education, especially for the thousands of elementary students who do not have the choice yet to be vaccinated. Additionally, DCPS students are at tremendous risk of missing 10 days of class over and over and over again as they're put into quarantine. If low attendance was part of the reasons for last year's test scores, then this is critical. For that reason alone, it is the responsibility of the school board to use their leadership to keep everyone safe using every method possible. I support the idea of, it, of more fil filtration, but masks are one piece of that. You know that mask wearing mitigates virus spread. Our teachers signed up to teach, but these days they are also asked now to risk their lives to protect our children from everything from active shooters to this virus. Implementing a mask mandate is literally the very least you can do to support them. You must offer them the one tool that they have to keep themselves and our children and our whole community as safe as they can, the ability to enforce masking in their classrooms. The children and the teachers need an immediate enforceable mask mandate. You have the example of Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, Hillsborough, Broward, Alachua, Sarasota, and Leon school districts, and you also have community support. There are many, many families who cannot be here because they are working, who feel the same way that I do. It is probably about 90%. It is time to do what you have long known is the right thing. I thank you for your willingness to step up and show true leadership. Thank you, Ms. Kaplan. Next, we'll have Chris Hand, followed by Nicole Maddox. Good afternoon, board members. Uh, my name is Chris Han. I'm a government law attorney, but for today's purposes, I'm also here as a Duval County Public School graduate, the son of a retired Duval County Public School teacher and the parent of children in the Duval County Public Schools. First, I want to thank you all very much for your time and public service. You've dealt with one huge challenge after the next uh, in the last several years, and your leadership is greatly appreciated. I'm here today to ask that you adopt a universal masking policy for the health of our kids, our teachers, and our DCPS staff. Last night, I sent each of you a letter uh, outlining five reasons to reinstate a masking requirement for the 2021-22 academic year like you had in the previous academic year. I won't go over all those points today, but I did want to raise at least two of them. First. When all of you joined the board, you raised your hand and you took an oath to protect, support, and defend the Florida Constitution and to do your duty as school board members. As you already know, the Florida Constitution is our state's ultimate governing document. It is the supreme law of Florida. And when it comes to public education, that Constitution is very clear about what school board duties are. In Article 9, Section 1, uh, it requires that we maintain a safe, uh, underlined safe, system of free public schools in this state. Uh, Article 9, Section 4 
says the school board shall, and there's that word shall that we're very familiar with here in Duval County, shall operate, control, and supervise all, pub, all free public schools within the district. The governor's executive order and the resulting rules following that order did not cite the Constitution, and they are legally invalid because they did not follow the Florida Constitution. Instead, they referenced a statute, which has been mentioned here today, HB 241, the Parents' Bill of Rights, specifically its provision that all parents have the right to make health care decisions for their children. But I would argue that HB 241 doesn't apply to this issue for two reasons. First, while the law gives parents the right to make health care decisions for their own children, they do not have the right to make those health care decisions for other children. It's a basic principle of American democracy. We cannot assert our individual liberties in a way that infringes upon the liberties of others. If a child attends school and not wearing a mask and spreads COVID, other parents have been denied the right to make health decisions for their children. And second, even if HB 241 applied, it specifically allows government actions which are reasonable and necessary to achieve a compelling state interest if such action is narrowly tailored and not otherwise served by a less restrictive means. It is hard to think of a more compelling state interest than protecting the health of children. Thank hard you, to think Hand. of a less restrictive means than Thank requiring you, Mr. masks. Hand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hand. Next, we'll have Nicole Maddox, followed by Nicole Wolf. Hello, my name is Nicole Maddox. I um, live in Duval County. I have one child. As a school board member, you swore an oath that you would support the United States Constitution and the state of the Florida Constitution. You are in violation of HB 241, the Parents' Bill of Rights, Section 5, Section 10.14.04. All rights reserve the parents of a minor child without the obstruction or interference from the state or any entity within it. Subparagraph E, the right to make health care decisions for his or her minor child. You're also in violation of Executive Order 21-175. You'll be breaking your oath if you vote for mask mandates. You're giving medical advice, which is a criminal offense without professional license. I'm in the process of filing a criminal Complaint for those that have voted for the opt-out form since it's violating the executive order and will be pursuing more criminal complaints for any board member that votes in favor for mask mandates. You have a duty to withhold the law and your oath. I don't want to spend my days filing these complaints, but I'll continue to fight this as long as you are not upholding your moral obligations to the parents, children, and to God. Please do not think I'm alone in this effort. We have form groups we cannot, that cannot partici participate today, and we are on this team. Do the right thing. Uphold your oath. Thank you, Ms. Maddox. Next, we'll have Nicole Wolf, followed by Tia Bess. Nicole Wolf. Okay, she had mask mandates on her topic. Uh, we'll go with Tia Bess, followed by Victoria Dykes. <sighs> okay, guys, I'm back again. My name is Tia Bess. I know I don't have that much um, time, so I'm going to be quick. Um, I just want to offer my condolences to anybody that's lost someone. You know, I'm sorry for your loss, but we now have to pick up the pieces. This is not an emergency. Right now, the Jaguars are preparing to play their first game. Nobody's cutting them off. They pass the ball around back and forth, back and forth. Nobody's sanitizing that ball. I mean, think about it. The NFL, they have the audacity to be in front of our face on TV playing, and we have to have this glass right here. My son can't play. Um, you know, why would you call this emergency meeting when parents are in their car loops trying to pick up their kids? I mean, do it on Saturday if you really want to get the input and in the community. Do it at 6 o'clock at night. It's just not an emergency. And we all know here that a city divided will fall. 
There's so much stuff in the narrative trying to divide us from race and all these other topics, and we just care about our kids. Um, for my question for the school board members, raise your hand if you have a child living in your house under the age of 18. Nobody. I want to see some diversity. You do? You do, sir? Yeah, I want to see some diversity. Did we answer that? Um, it's up to you. Oh, I have three. Okay. Well, you can't answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, but I have a special needs child. You know, special needs lives matter. My son has autism. He's been learning how to talk. He needs to see people's mouths move. Imagine you're five years old and you still have to sit on the computer for eight hours a day with a 30-minute lunch break. That's slavery. That is crimes against humanity. That is child abuse, and I will not do my son that way. The most precious thing my son said to me was, Mommy, I love you. After 40 hours of ABA therapy for three years, my little boy doesn't have a normal childhood. Don't take that away from him. I signed the opt-out form, and my son is able to get social interactions. I mean, we have to understand that there are people who have hearing issues that need to see mouths move. I don't wear a mask inside the store because I'm touching, I'm pulling it up, I'm pulling it down. That defeats the purpose. Just like all those blue cards out there. We all use the same ink pen. Surprise! There's like six <laughs> ink pens. Oh no, we got to be quiet, y'all. Hold on. There's six ink pens. We all use them. Nobody hand sanitized each ink pen. But think about that. Um, and then if you think about it, I don't want to get a vaccine for my kids. The Tuskegee experiment of 1932, 600 sharecroppers, they were lied to. What makes me think that I'm not being lied to? I know we all want to protect our children, and I don't want anybody up here to think that I'm against you protecting your child. But do you, boo? It's 2021. What works for you and your household may work. But my son suffocates when I put a mask on him. He cannot breathe through his nose. He has developmental delays. But then you want to call child abuse. So. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you, Miss Dyke. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Best. Next, we'll have Victoria Dykes, followed by Rebecca Cardona. Hi, I am Victoria Dykes. Um, I am a mom of five. I spoke earlier in the month. Um, I have my son that's in third grade who's repeating. Um, but today, I want to talk about my seven-year-old daughter. Last school year, she missed school several times throughout the school year because she had upper respiratory infections with double ear infections. Not COVID, but upper respiratory infections with double ear infections from wearing a mask all day. And she struggled to get rid of it on antibiotics because she was constantly wearing that mask breathing everything in and out, in and out. I don't want to see her go through that again. She has not been sick not one time since she has not had to wear a mask. Not one time. And it is so frustrating to see your kids go through that and you be told, no, it's not COVID. She's just got allergies and it's building up and making her ill. And the other thing, right now too nobody has talked about we now have treatments we didn't have treatments when this happened last year but this year we do and last year we all band together we all put our face mask on and it didn't work if it did we wouldn't be going through this now and a lot of us don't want to do that again and we're not going to do that again our kids belong to us we have the rights to take care of our kids and make choices and decisions for them. And nobody is going to take that away from us. It is not going to happen. I don't want to take rights away from anybody else, and they're not going to do it to me and my family. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dykes. Next, we'll have a Rebecca Cardona, followed by Ben Frazier. Good afternoon, board members and Dr. Green. My name is Rebecca Cardona. Um, I've been here and spoke many times before. I'm a business representative with Teamsters Local Union 512, 
and we represent all the school bus drivers and monitors of Duval County. So I'm here to bring attention to the student transportation side of things as it relates to mask wearing. So as you are all well aware, it's been in the news media that there is an extreme driver shortage here in Duval County, and it's not specific just to Duval County. It is across the nation. With that driver shortage, that means increased workload and increased capacity on the buses here in Duval County. I can tell you that that capacity is back to pre-COVID, and these buses roll 72 to 77 passengers on each bus. And there are some buses that are rolling with just that amount of students on it. You take into consideration the fact that there is no longer a mass mandate in place and imagine 70 plus students on a bus. And I can assure you that puts a little bit of fear in you. There's no social distancing on buses. We seen that last year, again, with the increased numbers here in Duval County and having to get those students. And we understand that you have to get the kids to and from school for their educational day, um, but they're not able to socially distance as well. We've seen that the increased number of cases, positive cases here in Duval County um, with the Delta variant. And we can also see that reflective in DCPS's dashboard each and every day where those numbers are increasing. Um, I can tell you that we've lost several bus drivers over the last year. Most recently, we lost a 55 plus year veteran to Duval County um, that was dedicated to servicing Duval County and the students that were transported by her. There's many others that have been lost um, as well. We've also been notified in the news media and by, I believe it was Dr. Green that made the statement that the health department is having a hard time keeping up with social dis uh, with the um, contact tracing um, because of the increased numbers. So you've had the support of many, many parents that have spoke here before this meeting, um, as well as the teachers, the parents, DTU, Local 512, and the community in doing the right thing. One lost life is one lost too many. The students, bus drivers, monitors, teachers, custodians, everyone in a student's educational day, each one of their lives matter. I implore you as the board for Duval County Public Schools to do the right thing, to keep the lives and safety of the students first, the teachers, the bus drivers, the monitors first. Our children's lives are priceless. They are our future and your decision can um, change that. So please, I just asked you to do the right thing here. I know we all have children, we have grandchildren, um, and, and we worry about their health and safety. We just ask that you consider that. Thank you, Ms. Cardona. Next we'll have Ben Frazier, followed by Mike Ludwig. Good afternoon, my name is Ben Frazier, founder president of Northside Coalition of Jacksonville. Here to tell you that today, folks, this is not about fear. This is really the story about faith. Faith that knowing what you do here today could actually save someone's life. Let's talk about this governor, his restriction on masks. Mandates is just like somebody standing at Hard Rock Cafe, rolling the dice. Unfortunately, the stakes on the table is not money, but the lives of our children. This board should refuse to be bullied by the governor. He's a political bully who is, in fact, playing partisan politics with the COVID-19 pandemic. His unscientific, archaic, antiquated executive directives are threatening Florida's road to recovery by expressly jeopardizing the lives of public school students and, of course, all Floridians. We're demanding that this school board act decisively, immediately, and courageously to protect the health and welfare of our children, impose a mandatory mask mandate. Folks, this is about our children. This is not about who won last year's election, not about whether Mexicans are coming across the border. This is about our children. They are our future. They are our most important resource. Possibility rates, transmissibility rates, they mean absolutely nothing until one of the people in your household contracts this heinous horrific disease. 
and dies and you're left planning for a funeral or looking through a glass window to an intensive care unit at somebody that you love and someone who loves you. This is not about fear. This is about faith, knowing that what you do here today could save someone's life. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Next, we'll have Mike Ludwig, followed by Becky Moore. My name is Mike Ludwig, and I'm a member of the Northside Coalition in Jacksonville. I was in a Zoom meeting this morning, and I heard a Duval County School Board member say the following, quote, focus on the children, unquote, and quote, look for the good, unquote. Focus on the children and look for the good. If one were to focus on the children and their health and safety, as well as that of their families, and the teachers and staff, one would follow the CDC guidelines, ones advocated by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Florida PTA, and the Northside Coalition of Jacksonville. And in looking for the good, I see a lot of people here participating in our democratic process. And that's very good. Even better is that there are those here who follow the science, disregard disinformation, resist political bullying, and are here before you to advocate for the mandatory mask mandate with only the medical opt-out provision. Wearing a mask is not too much to ask. Focus on the children. Look for the good. Thank you, Mr. Ludwig. Next, we'll have Becky Moore, followed by Meredith Holliday. Okay, my name is Becky Moore. This is the first time I've been in front of you guys. Um, I don't follow the science because there's nothing proving to me that the masks work. Um, it even states it on the side of the boxes that everybody buys. This does not prevent a virus. I follow the money, okay? And that's where you're going to find this. Today I'm here as a voice and an advocate for my daughter and other children whose voices need to be heard. Our daughter has asthma, and therefore a mask is not going to be an option, period. Me and my family, including my 85-year-old mother, have not worn masks at all with the exception of my job because I had to make money to help sustain our family during this ridiculous pandemic. I know people have died, I'm sorry for that, but nobody has died of cancer, heart attacks, anything else since this pandemic has started. So with that being said, I apologize for any deaths. My heart goes out to you, but I'll guarantee you there was an underlying uh, reason. I personally have RA, my daughter has asthma, I've sailed by the grace of God, and I am washed in the blood. That's my faith. Uh, there is no evidence to prove a mask work. I already said that. Uh, it's even on the side of the box. 4.2 million children have tested positive for COVID, and 0.008% have died. Condolences to them, but that's a very small amount. In the 2018-2019 school year, 480 children died from the flu, more than from COVID in a year and a half. But there was never a concern for mask mandate with that, and the flu is far more dangerous. Masks are a form of child abuse, and if you don't agree, look up the definition of Munchausen proxy, and that's a fact. Masks are filthy and are touched all day long, which make them even more filled with germs, which are most likely to cause illness. You can wear a mask into a restaurant and take it off at the table because that's safe, and the COVID won't get you once you're safely seated. 
which I find ridiculous. But the children should be safe at their desk if you believe the restaurant rules, right? It is fear-mongering our children with them not being able to see smiles, laughter, and hearing what is actually being taught. Last time I checked, we lived in America with God, liberty, freedom, and justice for all, and I'm here to get justice for our children, not to help the school system get more money from the CARES Act from the federal government. Biden has no right to come into our great state of Florida and try to override our great Governor DeSantis's decision for our Florida to protect our rights as parents and as individuals, whether you have a child or not. We've signed the opt-out for our daughter so she wouldn't have to wear a mask. So if those that choose to wear a mask and y'all think it works, there should be no issue with her not wearing her mask. Thank you, Ms. These Moore. These children need to be able to be free. Thank you, Ms. Do Moore. Do not muzzle our children. They have rights too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Next, we'll have Meredith Holliday followed by Nick Chernowski. Good afternoon, board. My name is Meredith Holliday, and I'm the mother of a third grader. I'm not a doctor, but I'm a commercial pilot. I deal with science and risk management every day. Children should not be forced to wear masks in school or anywhere. This is a fact. The cloth masks worn by children are structurally incapable of blocking small viral particles. It's like blowing dust through a chain link fence. Fact. The cloth masks worn by children get dirty throughout the day and have been shown to collect dangerous bacteria which can cause illness. Fact. Children might catch this virus just like they catch the cold or flu but they have a statistical zero chance of becoming seriously ill or dying from it. Fact, if you or your child are immune compromised, then by all means you should take whatever measures you feel necessary to protect yourselves, but imposing restrictions on others is not the answer. Fact, if you're a teacher and you're concerned about contracting COVID, please educate yourself on the numerous treatments that are available, but only if you seek them out. The media and the government is hiding them from you. These include ivermectin, an FDA-approved antiviral drug that has been used safely and effectively for decades. Visit AFLDS.org for information. A trip to the ICU is not inevitable. Do your research. Fact, whether you are a child or an adult, your best defense against COVID or any other sickness is a strong immune system. Please consider whether you are getting proper nutrition and sufficient daily intake of vitamin C, D, zinc, and magnesium. As for the vaccines, it is not an act of kindness. I find your advertisements despicable and disgusting. Shamelessly promoting it is irresponsible, and that is a fact. You should know, according to the CDC VAERS database, as of today, I looked this up at my lunch break, 6,718 deaths, including 20 children aged 6 to 17, from the vaccines which you're promoting as an act of kindness. Despicable. There have also been 1,031 hospitalized children aged 6 to 17 and 2,200 visits to the ER as a result of these vaccines. Total reports of problems from them, all adverse events, 5, excuse me, 536,492. I'll just finish with an anecdote. My child was born in Washington, D.C. with a severe um, uh, birth defect. She had no lung function. We were at the Children's National Medical Center in the NICU for three months with no masks. This is at one of the top medical centers in the country in the middle of flu season in Washington, D.C. No masks. Just think about that for a minute. Use your brains. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holliday. Next, we'll have Nick Chernowski, followed by Tess Perry. Well, my name's uh, Nick Chernowski, and I'm the grandfather of an elementary school student. I'm also a U.S. Air Force Vietnam War veteran. I'm here to tell you to abandon your illegal and tyrannical and dangerous onslaught against the lives of DCPS students with yet another insane mask mandate. It's truly a sad state of affairs when those that we entrust with the safety and well-being of our children can no longer be trusted. And that's why a great number of us are here. You, the school board, you've really lost our trust and respect. You've repeatedly lied to and deceived the parents and grandparents of the students of the Val County by parroting falsified information about COVID, omitting information on available treatment and mitigation, which does not have, does not have to involve hospitalization or being subjected to injection of an experimental poison, which you continue to lie about 
with your despicable Duval Vax of Kindness campaign. I would be inclined to call it the Duval Vax of Terror. Most of us, unlike you, have invested hundreds of hours in researching the truth, which is readily available if one bothers to look. 80% of children who developed COVID were faithfully wearing masks, yet you dare to tell us that masks work? In the face of well-known facts, you want, uh, you want to subject our children to nonsensical feedbacks, which are the equivalent of wearing a Petri dish on your face. You have endangered the health and well-being of these students. You've jeopardized the integrity of the education that they're receiving with your insane policies of the past year. And now you, you're threatening to double down and continue to do harm to the lives of our innocent children while frightening them as no child in school should ever be frightened. You violate not only their rights, you violate the, the rights of parents to make a prudent and rational choice for their children. And that should be their choice and their choice alone. Who do you think you are? What gives you the right to impose deadly and dangerous mandates on our children? You don't have that right and you never will. You work for us. Your very existence is at the will of the people. Your arrogance is insulting and appalling in that you think you're better suited than we are to make a choice for our children? We see through you and your arrogance. The reason you're all here and you're willing to trample on people's rights and the laws enacted by the state of Florida and the US Constitution is you take your marching orders from the NDA and the AFT. And you walk lockstep with their Marxist leadership, caring only about your political agenda and activism, and to hell with everything else. You'll come to realize that we parents are a formidable force when it comes to the well-being of our children, and we won't back down. I once again demand that you drop the insanity of imposing another masking mandate and do the right thing for a change. You know, you insist on having a title of honorable so-and-so ahead of your name. Well, it's about time you do something honorable. And if you don't, what I think you should all do is resign. Thank you, Mr. Thank Janowski. You. Mr. Janowski. Next, we have Tess Perry, followed by Grace De La Rosa. My name is Tess Perry. I have three kids, and I have um, one first grader that is in Duval County. He's actually here with me today because you guys did a meeting at 2 p.m., so I had to pick him up from school early so I could come. So he missed a half a day of school for this bogus meeting. Um, I would just like to start with saying I am compromised. I have an immune um, I have lupus, so I have a compromised immune system. But I am not sitting here telling people, telling other parents that they have to put a mask on their kid. That is their decision. It should be their decision. It should be my decision if my child wants to wear a mask at school. It's nobody else's. It is not your decision. It is mine. You guys, your job is to educate my child. That means reading, writing, math. A game of dodgeball at PE would be great, but not a mask, not a medical decision. It is not your decision to put a medical device on my child. Anyway, where am I? There are no long-term studies on the effects of, ma of mask on children for a long period of time. For example, how long school? All year long, seven and a half hours a day. There's no study showing the effects of that. My child is not your experiment. He is mine. I make the decision for him. I do have a study for you right here. It has been discovered that by forcing people to cover their mouth and nose, it lowered their self-esteem, stripped away their individuality, and dehumanized them, and made them submissive. Now, I am not referring to 2020 mask wearing, 2021 mask wearing. I am referring to how the Arabs took control of women. And this is how it started, by covering their face. Parents, this is what they're trying to do to your, our children. They're trying to strip them away of their individuality. And they should be doing the opposite of that. They should be nurturing it and seeing how they're all different, not masking and muzzling them for seven and a half hours a day. If you guys would like to govern like that, maybe switch to California school boards. They seem to like that over there. Um, if you want your kids to wear a mask. I support any parent that wants your kids. It's your decision. It is not anyone else's. You guys are educators. Please educate my child. You know what he came home from the first day of school this year? He said it was the best day ever because he did not have to wear a mask and it was great. And he could see his friend's faces. He wants to see his teacher's face right now, but he can't do that, which I get, they're employees. But that's what he needs. 
And that's what my daughter coming up to kindergarten next year needs. She doesn't need to wear a mask. And if that's going to be the case, we're going to St. John's County because they're not doing this baloney emergency meeting at 2 p.m. on a Monday. And that's why um, lots of other parents are moving to St. John's County. I would like to stay in Duval County. We have had great teachers. And at this point, it just seems like DeSantis is the only one that cares about my child. He is the only one advocating for my parental rights as a, child, as a parent. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Next, we'll have Grace De La Rosa, followed by Mindy Waldron. Hi, good afternoon. Grace De La Rosa, holistic wellness consultant and also a parent um, of uh, children that went to public school, and I myself went to public school. First of all, one of the things I want to say is thank you for your service. However, I I'm quite appalled at this so-called emergency. Uh, Ms. Anderson, your background is in mental health. You of all people should understand what's going on. A lot of the things that's happening right now are being deliberately covered up with these so-called emergencies. A lot of the things that needed to be said have already been said, and I don't want to repeat them. But one of the major things that I'd like to bring about is common sense, okay? Common sense. The numbers alone, less than 1%, it's point four percent of the students that are being affected by this. That doesn't even include the staff members or the teachers. So that number is probably even less. I don't understand the emergency in that. Please tell me. We have people with colds more than with you know colds. And what do we do with people with colds? We keep them at home if they have a fever so that they don't spread the illness. We cover up the people that need the cover-up. We don't cover up everybody else for that. Now, I, I'm sorry for the people who have lost loved ones, but it's far and few between at this point. We're talking about the children, and we've lost, we've lost the ability to realize that it is about the children. Our children are already saying they can't even wearing the mask. You're trying to kill these children slowly and surely, and not just physically, but mentally. Mentally, you're doing that. You're doing that by taking away their freedom, first and foremost, and the very thing that, that makes America is freedom, the freedom of choice. You are dumbing down, and I'm saying you because you are the ones that are elected. You are representing everybody else. I'm a school board candidate, and I'm gonna make sure that what I'm gonna do is totally different from what you're doing today. I'm appalled especially knowing, Ms. Anderson, you're in mental health. Ma'am, if you could keep your comments toward the board as a whole and not to an individual board member. There's a life phase of all diseases, all. All. The numbers are going to go up before they go back down, and it's going to be a roller coaster for a while. We don't... We don't Thank stop you, the children from thinking for themselves. Thank you, Ms. De La Rosa. Next, we'll have Mike Wal Mindy Waldron, followed by Donna Deegan. Oh. Hi, uh, my name is Mindy Waldron. Um, if last year. Uh, if I'd had the choice, my children would not have been masked in school. The data was very different then. People that I knew weren't affected the way that they are now. This year, I choose for my children to wear masks, and recently I've upgraded them to N95 masks as well because I've read about the ineffectivity of the cloth masks that were typical of what I had my kids going to school in. I would have preferred for the whole school start to be delayed. I contacted Ms. Anderson and asked about that specifically. My coworkers around the country don't start to after September starts, and, and the surge is very clearly topping right now. And I really think if we had taken um, 
uh, looked at that more seriously, we'd probably be having different discussions. But my children, they are in the N95. Everyone that is uh, opted out is an anti-mask. I'm pro-parental choice because it seems that the only thing that we're considering are zero tolerance policies. My middle school is in class right now without AC. She has absolutely no air ventilation. To ask for her to wear her mask without a break, it's not right. For 10 hours to be bused in school, you wouldn't ask an adult to do that. They don't have air filtration systems right now. That's what we should be talking about. That's how you're threatening my child and my family. Her bus right now is crammed three to a seat, middle schooler and high schoolers. She wears her masks, but that's not the issue. They're crammed into a bus beyond capacity. That's a threat to my child and my family. My youngest daughter was directly exposed in her classroom with a child who was showing symptoms. We never received a notification from the school or the Department of Health. That's what we should be talking about. The masks are being worn by the majority of the children now, and it's not the reason we're having issues. Being forcibly masked for 10 hours a day with busing causes knee-jerk reactions from people. My middle schooler does not get recess. She doesn't get a break. If this policy goes through with zero tolerance, you wouldn't ask a, an adult to do that, to do that five days a week. But my child's overheating in a classroom without a C, she'll comply because I've taught her to follow the rules and to trust her teachers and the administration. Respectfully, please show that you truly care about the kids. Focus on the actual problems that are causing spread, not the optics of this very politicized issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waldron. Next, we'll have Donna Deegan, followed by Richard Reese. First of all, I want to say thank you to the board for holding this meeting. Um, I spent my morning at Mayo Clinic, as I do fairly often for regular pokings and proddings as a cancer survivor. Um, it's something I'll be doing for the rest of my life. Um, I have a foundation for breast cancer patients who have financial needs. And I talk with them on a regular basis. And I will just tell you that I was not planning to come down here today, but while I was at Mayo today and seeing some of the patients that are there and, and knowing the people that I talk to on a regular basis, it has just become so amazingly frustrating to me that this cannot be for some about public health, which is really all it should be about is public health. We have a virus that is decimating our country that is decimating our community. And unfortunately, we have a virus that has mutated to a variant that now does affect a lot of children. But the problem is, it's not just, it's not just isolated to those children in schools, whether I've heard a lot of parents say kids don't often get terribly sick. Some do. Some kids are immunocompromised. But those children also bring that virus home to their immunocompromised parents. I cannot begin to tell you how many cancer patients have contacted me and said, I'm afraid to leave my house. I'm afraid for my children to go to school because I don't know what's going to happen when they come home if I should get COVID and succumb to it. What happens to my children? It's not just about the kids. Your decision impacts families. It impacts immunocompromised adults. It, Im it, 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 it impacts children who can't get vaccinated. So I, I am so sad that this has become an argument over personal liberty or politics. I don't believe that that is what this body should be considering. I would simply like you to view this through a lens of public health. In any society, in any community, unless we are looking out for those who are most vulnerable, we can't possibly be successful. And this virus is unlike anything we've seen. 
let's just look out for each other and do the next right thing, and that is to impose a universal mask mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deegan. Next, we'll have Richard Reese, followed by Sarah Tyler. Good afternoon. School board members, thank you for the opportunity. Can you hear me? Please refrain from speaking. We're trying to hear this commenter. I'll start again. School board members, thanks for the opportunity to express concerns and propose recommendations for protecting our children and teachers. My name is Rich Reese. I'm a licensed engineer. I've been practicing environmental engineering for 25 years. My children attend San Pablo Elementary and Julia Landon. Although it breaks my heart to see the community seemingly torn apart by this mask issue, I'm heartened by everyone's passion for protecting the children and teachers. I realize the governor is tied one hand behind your back, but you still have another hand. And by that, I mean there's other protective measures that can be used, that can be put in place right now that you're not employing and that should be employed. They should have been really employed at the beginning of the year and been considered all throughout the summer. In addition to masks, the CDC recommends employing engineering controls like filtration and ventilation. I communicated by email and phone with the school board, deputy administrator, and the engineer responsible for facility operations to ask about the status of filtration and ventilation systems and see if they meet the upgrades that were recommended by several guidance documents prepared 16 months ago. Those documents are the ASHRAE reopening guidance document. ASHRAE is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. The other guidance document is Harvard Healthy Buildings, COVID-19 Schools Reopening Guidance. So I, I sent an email with detailed references to many of the things I'm going to say. I know that I don't have much time. I please ask you. Last Monday, I sent it to you. I think you're aware of it. Um, please respond to it. I'm not just complaining. I have recommendations for things we can do now to protect the children and the teachers. Based on the response that I received from the chief engineer, I'm very concerned about several things. The first is you did not confirm that you're following any reopening guidance document. And as a result, I think there's been missteps, wasted time and wasted money spent on things that aren't helpful in preventing the airborne transmission of coronavirus. Two, the other concern is that the schools uh, do not employ the recommended engineering controls like filtration and ventilation, and that we don't know the ventilation rates in any classrooms. DCPS's resources now appear to be, are not sufficiently focused on administrative and engineering controls that reduce the airborne transmission of COVID. You were unable to confirm that the schools meet the ventilation and filtration guidelines and will not, ooh, please refer to the email that I sent you and respond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Next, we'll have Sarah Tyler, followed by Tasman Bell, Tamson Bell. Sarah Tyler. Her topic was legal, uh, legal standing for mandatory mass does not exist. Next, we have Tamson Bell followed by Sean Eaton. Hello, my name is Tamson Bell. Thank you for um, letting us speak. Uh, school board, how can you justify forcing children to wear masks here in Duval County when countries around the world do not require masks of children? An August 20th article from Intelligencer explains many of America's Peer nations around the world, including the UK, Ireland, all of Scandinavia, France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Italy, have ex exempted kids with varying age cutoffs from wearing masks in classroom. Conspicuously, there's no evidence of more outbreaks in school in those countries relative to schools in the US. End quote. And here's a logic exercise. How come everyone can remove their mask while sitting close together at a restaurant table? but children cannot remove masks while sitting down at their own desks. Your mandates defy logic, science, international precedent, and the law. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Bell. Next, we'll have Sean Eaton, followed by Susanna Siebert. Sean Eaton, member of the Northside Coalition. Uh, I will agree this was a horrible time to pick a meeting for parents. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but maybe some things to think about. You have two choices on the science. You can listen to the CDC and the AMA, or you can listen to pseudoscience scientists who have not done their research in a lab, but have been on Google. Cherry picking whatever research supports their case. You heard Jacksonville doctors last time. I'm sure you can choose any pediatric association that you choose for guidance. Um, some, and one thing to keep in mind is where do we take people when they're critically ill? We take them to a hospital where they follow AMA guidelines and they follow CDC guidelines. As for the Constitution, the preamble states to promote the general welfare, the general welfare. So there's a constitutional law concept known as competing rights probably applies here. Um, so we're looking at child safety or this. You can make that choice. Of course, you're making the choice in one dead child, one dead DCPS child, and your head hitting a pillow at night. That's, um, that's your choice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eaton. Next, we'll have Susanna Siebert, followed by Jeff Goldhagen. My name is Susanna Siebert. I'm a former DCPS teacher. I'm the mother of two children who attend DCPS schools. And I'm the wife of David Siebert, a board certified internal medicine physician right here in town. I'm speaking for him today because he is at work and was not able to be here. He was also not able to be here when you had the evening meeting because he came home that night around 11 o'clock from the hospital. I am dismayed by how Governor DeSantis, Mayor Larry Curry, and Florida Surgeon General Dr. Scott Ripkus have handled the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a public health crisis of epic proportions that has been handled poorly on many levels. Inadequate leadership has led to uncontrolled spread of COVID-19 in our community and schools when infection control measures should have become more stringent due to the increased prevalence of the highly infectious Delta strain, public health policies were rolled back or eliminated for the sake of saving money and political gain. This crisis should be handled in a scientific manner using well-established public health and scientific principles. Instead, everyone from the lay public to the public schools have been following the orders of a politician who has not been an advocate for a basic and inexpensive tool that has been proven to save lives, masks. Masks save lives, the data is clear. Despite what some have argued, there is no reason why any person would be unable to wear a mask for part of the day. We put masks on patients with COVID-19 who are hypoxic and short of breath, and healthcare providers wear them all day long. To say that you reject wearing a mask on religious or political grounds is absurd, misguided, and disingenuous. The COVID-19 Delta variant is more than twice as infectious as the initial viral strain. Even vaccinated people are now getting sick. Medical staff and hospitals have been overwhelmed by the COVID cases. In a time when we should be doing more, we are doing less. During the last wave of COVID-19 infections, the schools acted in a sensible manner and put up dividers in classrooms, limited class sizes, and had a school-based remote learning option. 
Most of us want our kids to go back to in-person learning, but we would like it to be carried out in a sensible and safe manner. Here are some different suggestions. Mandatory mask use by every person in the school building at all times except for when eating. The U.S. Secretary of Education will support schools and school administrators who choose this path. Two, families of students who do not want their children to wear masks should be placed in a separate room for the children from the children wearing masks. A child wearing a mask should never be endangered by a classmate whose parents refuse to provide one. Three, immediate parental notification of all the positive cases of the class, and I know that you're working on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I've sent you all an email Thank with you, the Siebert. full text. Thank you, Ms. Siebert. Mm -hmm. Next, we'll have Dr. Jeff Goldhagen, followed by Betty Bentley. First of all, let me uh, thank you all for the leadership you provided over the, um, over the last couple of years. I know it's been really, really, very difficult. I've had the opportunity of working with many of you over the years in my, in my role as, a, as the head of the health department and uh, excuse me, as my role as a pediatrician in the community. I'm here representing the, the Northeast Florida Pediatric Society as well as the Northeast Florida, the Medical Society of Northeast Florida. Uh, it's clear that uh, the, uh, the speakers that we've heard, many of the speakers we've heard, are uh, reflecting misinformation and a lack of information. The reality is really very clear, and Dr. Joshi and Dr. Rathor will have an opportunity to talk, uh, talk later. But the reality is really very clear. First, masks work. There's no doubt that masks work. There's lots of data, there's lots of uh, studies that indicate that masks work. Second is that we're not dealing with COVID-19 anymore, we're dealing with COVID-21. The Delta variant is a very different bug. And so the data that was presented uh, over the last year and a half or so does not really relate to, uh, to, this, to this variant. Pediatricians' offices are being inundated inundated with COVID cases. Uh, we're seeing we're the epicenter of the country for COVID, not only in adults, but also in children for many reasons, but one particular reason is because of our lack of a mask mandate. And so we, all we have to do is look to see that we are at the epicenter of, of COVID in the, in the country. Uh, the issue of the, of the impact of wearing masks on children. If you go to the CDC, if you go to the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, there is virtually no negative impact from wearing masks. Whether that's medical impact or language acquisition, go to the American Academy of Pediatrics website and take a look at that. So the, is excuse me, the issues that we're dealing with are, have been identified and worked through through science, and if you want to base your decisions, please base your decisions on the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Centers for Disease Control, the International Pediatric Association, and other, other reputable sources of information. The other issue is one that has been presented before, uh, and that is there are 100,000 parents who are fearful every day sending their kids to school and are concerned, and there may be 10 to 20,000 parents who have chosen to opt out. The statistics are really very overwhelming in the face of the issues that we're dealing with today. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have Betty Bentley, followed by Tango Jordan. My name is Betty Bentley. I am a retired teacher of Duval County. I've been hearing people as they come up here and describe the horrors of COVID, and I understand those horrors, but the masks have nothing to do with that. I hear, just heard this doctor who says that we must follow the CDC, the American Medical Association, the Pediatrics Association, but what I'm finding funny is that there are two forms, 
two segments of medicine in the United States now. One segment is medicine that's being censored, and one segment is not. On top of that, the medicine that be, is being censored seems to be telling people that read it how they can prevent from getting COVID by increasing their immune system and taking supplements that will help them. But the, med, med, the medicine group that is not being censored says nothing about how you can protect yourself. So when we think about following what those large companies who are all branches of Rockefeller, who controls Big Pharma, I think that we need to think a little bit deeper. Governor DeSantis did a lot of research before making these decisions and signing these bills. He backed his, decis his decisions on scientific evidence. We sit here and snub our nose at the scientific evidence, and we understand, how could you not understand that masks are not good for children to wear for six to seven hours a day? Nine potential and proven dangers to masking. One is dentists are saying they're, repeat, um, they are reporting that half of their patients are suffering decaying teeth, receding gum lines, and sour breath never before seen in those, in those patients. Children can uh, develop facial deformities by, because masks trigger mouth breathing, which has been shown to cause long, narrowing face, narrow mouth, a high palatal vault in the uh, top of the mouth. And these are terribly unattractive features. Moisture, uh, the acne vulgaris, Moisture and germs collecting in the mask causes facial skin lesions, it, an irritant dermatitis that stresses the immune system. This can lead to permanent scarring, mental and physical. Thank you, Ms. Bentley. Thank you. Next, we'll have Tango Jordan, followed by Reverend Aaron Flagg. Good afternoon. Uh, usually I'm up here because I'm, I'm disappointed about something, and, but right now, today, you just have my sympathies because you have sat here patiently listening to all this. After the doctor spoke, I was done. I was like, okay, we've heard what we need to hear. You know, the doctor said it. We're pretty clear on this, but just... I applaud all of you for your patience and being able to sit and, and, and hear all this is going on because, I mean, none of it is a game. It's very serious. This is about our children. And somehow we've heard, I've heard that I can't trust the government, but then I've heard that uh, Governor DeSantis is the only one that's looking out for us, and I don't know how he managed to get this exception, but what it really boils down to is that if we don't do something, people are going to die. Children are going to go home to parents who may be immunocompromised and take that home. And, and it, it's like, this has been like the worst group project ever. This entire, I mean, this whole thing. And this, we have a group that seems to not be able to follow rules, like being quiet and, and you know, things along that. It's just, it's really difficult. So I applaud you. And I'm just here to say that we just we support you in the decisions that you're making. Thank you very much. I feel like by you calling this emergency session, you do understand how serious this is. And I, I don't have anything negative to say about you after sitting through all that. And the doctor said everything that he needed to say. So thank you. That's, that's, that's all I want to say is thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Next, we'll have Reverend Aaron Flagg, followed by Jordan Warner. Sir, on the second row, several, uh, you, the one that's turning your head backwards, several people have walked away and I have overheard comments that you've made to I them. Smiled. 
No, no, sir. I actually heard the statements about I'm not going to engage with you. I'm going to ask you to please refrain from, from antagonizing anyone that gives public comment. And if you can't do that, you'll have to be removed. Okay. Okay. Give my honor to God, everybody in their respective places. I'm Reverend Aaron Jerome Flagg, Jr., a member of the Baptist Ministers Conference of Duval and adjacent counties, uh, associate minister of Emmanuel Missionary Baptist Church, 32 year part one of football coach here in Jacksonville, Florida. I, I, I applaud you for taking what you have taken today. But there's a seatbelt law in, law in Florida for the safety of all the public. Everybody, when they leave out there, if you get in the car, if you don't put that seatbelt on, you, the baby, and the middle child, too. No matter what grade he in, he better have a seatbelt on. There should be a similar law for a mass mandate in public school, public school, to provide for the safety of the children and staff in the public. In 1960, I had to take vaccinations before I could go to school for mumps and measles and chicken pox and stuff like that. Is this more dangerous than mumps and chicken pox? Do we still have to have shot records in order to go to public school? If you don't want to go by the rules of the public school, go to a private school or homeschool. But nobody's been to college to give it a degree to be a teacher. You are the teachers. You are the professionals. I don't know where common sense done went. It done flew out the room. But the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the true foundation of true knowledge. But fools, fools despise wisdom and discipline. May God continue to bless you in the work that you do. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Flagg. Next, we'll have Jordan Warner, followed by Sterling Warner. Hi, I'm Jordan Warner. I have a three-year-old who has speech apraxia. Because of this, it's very difficult for him to learn how to speak and has difficulty uh, using motor planning. Because of this, it's important for him to learn how to speak by watching others' lips and mouths and how to create the sounds. Masks have a detrimental impact on his language de development, which in, in turn in, um, cause him to be slower, give him a slower start to learning. There are many of people and kids just like him whose development is continuing to be delayed by forcing all of his peers and the teachers around him to be um, masks. Parents have the right to make the decision for their children on what's best for their child. If you look at the data from last year published by the Florida Department of Education, districts without mask mandates didn't have a, statistic, a statistical um, difference in cases. For example, if you look at Baker County, which did not have a mask mandate, their um, cases were not very dissimilar from Duval County. Us parents let you know when you sent out the mask survey this summer that we did not want mandatory masks. Now you're trying to change this at a last minute when it's difficult for many parents to come and even give their opinion. We rep uh, you represent the parents and the kids, and we have already spoken multiple times on our thoughts of mandatory masks. Um, I'm just hoping that this time you will continue to listen to us. Take a time, uh, but take a look at the air circulation in schools. One of the most effective things at slowing down the spread of the virus has been air circulation. The worst place to be is in a room with very little air circulation, which is why there's almost no transmissions outdoors. I think a better way to keep the environment clean um, is to look at the circulation rates in classrooms. Um, looking at HEPA filters, the recirculation rates. Um, if you look at, take a look, like multiple people have mentioned at the ASHRAE organization, they have HVAC guidelines for um, what's the best practices for recirculation to prevent COVID. There's several pages that you can refer to. You have the burden of proof to show that masks are effective at slowing the spread. Share the studies that prove the masks work. 
share the schools that were more successful in preventing the spread by having masks than those that didn't have masks. Make your decisions based on the facts of what works and what the parents have already said that they want, not the emotion. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Warner. Next, we'll have Sterling Warner, followed by Matt Hartley. Good afternoon. My name is Sterling Warner. It's a crazy situation where we find ourselves in. I don't think much of what's been said here is going to change any of y'all's minds, any of the audience's minds. One person says they feel like the data and the facts are on their side. The other side says the same thing. I think that there's smart, intelligent people on both sides, as much as both sides want to demonize the other side, saying they don't care about the children or that they're you know, foolish or ignorant or unaware of the facts. That, that's simply not true. You can tell that both, both sides care about the issues here. But unfortunately, you know, we live in a democracy. People are always going to disagree. I, I, I think that uh, in this case that we should err on the side of freedom and, and, and caution and say that, well, if we disagree, that people should be left to make their own decisions. Uh, saying, appealing towards um, health and safety, while it's a reasonable goal, there's, there's really no limit to what you can justify in the name of health and safety. Every, everyone who's ever done anything bad somewhere has always justified it to themselves. And by saying you're justifying it through public health, you know, should we only say that cars should be limited to 25 or 45 miles an hour? Should we say that seniors shouldn't be able to drive on campus? We could say that the school buses have to pick each student up individually. Those things would always would probably save lives. So while it's heartbreaking to hear of these situations where you hear of a person dying, unfortunately that's life and life comes with risk and we're not able to eliminate all risk from our lives. You know, if you are concerned, you can wear a mask, you can stay home, there's things you can do to limit your, limit your uh, exposure, uh, and if you're not as concerned, then you should be able to make those own decisions. Because to say that, well, if it saves one life, that's, that's really not a very valid argument. Because it would save lives if, if, if every student was, was picked up individually from, from home by a school bus driver one at a time. That might save lives. What if we said that all, all school buses should have a police escort? That would probably save some lives, because unfortunately some children are killed in, in accidents in, with school buses or when people crossing the street, something like that. So it would save lives, but unfortunately, we can't eliminate all risks in, in life. And I, I just really think that in this case, we should err on the side of caution and let people make their own decisions, because um, I think that's, that's important. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Next, we'll have Matt Hartley, followed by Debbie Tribble. Good afternoon, board and superintendent. Thank you for calling this emergency meeting. 589 cases in 10 days does seem like an emergency to me. We had, I think I saw something like 20 in the first 10 days last year. I remember my, my son's school, um, we, ha we got maybe eight calls throughout the year. There was like one case every once in a while kind of spread out throughout the year. My son didn't go back at first and we were real nervous about him going back in person. Um, and so we kind of waited to see. We did do Duval Home Room and we were grateful for that, that option. And when we saw that the, the measures in place were effective, that universal masking and the various other mitigation factors that are really important, that that was working, we, we wanted him back in class because he loves his school. It's a godsend for him. And he went and, and my son, um, he complains about a lot of things. So he's not a huge fan of things that are uncomfortable, but he has never once complained about wearing a mask for eight hours a day because he understands why he's doing it. He understands what the purpose is. He understands it takes care of himself and it takes care of his fellow classmates, his teachers, and he's all in. So we were excited for him to go back in the fall and then Delta uh, was on the way. And we started to become very worried and we almost didn't send him back. Um, it was coming up to the, the last couple of days of school and we went to the, um, the open house and he saw his friend and they were both wearing their masks and they ran up to each other. And it was like there was no barrier between them. There was no, the mask was no barrier. The joy, they, they kind of crouched down and they were like two old men just catching up after a long time away. And so that is the promise of what we, what we can have with that in-person schooling with masks in place. So I hope that you will vote for a mask mandate um, in our schools. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hartley. Next, we'll have Debbie Tribble followed by Annalyn Insko. Debbie Tribble. Debbie Tribble just had mask mandates for her topic. Next, we'll have Annalyn Insko followed by Audrey Keith. <laughs> Hello Duval County School Board and Superintendent Green. My name is Annalyn Insko and I'm a mom of seven, five of which attend Duval County Schools. A choice that as their parent, we made as a family, which was the right choice for us. A choice that was made because it was the right decision for our family. Just as the choice for vaccination and masking should be left up to the parents. It is not irresponsible for us to choose for our kids not to wear masks or to wear masks. And it is not irresponsible for parents to choose to vaccinate or to not vaccinate their children. It's simply a choice that we as parents are to make. Not you, not our city, and not our government. We are not required to co-parent with the school board, nor our government. It is not even in your right to ask us to sign out on an opt-out form when there is an executive order number 21-75 signed by Governor DeSantis which ensures our freedom to choose if masking is right for our family. Your decision as a board deciding what's best for all 130,000 plus families is not your job. According to the DCSPS website, your job description is as follows. The Duval County Sport Board consists of seven members elected by their constituents. They are offic uh, official policy makers for the body of and educational related issues for the Duval County Public School System. You were voted by us, your constituents, and you sit in those seats and we gave you that right to do so. This is not an educational decision, but this is a personal health care decision. It is not your job to force the masks on our children without knowing the long term psychological effects that this will have on them in the long run. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ensco. Next, we'll have Audrey Keith Horton, followed by Tiffany Woody. Thank you for this opportunity. I've lived in Jacksonville for 16 years, and all three of my children have only ever attended DCPS schools. Starting with my oldest who was diagnosed with autism at three and she was nonverbal, but she graduated earlier this year and she's going to UNF tomorrow. Now I have a senior with ADHD who requires structure in school and I have a first grader who is of course unvaccinated due to her age. And she is in a magnet school. And for the first time ever, after losing multiple people to this disease, and personally knowing right now two children with COVID and more people than ever with COVID, after hearing from so many that contract, contact tracing is backed up. I know teachers who know of students who have it and it's not being reported, of other teachers that have it and it's not being reported. After hearing my senior tell me that 60% of her school isn't even air conditioned. After seeing the sick lying down on the library floor looking for a Hail Mary, and after hearing from my healthcare professional friends and families about how bad it is in the hospitals and how overwhelmed they are, I'm thinking I might have to pull my kids from the system even though I don't have the resources to do it. The lack of a mask mandate has put parents in a difficult situation. We all want what's best for our children, but now we are forced to consider if a quality education is worth risking our child's life. More than that, some of us can't even keep our kids at home because doing so would plunge our family into poverty and even homelessness. As of this morning, DCPS has reported 589 cases, mostly student, and most of those two ch children too young to be vaccinated. That's not counting those who don't know that they have COVID. There are teachers having to return to work instead of quarantining after exposure and even diagnosis because they only have 10 sick days a year and no COVID sick days. 
This number will just get worse. I know that the governor's order has put you in a difficult position, but consider the offer from the U.S. Department of Education. It's not a bribe, it's an offer of help. Requiring a piece of cloth over everyone's faces on school campus is proven to work. I've been to Japan. I've been sick in Japan. In Japan, they wear a cloth mask so others don't get sick because it's about the community and it works over there and it's worked for decades. I've heard that it's a low percentage, but to me, 0% is the only acceptable percentage of death of children and anyone. Thank you, Ms. Keith Horton. Next, we'll have Tiffany Woody followed by Eric Bartley, Bartlett. Good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Woody, and I have two kids in elementary school that are in the seventh district. In my professional life, I'm a litigation attorney for a Fortune 50 company. It's my job every day to assess and manage risk. And the risk that we're talking about today, there is no greater risk. It's the risk of losing lives, our children's lives, our teachers' lives. We sent our children back to school when the pandemic was at an all-time high due to the Delta, uh, very, the very transmissible Delta variant. And we did so with more laxed COVID-19 protocols. That in and of itself defies common sense. Dr. Green was all prepared to mandate masks, and then governor, the governor got in the way. He has clearly exceeded his authority, and that's going to play out in court, but we don't have to wait for that. You shouldn't let his order dictate what you do here today, what your obligation is today. If we weigh the risk of losing the life of even just one child, we heard somebody here today say there had been seven deaths. I don't know if that's the right number or not. But when you're talking about your child, one is, is one life too many. And if, if you can do something, take an extra step to protect those children, that's what we have to do. And I can guarantee you, if we start losing lives because we haven't taken every step, every tool at our, at our disposal, I would bet there will be plaintiff's lawyers lined up to bring those cases. And they're going to name everybody on this stage. And that's not what we want to happen. What we want, and I think there hasn't been much that the people here today can agree on, but I think everybody would agree, we want our children back in the classroom getting live instruction. But how do we do that? I, I read this morning that the district is implementing a policy that after, if you get two cases in seven days, you're back online. Well, if that had been the policy at the start of school, my child would already be back online because we got three COVID notification letters for the eighth grade in the first seven days of school, which was horrifying and very frightening as a parent. It seems like a no-brainer. A universal mask mandate is the minimum that we can do to keep our children safe. People are talking about parental rights and constitutional rights. It's a red herring. You want to talk about constitutional rights in school, you have the right to bear arms, but you can't bring a weapon to the school. People talk about the, the health decisions for their children. Well, there's a list of vaccines that children have to get in order to come to school. So the choices are you either follow those protocols or you keep your kid at home. And at a minimum, if you, if, you, if you don't vote to get rid of the, the opt-out form, you got to put some teeth to it. It's got to be enforced. Right now, it's a joke, at, at least at my, at my child's school. It's not being enforced. The teachers don't even know who was opted out and who hasn't. There's no, there's no discipline that can be had. Um, it should be, at a minimum, a doctor's only note. It shouldn't just be because some parent doesn't want their kid to have a mask. If you don't want a mask, stay at home. And also, at a minimum, uh, the children should be able to, to request to be seated near mass children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woody. Next, we'll have Eric Bartlett, followed by Aaron Montgomery. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Bartlett. I'm the parent of a kindergartner and a fourth grader here in Duval County. Uh, my wife and I strongly oppose a mask mandate for students in Duval County. We've We've seen the effects masking children has had on our daughter, who last year suffered from daily headaches. We cannot allow mandatory masking in our schools. There is no scientific evidence that supports the masking of small children. In fact, there's more and more research coming out that shows the masks are ineffective and hazardous to children. For example, a study done by the University of Waterloo found that cloth masks are only 10% effective, and that is when they are covering the nose and mouth correctly 
which pretty much never happens with children, as we all know, especially younger ones. The same study also found that moderate ventilation matches the best of masks, such as the N95, in terms of protection from COVID-19. I know board member Willie stated to the news outlets that he wanted to discuss the data. So I have some data and a good example in the ineffectiveness of masks coming up, uh, from our own state. Alachua County has decided to defy the governor's executive order and has implemented a strict mask mandate to curb COVID-19. After about two weeks of students being in classes, we have data that can be compared to our district, which, as you know, has the opt-out option that is being utilized by only 10% of the students in the district. In Alachua County, they had three, there are 273 cases of COVID out of 27,000 students and 63 cases among staff. That is only 1% of the student body. Now, in Duval, we have had 503 students out of a total of 129,181 students test positive for COVID-19 and 86 staff members. That's 0.3%, like somebody else had mentioned earlier. Alachua, with their strict mandate, has 1%. Right. So another piece of research I'd like to share with you comes from Celine Gounder, an infectious disease, disease uh, epidemiologist at NYU who advised Biden's uh, transition team on COVID-19 recently, uh, who recently presented a chart that showed when cloth masks are worn by both the source and the receiver, they provide an estimated 27 minutes of protection from infectious dose of SARS-CoV-2. Now, do you see any teachers making these kids take their masks off every 27 minutes or clean them, whatever, right, putting a new one on? You don't see that. I don't know why that's not enforced if that's the case. That's if masks work, which they have been proven not to do. One last example I'd like to share with you all is my biggest concerns for my little five-year-old boy. Now, Lloyd Fisher, president of the Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, said it's important for children to see facial expressions of their peers and the adults around them in order to learn social cues and understand how to read emotions. He, su he suggests that children with articulation problems and special needs need to be or may be the most affected by mandatory masks. Now, 361 children have died from COVID over the last 20 months. 477 children under 18 also died from the flu during the 2018-2019 season. Thank you, Why, did, why was nothing done then? Thank you very much. Next, we'll have Aaron Montgomery followed by Laura, uh, Lara Hetmanic. All right, good uh, afternoon, good evening, whatever it is now. Um, my name is Aaron Montgomery. I'm a parent of four kids in uh, Duval County School here. And... Um, I think I want to, you know, I found out about this meeting literally two hours ago, so I've kind of scrambled to try and get together thoughts and points that I would like to make, so maybe just bear with me for a second while I try and uh, put it all together here. Um, I'd like to start with a quote from the nation's uh, top infectious disease expert. Um, this is the Anthony Fauci. Uh, the typical mask you buy in the drugstore is not effective in keeping out virus, which is small enough to pass through the material. It might, however, provide some slight benefit if it keeps out gross droplets if someone coughs or sneezes on you. I do not recommend you wear a mask. Anthony Fauci wrote this email on February 5th, 2020, to the former uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, her name was Sylvia Burwell. She served under the Obama administration. Um, with that, I would also like to uh, play a clip if that's allowed, um, from Michael Osterholm. He's the top advisor to the Obama White House and his COVID-19 task force. And that is, uh, this is what he said uh, just recently on CNN uh, roughly three weeks ago. We know today that many of the face cloth coverings that people wear are not very effective in reducing any of the virus movement in or out. Either you're breathing out or you're breathing in. And in fact, if you're in the upper Midwest right now, anybody who's wearing their face cloth covering can tell you they can smell all the smoke that we're still getting. We need to talk about better masking. We need to talk about N95 respirators, which would do a lot for both people who are not yet uh, vaccinated or not previously infected, protecting them, as well as keeping others who might become infected, having been vaccinated from, from breathing out the virus. So what he's speaking at and what I think uh, is the point of so many parents that are coming in in this room and, and discussing right now is that there is literally no evidence suggesting that these masks prevent the transmission or spread of this virus. Um, 
I've sat and I've listened to everybody who's advocating for the masks and who's looking for some type of measure to be taken by this board. Um, none of them have brought to the table anything supporting that. And I would also uh, point to the uh, Senate committee hearing that Dr. Fauci had to uh, go before just about two months ago where Rand Paul famously asked him to provide any data or research papers showing the efficacy of these masks and showing that they stop the transmission or spread of the virus. Came up nothing. No, no examples, no, no paper to, uh, to point to. Um, and I would also like to uh, bring to the attention, it's, it's been mentioned in uh, a couple of the people who've come up before us so far, uh, the Danish study. Thank uh, you, Mr. McGinley. I'll, I'll email it to you guys. The only RCT trial of its kind since COVID-19 started, Thank showing you, Mr. that McGinley. there's zero uh, difference. Thank you, Mr. Thank McGinley. You. Next, we'll have Laura Hitt Manick, followed by Carrie Burke McLeod. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Hitt Manick. Thank you for having us here today and listening to what we have to say. I thank you for your care and concern for our students. I was here back in June and spoke my concerns with the masks on children and was so relieved to know that the county has given parents the choice to wear them or not to have our children wear them or not. As a mother of two elementary students, I appreciate and strongly believe in the choice to mask or opt out. We who believe in the choice to mask or not are being censored and being made out to be selfish, terrible people. Make no mistake that we do not negate the virus. We do believe it is real. We believe that people with underlying illnesses and a small percentage of others are affected greatly. But why isn't anyone talking about the kids who have had it and recovered? Or that with more cases comes herd immunity. We knew there'd be a spike when school started and we also know that the survival rate is very high. Natural immunity is long lasting. B cells and T cells are high in kids. We're all so biologically diverse. Some are asymptomatic, a lot are healing and recovering well. There's plenty of data and studies out there showing the low efficacy of masks, but it's being censored. Forcing our children to wear masks is taking away our rights to make those decisions and is forcing them to wear something that is a breeding ground for many different viruses as we've been shown today. We are not asking for a full removal of masks. We are demanding the choice be kept in place. I respect the decision for other parents to mask their kids. I respect their choices to vaccinate. I'm asking for that same respect in my decision for my children. There's plenty of data and studies out there showing the low efficacy of masks, but it's being censored. You've been given quite a bit of information today and will be emailed that by many here in attendance. Additionally, we've been given information today for better filtration and ventilation systems. Let's move forward with this. Uh, again, we are not asking for full removal. We're demanding that choice to be put in place. Making a rule to remove the choice when put in place by your boss, our governor, to force everyone to comply is not right, nor it's fair. Again, I respect the decisions for other parents to mask their kids. I respect that choice. I respect the decision to learn virtually and that that option is available. I respect their choices. I'm asking for that same respect that my husband and I can make for our children. I don't want to remove my children from Duval County Public Schools. My husband and I both went. I don't want to run away and put them in a charter or private school. I don't really have that option. But that's why we're fighting so hard for it today. We're not running away. That's for that reason, we feel so strongly about keeping this choice so that myself, my husband, my family, and all other families can make that choice for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hetmanick. Next, we'll have Carrie Burke McLeod, followed by Luis Miguel. So uh, I'm an instructional coach in District 3, but actually I reside in District 4. Um, I wanted to take time to talk about District 3 for a moment because it has some of the highest levels of poverty in the county. It also has a very high level of employment, which means a lot of the people in District 3, a lot of the parents and folks there 
they're the working poor. They're the ones that have those blue collar, jo uh, those blue collar jobs that work so often they're very much out of the house. So you may not hear from them often. You may not hear from them today. But as an instructional coach, I've talked to a lot of them. I talked to a lot of them as a teacher as well. And they're worried. They're anxious. They're scared. Because of the facts, what they've been telling them. Duval County has been the highest this month in COVID hospitalization in the country. Now, not just out of the 67 counties in Florida, we're talking about the highest in the country, in the nation. And DCPS data is now saying, well, those infections are going up. They've been increasing higher than they were last year. And some of the conversations that I'm hearing, I'm having with uh, you know, parents, a lot of them are asking me, well, what are you doing to keep my child safe? And I'll say, well, encouraging masks. Well, what if they don't wear them? Then it's some form of not much we can do. Well, what about dust shields? No, we don't have those. Well, what about social distancing? Um, no comment. So, and then they say, well, you know, I wish I could keep them home, but no one's here to watch them because they're working either it's at a restaurant or it's at a salon or, or wherever, so a myriad of places. They're not easy questions to answer. And, and a lot of their sentiments I hear are of them feeling ignored from district leadership. Like district leadership's disregarding them. So I wanna close by saying, don't worry about your salaries, right? Superintendent doesn't have to either. Fed said they'd take care of that under Secretary Cardona. And uh, we're hearing a lot of, well, there hasn't been enough death. There hasn't been enough evidence of this. Okay, so do we do nothing? <laughs> right? I mean, if we're trying to strive for perfection here, we just, what, we do nothing and just say, oh, okay, throw up our hands, it's useless, let's not even try. That doesn't make sense, and I feel like a lot of folks I've talked to in District 3 don't really want to hear that. So, um, again, thank you so much for listening to everybody, and I, I think you need to have a mask mandate, at le or at least put some teeth in what's already there. Because with this opt-out policy, it's not working. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burt McLeod. Next, we'll have Luis Miguel, followed by Agatha Gardner. Um, Luis had to leave. My name is Jenny Smith, so can I identify as Luis Miguel instead on his behalf? Ms. Smith, did you complete the speaker card? Um, we asked uh, out in the front, and they said that I could stand in for him. We typically don't take stand-ins. If the person's not here to make their public comment, then they aren't able to be here. I apologize. Well, I was told that I could speak. I can refer, I can refer you to our legal counsel. Ms. Okay, Mayors. well, the legal counsel actually did just say Ms. that. Ms. Mayers, excuse me. Ms. Mayers. I'm sorry. Do we typically allow substitutions no, we for don't. public comment? I'm sorry, but this is a strict rule that we have to adhere to. Okay. Well, he, and he, I apologize that you were told that sincerely and that you waited. Yeah, I've been here for hours, actually. So you can't give me three minutes. I've waited for him on his behalf. No. I, I understand that. I'm, I'm sorry it's not an option. Okay. Well, I hope you're all recalled. And if he has comments, he can send them in publicly. And he wrote masks on the topic. So Agatha Gardner followed by Kathleen Dumitru. Hi, thank you, Agatha Gardner. I had prepared some remarks, but I was in the lobby here waiting when a friend of mine across the room started sobbing. And I didn't know what was wrong, went over to check her out. She's an OBGYN at Baptist. And the reality of what she's seeing in the hospital and coming here and hearing what she's heard just had her in tears. So I'm sharing her words. I am Nicole Alexander. Oh, she just got off a ship, so couldn't be in here in time to fill out a speaker card. I am Nicole Alexander, and I'm a contracted position OBGYN at Baptist Downtown. I'm also a parent to a kindergartner in Miss Erica's class at Johnny Ford. I wore an N95 for over 23 hours yesterday during my 26 hour shift. This meeting has moved me to tears. Let's remember that none of our children exist in a vacuum. Most children have moms. I take care of these moms. When I got off my 26 hour shift at 1 p.m., I was taking care of three moms today who will likely die of COVID and several more who will soon decompensate. Within the last two weeks, my colleagues have been unable to save at least five more moms across the city. 
These stories haven't yet made the news. These are not women with pre-existing conditions. At least one is a DCPS parent. I'm asking you to do whatever you can to slow this tidal wave down. It will save children, it will save parents, grandparents, and siblings. And she shared with me that she had to operate on one of these moms. These three moms, as they're intubated, are going through C-sections, and the babies are, trying to be, are being saved. And of those three moms who are intubated, it's very unlikely that any of them will ever hold their children. I also have a couple messages from other people who reached out to me last night asking that I share this. They all, are all medical professionals unable to come today because they're working. I personally had a patient last week whose entire family was hospitalized with COVID after her son brought it home. The day I took care of her, she FaceTimed her husband in the ICU to say goodbye because they were putting him on a vent. He will most likely die. If she also dies, their child is orphaned. I am not sure if that argument will sway anyone, but it ought to. There's a misconception that this only affects the elderly and people with chronic conditions. That may have been true last year, but it's not true about Delta. There are 30 and four year olds in our ICU. A friend took care of a 22 year old over the weekend who was on high flow oxygen and still deteriorating. She goes on to say, I think the broader, broader issue is that even though a lot of kids may have mild illnesses from COVID, they're able to spread it to their families who have had worse response. You hold a lot of power here today. As the governing body of Jacksonville's second largest employer, the decisions that you make here today will have ripple effects across our community, not just in our classrooms, in our homes, in all of our local hospitals. So I thank you for taking up this conversation today. And I urge you as we wait for those who are able to become vaccinated, who are going to do so now, to build up that immunity for the next five weeks. And pretty soon maybe our kids can be vaccinated as well to buy everyone some time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Next we'll have Kathleen Dimitru followed by Marnie King. Hello, I am a mother of three, two of whom are school-aged children. I'm also an emergency physician in Jacksonville, and I am astonished by many of the things that I've heard today. I cannot believe that a year and a half into this, we are still in this situation where people do not believe that masks help. Are they perfect? No. Do they help? Yes. Should we give up because they're not perfect? No. Um, I sent you guys all an exhaustive list by email of over 70 studies that explain the science behind masks as well as how they help to protect the wearer, um, but more so those around them. Um, we can talk about masks all day. Um, I don't have enough time to, though. Um, the, but, you know, really, the, the main issue is that the, there's serious illness in the people in their 20s and their 30s taking care of someone recently who um, was dying, um, coding, um, and we were on the phone with his mom who was begging us, please don't let my adult son, her baby, die because his brother just died at another hospital that same day. So um, we're, we're dealing with things like that. Um, physicians are tired, we're exhausted. Um, physicians cannot come um, at the two o'clock meeting. So, you know, all these people who said it's hard to, to go and you've got school pickup and whatever. Well, it's really hard for a doctor to get here today to speak as well. Um, frankly, we are kind of embarrassing um, to the rest of our country in terms of us being the epicenter of a major pandemic. And this is, this is where we are. We're still trying to fight to get a basic mask mandate passed. Um, but my belief is that we have a greater duty to our children. You guys have a greater duty to our children. Um, our state leaders, they don't, they're not prioritizing our kids' health, health and safety at present. Um, their behavior doesn't surprise me anymore. They have different ambitions. Um, but, you know, that doesn't negate our responsibility here. Um, your duty is more narrowly defined, just providing a safe place for our kids to attend school. Uh, we all have a responsibility to each other to keep each other safe and healthy. For now, that means universal masking in schools, especially in schools with under 12, um, with an under 12 population that is not yet eligible to receive a vaccine. Uh, health organizations have constantly recommended a layered approach, distancing masks and vaccination. Many schools, masks are the only actual option. So I ask, beg, please protect our students and teachers, mandate masks so that our schools 
can continue to try to stay open. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dim Dimitru. Next, we'll have Marnie King, followed by Dorothy Manning. Is Marnie King? Marnie King's topic was masks. Next, we'll have Dorothy Manning, followed by our final speaker, Dr. Carmen Martinez. Dorothy Manning. Dorothy Manning's topic was mask mandates. Final speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Carmen Martinez. Hello. My name is Dr. Carmen Martinez. My practice was in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, in primary care. I saw a lot of flu patients over my career. My first uh, teaching uh, of virus and infectious disease with, was by Anthony Fauci at Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, where I trained. That was during the HIV epidemic. Um, he hasn't changed much. <laughs> the coronavirus flu has a higher infectivity than a uh, regular flu, but it is more, it is not as virulent as regular flu. Um, the D variant does seem to ha be a little different. Most healthy adults under 60 do very well with coronavirus flu, and COVID was no different. Children did extremely well with the regular coronavirus flu, COVID-19. Again, the D variant is giving us different numbers. But there is treatment for COVID-19, and you are not being told that. There is treatment with ivermectin. There is treatment with hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax. There is treatment with over-the-counter things like Quercetin. Quercetin has the same chemical structure as hydroxychloroquine and also the ivermectin. It allows zinc to be introduced into the cell, and zinc causes viral replication to be halted. This is the method of the treatment. Quercetin is a vitamin, and the treatment for this problem is quercetin, vitamin D, high doses of vitamin C, vitamin A, and zinc. These are all over the counter. This is what we should be doing. Not wearing masks, which do not work. I heard no evidence that they worked. The last physician said that there was evidence. I'd like to see it because I have not found it. The evidence I found is that they don't work it's kind of having like a fence, like a chicken wire fence and mosquitoes going through. Is the holes in the mass are huge compared to the size of the aerolized virus. So, in summary, the masks give a false sense of safety. They do not do anything to help stay safe. And this is the fear that has been, has been propagated on people. Thank Be you, Dr. Martinez. not afraid. We will get through this. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Madam Chair, that ends the speakers for this afternoon. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank all of you for taking your time to address the board this afternoon. Dr. Green, did you, we, we're going to go over this morning, or we are not anywhere near the morning, um, this afternoon, evening, uh, COVID-19 measures, we'll hear from the superintendent, um, and then there will be a conversation about um, whether or not this board wants to move forward on making any amendments to what we have in place currently. Um, do you want to make your presentation, or would you like to take a recess so that we can get um, the other providers on the phone? Recess. I see recess among the board members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Through the chair, um, we need to 
the two doctors they were they had to leave but that they were going to try to call back so since i'm sit, I, I don't know where they are and getting them on the phone so that's why i asked could we take a brief recess sure let's take a five minute recess um i think we all could use a little um, recess so we will be back in about five minutes thank you all for being with us
Oh. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. If everyone can find a seat, please. Duval County School Board is now reconvened in our emergency meeting. I'd like to start before we um, get into the superintendent's presentation um, on COVID-19 in our schools for this school year. Uh, we have several medical providers with us and public health officials that have been able to join us. We have a couple here present with us, but we also have a couple on the phone and they are quite busy as you can imagine. Um, so I'd like to start with them. Um, what I'll do is I'll have each of the um, doctors or um, public health officials, please, if you would introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about um, your role and your position. And then um, if you have any other pressing information you feel like the board should know and board members, I'll give you each an opportunity if you have questions for the uh, healthcare and public health officials um, while they're with us today. So if you think about those or jot those down. Um, we'll go ahead and start with, um, Folks on the phone, um, Dr. Mobin Rathor, are you there? Dr. Rathor? Okay. Um, Dr. Sunil Joshi, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to the people on the phone. Um, <laughs> With us, um, maybe. <laughs> Present with us here in the auditorium, um, we have Dr. Goldhagen. Thank you for joining us. Um, I know you spoke during public comment, but would you please remind us of your um, position and affiliations? Professor of Pediatrics, University of Florida, and I was the uh, health department director here for about 13, 14 years. Thank you so much. And, and Mr. Rubio? Yes, hi, I'm Ernesto Tito Rubio, and I'm the interim uh, director, uh, I'm sorry, the interim administrator for the Duval County Health Department. Thank you, Mr. Rubio. Um, did we have the physicians on the phone or doctors? Either there, they're thinking they may have stepped away. Oh, I heard something. Can you guys hear? Yep. Is that you, Dr. Joshi? Yeah, that's me. Thank you for being with us on the phone. I know you had to leave. Can you please um, state for us your um, title and affiliations? Yeah, I'm uh, Sunil Joshi. Um, I am a, a practicing allergist and immunologist here in Jacksonville, uh, and I've been practicing for 16 years. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Dr. Rathor, were you, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Dr. Rathor. Can you go ahead and tell us about um, your titles and affiliations? Yeah, well, I have uh, many affiliations. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Florida. Uh, College of Medicine Jackson and Director of the U.S. Center for HIV and Research Education and Service. I'm also Chief of Infectious Disease and Hospital Epidemiologist for Wilson Children's Hospital and Co-Chair of Baptist Health System Infection and Prevention Control Committee. Uh, I'm also the past president of Florida Chapter of the Medical Academy of Pediatrics and Duval County Medical Society. I have been advised to let all of you know that what I say today may or may not represent the opinion of my employer and affiliated organizations. And I'm here to talk completely as a, a citizen of, of Florida and uh, Duval County. And I've been in the practice and living in Jackson for more than 30 years. Thank you, Dr. Rathor. Thank you, Dr. Joshi and Dr. Goldhagen and Mr. Rubio for being here today. 
Um, what I'd like to do while we have the opportunity to have the um, health care providers or, or the medical professionals with us um, is just to hear a little bit about what you're seeing, what we're seeing in the communities, what we're seeing at the hospitals, um, and any other pertinent information you feel like this board should be aware of as we consider masking requirements here today. Um, Dr. Joshi, if you wouldn't mind, um, we'll start with you. Okay, great. And, and thank you. Thank you guys so much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I think when I spoke to you all before, I mentioned that I was born and raised here in Jacksonville. I went through the Duval County Public Schools and I'm a proud graduate at Terry Parker High School. Um, and I have two, two, two children that attend Duval County Public Schools as well. Um, and I do want to uh, acknowledge the fact that during the 2020-21 school year, the Duval County Public Schools put in place an extensive mitigation strategy that included physical distancing in the classroom, cafeteria, buses, hand washing, regular disinfecting of tables, tabletops, and desks, and yes, masks for all of the students. This aggressive mitigation strategy was by all measures successful. Were you able to prevent every single case of COVID-19 last year? No, but certainly helped to maintain the curve and kept the curve flat and minimize the spread of the virus uh, in an effective way to mitigate uh, the spread so that our children were not sources of larger community spread. It seems like there are some mixed messages about whether these interventions that were put in place last year made a difference in mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Why are there mixed messages? I think it's because this is last year was actually our very first year dealing with this novel virus. We did not have previous years to compare to, so it becomes very hard to make judgments based on just one year of intervention. However, it is critically important to recognize that COVID-19 is a respiratory virus, much like influenza or the flu. Did, this, did these mitigation strategies that were put into place last year make an impact on the flu virus, which we know has a, has a long-standing track, track record of being seasonal in nature, in particular between November and April of every year? The answer to that is unequivocally yes. In fact, the data from local hospitals suggests emergency room diagnoses for influenza decreased by at least 75% in the 2020-21 season compared to the average of the previous three years. Also compared to the previous year, 2019-2020, when about 10 to 12% of all emergency room visits for people between the ages of 5 and 18, for children between the ages of 5 and 18, were due to influenza-like illness. In 2020-21, this is less than 2%. So an 80% reduction in influenza-like illness is presenting to our local emergency room. So something worked, and I credit what the Duval County Public Schools did last year in recognizing that that, if, so that we can recognize that that was an effective strategy of reducing respiratory viruses. Please do not forget that for the entirety of August of 2020, Duval County Public Schools had a combined 10 students and faculty who were positive for COVID-19 10. As of Friday, just three days ago, we had 589. That is a, that's 60 times the number of folks that were positive a year ago at this time. Um, on Saturday in the state of Florida, there were 65 children admitted on Saturday to the hospital with COVID-19, and yesterday there were 45 additional admitted in the state of Florida. I think it's important to recognize that about 20% of the weekly new COVID-19 cases in the U.S. are due to children um, because we have, been unable to vaccinate. we have been unable to vaccinate many school-age children. We must recognize that the mitigation of this pandemic has to address the role that children play in the ongoing spread of this virus. Vaccines, of course, provide fantastic protection against the Delta variant. However, breakthrough infections are occurring, even in immunized individuals. It then becomes important to block the rate of transmission from children to adults. If we are able to protect the kids themselves from infection, it also protects the vulnerable household contacts and other people in the community that they interact with as well, such as their coaches and their teachers and their music instructors, um, you know, where they learn how to play guitar and the flute and the piano, etc. Most importantly, we must protect our children themselves from COVID. We have to get over the inaccurate and overplayed thought that COVID-19 is an insignificant infection in children. That is simply not true, especially with the Delta variant. 
Most recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics noted that in the period of May 2020 through July of 21, roughly 400 children died of COVID in the United States. That's comparable to what we see with the seasonal flu, which we have a vaccine for. In this case, children under the age of 12 are not able to get the vaccine. The United Kingdom data suggests that the Delta variant is 225% more transmissible uh, than, than the original virus, which is what we're basing all of our decisions on from 2020. Uh, from 2020. This variant can be spread from one person to seven different people. And if you think about one person in a classroom having COVID-19 to seven others, that's about one third of an entire class if we have 20 people in our class. Last year, that ratio was one to three. So that's a, that is a big difference. Um, and so I suggest to you all that you did a great job last year at protecting our children. We are seeing hospitalizations go up here in Northeast Florida. They have trickled down in the last few days, which is great news. But we are at a critical mass in hospitals throughout our county and throughout our community. You have seen the pleas from emergency room physicians and hospitalists and hospital CEOs for the last six weeks. Our hospitals are near capacity, and it's not, this is not just about the children. It's about the spread that occurs through the community as a result of children passing it on to um, vulnerable populations as well. Um, so that, that's my statement, and I, and I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joshi. Um, Dr. Rathor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the school board, Dr. Green, and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the privilege of uh, allowing me to speak to this August body on this vital issue for our children and our community. I told you, I told you my affiliation. What I want to state is that I've been an advocate for children throughout my professional career and will continue to do so. I have always respected opposing views. To paraphrase late Senator McCain, those who hold opinions different from me are not my enemies. I hope we have a civil discourse on this issue and many other issues that we will shortly face. Um, I have I was going to present lots of things, but I will not repeat what my good friend Sunil has so eloquently said and what several of my fellow physicians have already stated earlier. I would ask to speak today on the value of masks and protecting our children and making our schools safer. Before I delve into the issue at hand, I want to make a couple of, uh, I will take a couple of minutes to set the premise, uh, premise for our, my, my uh, presentation. First, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that in-person school is optimum for learning, mental health, social growth and well-being of children, and all children should be afforded their right for in-person schools. Second, nothing is guaranteed to be absolutely safe in life. Driving to school or work in an automobile is safer by having a strong and well-engineered chassis of the vehicle, using the seat belt, and having an effective airbag. If everyone follows traffic rules without exception, we all hope to have a safer journey to our destination. Making schools safer is not any different than making our automobiles safer, which makes our journey safer. Think of social distancing as a well engineered chassis of your automobile, which keeps you protected from infectious organisms. The seat belts as masks always present to protect you in case some virus slips, the social distancing, and airbags as vaccines, so that if your body is in fact Affected by the virus, your vaccine, like the airbag, will protect you against serious consequences. However, all of this can only work if everyone follows the same rules. My right to work is bound to be tragic if some drivers can opt out of following traffic rules and do not stop at red lights, even if I am in a Volvo with five point seat belts and smart airbags. Masks work best when used in combination with other mitigating measures. That should be part of the comprehensive plan, which includes vaccination, social distancing, good hand hygiene, correct cough etiquette, good ventilation, contact tracing, and testing and isolation and quarantine when necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, I can quote you reliable and robust scientific studies about effectiveness of masks to protect against coronavirus, like the one done in 13 public schools in North Carolina that were reported by uh, our colleagues from Duke or the one in Georgia that looked at 90,000 children in schools, in public schools, that was reported by the CDC, both of which showed that masks are effective. I know if one does not support masks in school, one can find some studies to support one's position and find holes in the opposite size evidence. That is the nature of debate. If my car has a problem, I will take it to a mechanic 
and if my AC is not working, I will have an AC at the kitchen look at the AC. Science and medicine are no different. For scientific evaluation of a medical subject, it is important to pay heed to those who have spent their lifetime studying how to prevent control of infection, prevention, and transmission, and care for children. All reputable professional aid organizations, including the CDC, Infection Disease Society of America, Society for Healthcare Epidemiology, Pediatric Infection Disease Society, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, and also your own Florida chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, have recommended masks for children attending school in person. No one has argued that it is better not to have to wear a mask in schools. By the way, I would prefer not to wear a mask all day when I am at the hospital, but even, even though I'm vaccinated, and as uh, physicians reported from what Dr. Nicole Alexander has stated. However, I want to protect my patients, my coworkers, and myself from this infection, so I'm happy to wear a mask. You may ask why if you are protected by vaccine, you are concerned about infection, since infection may not be serious. Well, I can still have the long-term complications after COVID infection, or as it is called, long COVID. That brings me back to our children. I pray to God Almighty that none of the 503 children infected in less than two weeks of school, nine days to be exact, show up at my hospital with serious illness. I am admitted to the ICU or intubated to be placed on a breathing machine. I just cannot bear that and see the suffering of the family and parents. Or my greatest fear, God forbid, these, patients, these children die of coronavirus infection that could have been easily prevented by masks, vaccines, and other mitigating procedures. Also, please do not forget that there are numerous children who are less than 12 years of age and are not so lucky to be vaccinated. I have over 300 children less than 12 years of age who are waiting to participate in a research trial that we are conducting for vaccine in that age. The month of July was the worst month for hospitalization for children in Jacksonville since the start of this pandemic. More children were hospitalized in Jacksonville in July than any other month since the start of the pandemic. August is not looking any better. A few weeks ago, CDC reported that there were 203 children hospitalized with coronavirus across the United States. At the same time, there were 22 children hospitalized with COVID in Jacksonville. That should speak volumes. Today, there are seven children who are hospitalized in Jacksonville because of coronavirus infection. But I digress. I do not just worry about acutely infected children, but also all those children who will get the dreaded MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome of childhood that can be more serious than even the acute infection. Let us not forget long COVID, which surely many of these children will get, even if they do not get serious acute disease or MIS. Now, if I get COVID-19, I may have to deal with it for 10 or maybe 20 years if I live that long. A six-year-old may have to deal with the complications of COVID for 80, maybe 90 years. Do we really want our children to go through that misery? Let us not fail our kids. When the future generations remember us, let us remember, let them remember us as those who protected our most precious and most vulnerable assets, our children, and not those who failed to do so because of misinformation or a misinterpretation of evidence, science, and data, which overwhelmingly supports the use of masks in the prevention of transmission of infection. Rather than walking through all the studies, I would refer you to look at the cdc.gov and aap.org to review the evidence. There are studies from the United States, from Germany, from, from Japan, uh, many studies that have shown that masks work, masks work. I know some people have reported what Dr. Michael Osterholm said. What he was saying was that masks are an hierarchy. N95 is the best mask, but it doesn't mean that other masks, other facial coverings don't work. They perhaps don't work as well. So I would end by saying, please protect our children. I have spent my lifetime educating for children, and this by far seems to be the biggest challenge facing our children in recent times. Thank you, and God bless. We'd like to answer any questions. Uh, well, thank you again. And um, <clears throat> I don't have much more to add than uh, Dr. Uh, Joshi and um, Dr. Rathor mentioned, the fact, it's a simple fact, children get COVID right now. Jacksonville is the epicenter for that, uh, for COVID infection in the country. That kids uh, get sick with COVID, uh, that they get hospitalized with COVID, 
that they end up in the, uh, in the intensive care unit with COVID. Uh, they get long COVID. Somewhere between 10 and 30% of children actually will develop long COVID. Uh, what we know now is that many of the markers that we're seeing in children with COVID would indicate that there's a very significant chance that they will carry this disease or have an impact of this disease for a long period of time and actually into adulthood. The MISC, the multi-system inflammatory disease that we see in children, need to remember that that occurs six weeks or more after a COVID infection, and many of the children that get MISC uh, actually are asymptomatic. So we're dealing with a disease that is the most significant disease that I've seen in my public health and, and clinical experience. The studies that many of the people that presented today um, are just bogus, number one. Number two, many of them are misrepresented. As an example, uh, this, the statement that Mobeen mentioned related to Michael Osterholm, it wasn't that masks don't work. It was that N95 masks work better. One person uh, was talking about ivermectin, that we should be treating everybody with ivermectin and that we have a treatment for this disease. While he was while he was talking about ivermectin, I was receiving another study that indicated that ivermectin doesn't work. So this, the decisions need to be evidence-based, based on the best data and science, and that's what we would plead with you to, to consider as we move forward with this, um, with this disease. The other part of this is that, that this is just a dress rehearsal. Right, COVID-19, which is now, I'm suggesting, be called COVID-21 because the Delta variant is fundamentally different from the initial strain and alpha. We will have another strain. And unless we can implement evidence-based public health policies that will protect, in our case, children, then what chance do we have in the future in addressing issues that will, uh, will, un will unfold. And the reality is so many people here, to set, here today said, you know, that there's a small percentage of kids that are infected, that kids don't get sick, and on and on. Those are just not true statements. Kids get sick, kids are increasingly becoming sick and sicker with the, vi with the transmissibility and virulence of of, uh, of the Delta uh, variant. And so we're, not, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. And for every child that we see, we say, they say, well, only 500 kids died, or that we only have 20 kids in the hospital. For every one of those children that are hospitalized, there are hundreds and hundreds of others who are infected. And the chances of them, number one, resulting in long haul COVID, and number two, being impacted m decades later are, are very significant. And we can stop this or we can limit it uh, with the use of masks. Now, the, all, there were lots of statements about the detrimental at impact of, 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 um, of mask wearing. If you go on the American Academy of Pediatrics site, you'll see, you'll see the evidence as to what the impact of mask wearing is, and it's essentially none. Kids who are born congenitally blind, kids who are born congenitally blind, develop language and language skills at the same rate as kids who see. Kids who grow up in, in conservative uh, Muslim communities where they're taught by women who have burqas and their face covered, develop language skills exactly the same way as others do. So that the evidence that there is an impact from mask wearing is essentially non-existent. There is some evidence that social, excuse me, social emotional um, uh, develop might be slightly impacted, but kids develop alternative approaches for social and emotional development 
And so there are some psychologists who are saying that actually there's some benefit to wearing masks. I'm not going to suggest that, but there's no, ev no significant evidence that mask wearing is, 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 is detrimental. Thank you, Dr. Goldhagen. Um, Mr. Rubio, did you want to weigh in in this conversation at this time? Well, the, the only thing that I'd like to state is, is, is as Dr. Goldberg has said, that we are dealing with a much different variant now than we were last year. So to look at data from last year and to try to make decisions based on last year's data, I think you're doing a disservice. You have to understand that the variant that we're dealing with today is much, much different. Thank you. Thank you all um, for sharing your thoughts and um, medical perspectives with us, public health perspectives. Um, board members, I want to give you all an opportunity to ask the professionals um, any questions that you might have. Um, I will go ahead and take anybody who's ready or has some questions that we'd like to um, have addressed by our health officials. Anyway, let's see, Dr. Coker. Um, uh, thank you, through the chair, um, to our physician here. Thank you for, well, first off, to all of the physicians that have joined us, um, thank you for contributing to the conversation and have, helping to inform us as we make this um, decision. So first, um, again, thank you for your time. Um, you spoke just a little bit about um, the, uh, we, we've heard about um, from Dr. Rothor about the possible of decades-long effect for children who contract COVID. You just spoke in regards to wearing of masks and some of the social emotional aspects of wearing the masks. If you were to look, and we hear a lot about um, some parents talk about microbes and whatnot in the mask that are calling respiratory and whatnot. Can you speak to that specifically short term, long term effects? Is there anything to be concerned about there? Uh, yes, I can. I can speak very eloquently about it. There's no evidence that there's any impact from microbes, from moisture, from any, uh, any medical outcomes or me medical issues, microbiological issues uh, from wearing masks. So it, the, the data just isn't there. The evidence base is, in fact, exactly the, exactly the opposite. There was a woman that talked about wearing masks and resulting in increase in changes in, in uh, high arched palates and changes in, uh, in facial structure and so on. With one hat on, another hat on, I am the medical director for our cranial facial program, our cleft and cranial facial program here. You don't develop a high arched palate from wearing a mask. And there's no evidence that there's any impact on facial, uh, facial deformities from wearing a mask. It's just not true. Thank you, Dr. Um, Thank you. Goldhagen. Dr. Joshi or Dr. Rathor, did you want to comment on the uh, risks of masking or the medical um, side effects, perhaps, of masking? I'm not hearing any response. Um, so, Dr. Coker, did you want to continue your questions? I'm good for right this minute. Oh. Was there a did I miss something? Can, can I make another? Just so, so, so one of the, you know, one of the issues as far as the language development, early language development is important for sure. And if you go on the Academy's website, you'll, you'll see some comments about that. But most families, aren't wearing masks in the home. So that the time spent by parents and face-to-face -face visual, uh, visual um, opportunities for the child to see the face of the parent are sufficient enough to, to ensure that, in fact, there's normal language development. So a statement that was made that, yes, having a child able to see the facial expressions and respond, the serve and return type of reflex that we talk about. The time spent by parents in unmasks in the home appears to be sufficient to ensure that, in fact, that aspect of language development unfolds. But again, kids who are congenitally blind develop language skills at the same rate as children who live in families 
uh, whose parents obviously aren't, who, who are not blind, right. Thank you, Dr. Goldhagen. Um, uh, Board Member Jones. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, uh, Board Chair. Um, could someone speak, and I've known Dr. Goldhagen for a number of years, and I appreciate you and all the other physicians and the health department being here and adding to this conversation. Uh, I hear a lot about positivity rate and the role it plays, the positivity rate and the role it plays in whether you mask or don't mask and how that's changed over the last months. Can someone speak to that for me, please? You're looking specifically at um, the, the for, local positivity rates right. and for whether or not certain mitigation measures should be in place? Right. Um, uh, maybe Mr. Rubio, yeah. if you wanted to uh, take yes, that and then Dr. Goldhagen. Uh, Chairwoman Anderson, I'd be happy to address uh, your question on that. Uh, obviously, what we're when we look at positivity rates, what you're looking at is the percent of people who are positive to the percent of people who were tested. So by no means is positivity rate on any given day the positivity rate within our community. But we use it as an example to be able to gauge and understand what is going on in community transmission. In the last month of August, yes, ma'am. No, that's okay. okay. In the last month of August, we have probably been averaging around 23 to 25 percent positivity rate in Duval County, uh, and that that fluctuates from day to day. We might be down to 19. We could be up to 30. Right. So I'm just trying to give you an, a ballpark number of where we are with that. And what that is really reflecting is like exactly what you heard one of the doctors say that it, with this Delta variant where before we might see one positive case infect two or three people, we believe now with the Delta variant, one positive is infecting seven people to nine people. All right? So anything that we can do to mitigate that spread is going to help us. And that's what we're talking about, I think, today. Thank so, you, Doug. as a follow-up, <clears throat> as I also understand that the hospitalizations and the deaths that sometimes follow are lagging indicators of the positivity rate. So if you had 100 people test positive, uh, the people who will be hospitalized, the increase in that number will be reflected several weeks or months later. Is that correct, too? So to answer that part of the question, uh, Chairman, is um, right. Anytime we see infections, it could take up to two to four weeks before we'll see hospitalizations from that. But make mo no mistake. Duval County probably has about a third of all hospital beds have a COVID patient in them. Just let me state it that way. So about 30% of all beds currently taken in our hospitals today are taken by COVID patients. Now, will that get better? Uh, we, 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 I think what we're hoping is that it does. Uh, uh, there are some mitigating circumstances that are being done. You know, you know the governor started Regeneron. We're hoping that that will reduce the number of people who become hospitalized because that is a treatment that you do pr once you have illness but prior to you have hospitalization. So my answer to that is we, we'll have to wait and see. And then, of course, deaths follow behind hospitalization. So the uh, you know, question I've been asked is, is this Delta variant more deadly than what we were seeing back in December uh, January of last year, and the answer to is uh, too early to tell you. Don't know. Uh, 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 um, Dr. Goldhagen. Yes, uh, um, I think the statistics are actually worse than Tito is suggesting. I know that at least last week, um, Baptist system has I think 900 beds in their system and over 500 of them were filled with, um, with COVID cases. Uh, I, the University of Florida has a substantial, substantially more than a third of their cases actually, um, uh, actually filled. And um, although Tito's right that um, it, the data is not firm, all of the data would indicate now that the Delta variant is far more virulent than the alpha and the previous uh, previous strains. And so that data is now un unfolding. Uh, data coming out of, of Canada uh, 
data coming out of Scandinavia. There are, there are uh, Israel as another example. So the data is pretty clear now that this, that this virus is more virulent, far more virulent. Now, the, the issue of, of deaths from of the disease is impacted by the fact that in the initial phase of the pandemic, it was older people who were uh, being impacted. So the death rate from the Delta variant will probably be, will, will be less because it's younger people that are getting infected. However, in the initial pandemic, younger people weren't dying. So the death rate among younger people is far greater with the Delta variant than with the previous strains. The total death rate is less because the older people tended to die, to die more frequent, frequently. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Rathor, Dr. Joshi, do you have any additional comments specifically on um, which data points I think are helpful indicators for us when we're looking at community spread? Yes, Dr. Rathor. Can you ask us the question again? I, I, I can hear a question. Sure. So the question was specifically around which data points um, are a good indicator that the um, level of spread in the community. Um, I think former members asked about percent positive. Um, I know we also have other data points like cases per 100,000. And then how that relates to hospitalization or lag time in that reporting data. Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I, uh, can you ask the question again, ma'am? I apologize. I turned off my microphone to avoid feedback on the speaker. Um, so Board Member Jones had asked about the data point percent positives um, and how that may um, not necessarily indicate hospitalizations right away, whether there's a lag time. Do you have any further comment on community so, uh, spread data points yeah, and hospitalizations? Uh, first of all, when we have, uh, we, we all agree, I think as Jeff said, uh, children, when they do get infection, the infection may not be as serious. So when we have positive children, that means there are a lot of children who are asymptomatic and may still be positive. Uh, but as the number of children who are positive increases, that means the asymptomatic positive children also increasing. And as we have seen in this recent surge, as the number of positivity increase, the number of hospitalizations increase. We have 17 children in the hospital today. We, we have, as I speak, we have 22 children in the hospital. So I think those are, the hospitalizations are a surrogate for what's happening in the community. And it's clearly it is not good because we are having, you know, as I said, we have highest number of children admitted to the hospital in the month of July since the inception of this pandemic, and all this is look, not looking any better. So I think that would tell you that if you use that as a signal, that there's a lot of infection. And even the 503 kids who are found to be infected in, the, in the Dua County Public Schools, I think that's not all of them. There are many kids who are not infected, and we'll only learn about them as some of them showed up in the hospital with MIFC and in the ICU or others who develop long COVID later on, because the fact that their current infection is asymptomatic does not protect them from getting MIFC or long COVID in the future. Yeah, and can I uh, chime in a little bit on this as well? You know, I think if you're looking for data points, because I think that might have been the question too, in terms of what, when do we start to think that community spread isn't as significant, you know? And that throughout the pandemic has been somewhere less than 10% you know, preferably less than 5% in terms of um, positivity rate. Um, but as Dr. Goldhagen may have mentioned, as those numbers decrease, you may not see the hospitalizations decrease as quickly because people do stay in the hospital for quite some time with COVID as well. But, but you know, right now the percent positivity in our community is a very important factor to look at, and we want to see those numbers trend and get below 10% on a consistent basis. And in addition, I think we, I want to point out that we are bracing to see a, a, large, a larger than the number than before of children with MISD in about a couple of weeks. I mean, we are very concerned about that. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to give opportunity for other board members to ask questions. Um, 
Board Member Hershey. Uh, thank you for your time and your input. Um, I think the medical field, um, even though we're, we're hearing similar comments from doctors, still is split a little bit. And I will just share, um, I have nephews in kindergarten and preschool. And when my sister asked, uh, should I mask my students for school, the pediatrician said no, if no one at home is immune compromised. And I share that because we're having this conversation around masks. And my bigger question is, as a medical professional, what steps do this, does the district need to take to ensure health safety? I'm thinking, I have been in the classroom this year, I, this is a short time as a substitute teacher, that classroom did not have dividers on it as it did last year. Is that something that should be brought back? I have read studies and heard and, and talked with people who've addressed um, air conditioning system and filtration. Uh, should the district really take a hard look at our investment in our <coughs> AC systems and our filtration systems? Um, or do you think students wearing masks is the sole answer to health and safety of students? Well, I can certainly answer I think that. We can and answer that question, and, and I'll, I'll take the first shot, and I'll let you guys talk too. But um, is you know the mitigation. This is what I was saying in my statement earlier. The mitigation strategies that were put in place last year seem to work. Okay, so that included multiple things. Masks, obviously, first and foremost, but it did include social distancing and and the partitions and whatnot. Um, you know, I know that those are all very, very expensive interventions, you know, getting, you know, HVAC systems in some of the schools and all, all of that. The masks tend to be the least expensive of, of all of those uh, interventions, but I do think it's a multiple layer um, effort um, with masks and, and distancing um, being an important part of that. And I'll let the other guys talk as well. Uh, this is Dr. Richard Mobile, too. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, to the uh, I think uh, uh, mask, I, I think several of us have said that it, mask is one critical part of the whole mitigation plan. But I think mask is the one that we know literally more about than the other thing. Surely a better ventilation system is important. Surely having HEPA filter is possible is important. But the mask is one thing that we know uh, that can have immediate effect. While we are planning and instituting all those other things, uh, I think it is not one or the other. I think masking could be done quickly, and then uh, then we could worry about, or we should we can look at other things uh, in addition to masks. I was going to make one of the comments that I could say earlier. If we think about uh, the mask having being dirty and causing infection, and I think Jeff answered that very eloquently. I'll just say one thing. I, I'm sure no parent would send their child to school with a dirty underwear. Why would they send them with a dirty mask? Just wash the mask. Can, can I just comment just, just briefly on this please. as well? Um, uh, as my colleagues have said, masking is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, the other mitigation um, approaches using filters um, and uh, opening windows and so on and so forth are critically uh, critically important as well. I, I just, you know, I just want to to reinforce the fact that this is a dress rehearsal. We are not out of the water with COVID-19. We're probably not going to be out of the water with an additional variant that will be happening, in part because although if we reach herd immunity in this country from, uh, with vaccines, the rest of the world isn't. I need to remind people that the Delta variant comes from India. The, the Gamma variant comes from Brazil. And so there will be other variants, and there will be other diseases that we will need to face. So I say that only because an investment today in our schools will put us in a position of being prepared for the next variant and the next pandemic. You know, it's really important to remember there was HIV, 
There was SARS. There was Zika. There was H1N1. There was Ebola. So that what we're seeing today with, the COVID, with COVID is just the continuation of previous pandemics that just didn't quite hit the U.S. the way it hit other parts of the world. But we will be experiencing, and this is probably completely inappropriate to say. You don't have to say it. <laughs> but there is hundreds of millions of doll CARES dollars here, here. And to say that, and with all due respect, to say that it's too expensive to put in the air conditioning and the filtering systems that are required in order to protect our children doesn't, doesn't fit with the issue or the reality that there are hundreds of millions of dollars that are coming into, the, into our region specifically to address COVID. Thank you, I appreciate that. I think the superintendent will have an opportunity to talk about um, our CARES dollars um, in just a little bit. Um, board member, excuse me, Vice Chairman Willie. Yeah, through the, through the, through the chair. I, I was gonna ask a question around just our community responsibility when it comes to the pressure that when we have 600 cases every two weeks, what that does to our community hospitals and our system. Um, it also affects us as a school district. That's why we're here. But I wanted to ask just a very direct question uh, to each doctor and, and our Department of Health official. If, we'll, if we put a mask mandate in place, a stricter mask mandate, would that keep our schools safer and more kids healthy? That's the question. And I want each of our doctors, if you would, to just answer that question. Yeah, I, I don't mind going first and saying yes. I, I, I feel strongly that the masks will keep our, our, our community safer, our children safer, our schools safer, our teachers safer, and administrative staff safer as well. Uh, it would be nice to put in some other mitigation strategies also, but this low-cost intervention, um, you know, I, I feel very strongly will help to keep um, keep us safe. Remember the study in Lancet where you had two people wearing a mask um, and one one is infected, the other is not. Um, if neither are wearing a mask, there's a 17% chance that um, it would spread. If both are wearing a mask, there's only a 3% chance that it would spread. You're able to reduce the spread by 80%. So yes, I do think it would keep us safe. Thank you, Dr. And I, I think from my perspective, it's, uh, it's very simple. You know, mask in addition to social distancing, vaccines, and other processes is a very effective way of preventing its transmission. And even in the hospitals, where we wear masks, we are, some, we are often, we are most of the time, not able to have social distancing from our patients. The masks still work. So I think it's important that we don't minimize the importance of mask mandates. As I said in my presentation, if everybody doesn't follow the traffic rules, the outcome is going to be tragic. If everybody doesn't wear masks, the outcome for the school district is going to be tragic, unfortunately. Thank you, Dr. Rathor. Um, Dr. Goldhagen and then Mr. Rubio. Well, the answer to the question is absolutely. And if you want the data, we'll, show, we'll, we'll send you the studies. But I'd ask you just to look at the natural experiment that's happening. There is a reason why Florida and several other southern states are the epicenter for the surge in, in the pandemic now compared to the Northeast, where you, I have a granddaughter and kids that live in the Northeast. You don't walk out of the house without a mask. You don't walk out of the house without a mask. The difference between what's happening in Florida and what's happening in the Northeast can be, can be explained almost completely on the difference between mask requirements up north and the complete lack of mask requirements here in, in, the, in Florida in particular. So it's a natural, you don't have to believe it. All you have to do is open up the newspaper every morning, see what's happening in Florida versus what's happening in, in the Northeast. And, and Mr. Rubio. So just to be blunt and answer the question, yes, masks will help reduce the amount of infection that we are seeing. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pearson, opportunity to ask any questions you might have. Thank you. So I've been forming this question as y'all have been talking. Um, 
Dr. Goldhagen said that children not wearing, or typically children are not wearing masks at home, and that was in the context of the language acquisition uh, conversation, and then just made the comment about the difference in policies in the North and the South, which is the question, plays into the question that I've been forming. So if children wear masks at school, where they may be exposed to COVID, um, then wouldn't the key for them not exposing their parents also be to wear the masks at home? Because they would be bringing an exposure into the home. And then where else outside of school do children need to wear masks for the sake of public safety? And then how far do we carry this out? Where does it end? Dr. Collins. Dr. Collins, a couple of weeks ago, um, who's uh, uh, the head of NIH, um, uh, made that statement that maybe children should be wearing, people, families should be wearing masks. Um, and he quickly withdrew that, that comment. Obviously, if you take it to the nth degree, we would all, we, we, we should all be living in a bubble. Clearly, there are, there's a balance, there's risks and benefits, and clearly we don't necessarily think that, that family members should be wearing masks in the home. However, what you, the second part of that question is, where should we be, bear, where should we be wearing masks? Um, I think that's pretty straightforward. We should be wearing masks wherever, whenever we are inside, I don't know, in, indoors, whether you're vaccinated or not, and if you are in close quarters at a concert outdoors and so on. I think the data is fairly clear, and Mo Bean and, and Sunil can comment on it, that if you're outside in, in non-constricted areas, that the risk of contracting COVID is, is small enough not to require, uh, require masks. Thank you, Dr. Goldhagen. Mr. Rubio, and then we'll go to the phones. Jeff, I don't think I'd say it any better. I, I, I think he, he stated it very clearly. The family unit, as we've all said, you're gonna, you're gonna operate as a family unit inside of your home. We, we don't feel that uh, the risk factors there just have to be taken. Now, maybe if you had an immunocompromised family member or something like that, you might wanna protect that one individual, but you have to maintain that family unit. But I think, I think Jeff, I, I can agree with everything he said. Um, Dr. Rathor or Dr. Joshi, do you have anything additional to add or should we move on with additional questions? Can you, can you please repeat the question because we couldn't hear it? Board, board Member Pearson was asking um, where should people well, be? Well, I can repeat my question. Okay. Thanks. Go for it. Um, okay, so can you hear this? Yes, I can. Super. Yes, we can. Okay, so um, if children wear masks at school where they may be exposed to COVID, um, wouldn't the key to not exposing their parents be to wear masks at home? And then where else outside of school do children need to wear masks for the sake of public safety? And then how far do we carry this out? So, so let me take that. If, if, if everybody in school is wearing masks, hopefully there is no infection. Very little chance of infection. So when they go home, they will not take it to their parents. But if they're not, if, if, 5% of kids are not wearing masks, then they're placing other 95 at risk, and they can take that infection to, the, to their uh, uh, parents. Uh, Sunil already presented the data which shows that everybody is wearing masks, how, how, uh, safe that, that, how safer that can be. So that's one thing. In addition, where else uh, uh, children should wear masks, or wherever else adults are going to wear, are expected to wear masks. Not in the open, of course, but any other place where there is a congregation, a congregation of people this, they should wear masks. But schools are very specific situations where people, where the kids are in close proximity uh, for a long period of time. So I don't know if you could ex uh, extend this example of the school to other places. When I'm at the hospital, <coughs> I'm wearing masks all the time. When I come home, I don't wear a mask. I have kids. Uh, you know, we are all vaccinated, but we don't wear a mask. When I go out uh, to the uh, to public, I wear a mask. Or when I'm in my car, I don't wear a mask. Or when I'm out in the open, so I think this is, should be very similar. I don't think uh, this is an equal opportunity sector. This virus, so anything that's applicable to all the adults then applies to the kids. Yeah, and I would agree with Dr. Athor. Indoor uh, places um, where you cannot 
uh, typically socially distanced, absolutely wearing masks in your own house, um, where you're in your pod of people. Um, we don't wear masks inside of our house, but when we go out grocery shopping, uh, places like that, yes, we do wear masks in those scenarios. Thank you so much. Board Member Joyce, do you have any questions? Um, yes, I do. I have um, two questions. The first one is um, when we are, the first one is, would you say that all healthcare professionals, pediatricians agree that masking children is, is appropriate? Do you think that all healthcare professionals, pediatricians agree that that is the way that we should move as a board or as a county. Madam Chair, can you repeat the question, please? Going to hear it, please. A little, a little louder in here. My question is: Would you say in your um, in your research or um, in in talking with your colleagues that every pediatrician, healthcare professional agrees that masking children is absolutely necessary right now? I, I can answer that. I don't think so. Every pediatrician, every physician agrees on everything, anytime. I mean, there is difference of opinion. Clearly, you heard some of the physicians talking about that. I think what we need to look at is what is the overwhelming evidence? What is the overwhelming opinion? The American Academy of Pediatrics presents represent 67,000 pediatricians, the largest pediatric organization in the world, and they are recommending masks. Now, is our 57,000 of the members agree to that? Perhaps not, but overwhelming do. And, it, and, and they have elected people. Infectious Disease Society and Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of America represents the Infectious Disease Specialists and the largest infectious diseases organization in the world. They all agree on that. So I think, uh, I, I wish I could tell you that every physician agrees on all of the masking is under the Even Jeff Sunil and I may not agree on everything. But I think when it comes to masking, I think I would say overwhelmingly physicians agree with that. Yeah, and I, I would say that if you, if you got five physicians in a room, we can't agree on what color the wallpaper is sometimes. But that, but when it comes to something like this, when you've got the American Academy of Pediatrics that represents 67,000 pediatricians and the, and the overwhelming majority of them are, are um, in support of the mask, and the Infectious Diseases Societies of America are overwhelmingly in support of the mask. Um, and I think the general medical population is overwhelmingly in support of the mask, then yes, I would say that yes, we're in support of it, but not 100%. Um, you can't get 100% of anyone to agree on, on anything, really, but, but certainly the overwhelming majority uh, would go along with what Dr. Rathor just said. And if, so, if it would help, because uh, I am here uh, in part representing the Northeast Florida Pediatric Society, Dr. Cantville, who's president, and uh, Dr. Um, uh, Atkins, who's immediate past president, couldn't be here today. If it would help you, I'd be more than happy to get you a statement from the Northeast Florida Pediatric Society that, uh, defining that, in fact, the overwhelming majority of pediatricians in our community support mask requirements and that the Northeast Florida Pediatric Society supports mask mandates in the schools. So I will just add a comment. My concern is, as a mother of five children, I have the, a right to pick my pediatrician. I have the right to go to the pediatrician that I choose. And if my pediatrician, or as board member Hershey um, indicated, someone in her family's pediatrician is recommending against masking their children, that is, that's concerning to me because a parent has a right to follow the advice of their pediatrician. My second concern is when we talk about the variant, Delta variant, and you indicated that we are definitely going to see, this is the tip of the iceberg is I think the words that you used, and we are definitely going to see um, another variant or possibly more variants in the future. I'm an educator, I'm not a doctor, but I do, I am concerned about where does it end? Where does the masking end? Because if this, we, we, we masked our students last year, now we're, we're 
talking about masking them again this year. And this is worse than it was last year. And I'm hearing from the medical professionals sitting in the room that it's going to be worse in the future. At what point are we not masking children? Well, uh, the future uh, Chair, is not... This is uh, Raffle. I, I'd like to take the second question. I couldn't really understand the first one. Uh, I think we all need to have the humility, most of us as physicians. We don't know where it ends. We know what it is right now, what the science is right now. We know that the Delta variant is perhaps five times more contagious. The next one, the Axelon, may be even worse. We don't know. We will learn about that. And I think we will uh, make the appropriate adjustments as we learn. I think that's one of the things that causes sometimes confusion. But these are not static things. This is a very dynamic, situ fluid situation. And things will change. And we have to adapt to those changes. You know, the virus mutate all the time. This is not news. But the viruses that mutate and survive, they are really the worst ones. So Delta variant is just that. Delta variant is bad. It came from India. Gamma came from Brazil. There could be another one coming from somewhere else. There's one coming from Colombia right now that's in Miami. So I think we are going to be seeing more variants. They may be more infectious. They may be worse, even causing worse disease. Again, we have seen that in many organisms that they become, they change because their only purpose of life is to survive. And so I think that, I, I wish, uh, I, Madam Chair, and board members, I wish that I, I or anybody can answer that guest question specifically. But what we do know is that it will change. And what we do know is what we have to do today, what we have to do tomorrow or next week or next month or next year may be different. I don't think many people can predict that other than the fact that it will change probably. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Hathaway. and the only other thing I would add to that is, you know, if we can, you know, continue to encourage vaccines um, again, you know, the vaccinations uh, do help to keep um, people from the hospital with the Delta variant. Are they going to the hospital? Yes, some people are. I know we had a lot of speakers mention that earlier, but again, you know, the hospitalizations are 90 to 98% unvaccinated, and that is also where these viruses are spreading and where the mutant uh, variations in the viruses are succeeding is in the unvaccinated. So again, that's also part of our way out of this pandemic, let's not forget that there is a prevention strategy and that's the vaccine, which today got full FDA approval, by the way. Dr. Um, you're well, so that's why I think this is so important we get it right now, uh, because we know how to address these issues. We know if, in fact, we had universal mandates for masking if we know that we could reach herd immunity with vaccines, if we, in part, this is a, a huge issue, but also ensuring that the rest of the world has access to vaccine, we can address this issue. But any part of the system that doesn't rise to the occasion, and the school systems are an important part of that, then eliminate the, our capacity to address to address these, to address in this case the COVID pandemic, the next one may be worse, and we, you know, nobody wants to hear about climate change, but climate change is changing everything, and 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 organisms that were not prevalent in some parts of the world are now becoming prevalent in other parts of the world. Globalization and the world has changed. The viruses are smarter than us and can change. But we do have the capacity through appropriate public health systems to, to address these issues. And the school system is a critical part of our public health, public health system. We need to be investing huge amounts of money in contact tracing, as an example. That's, um, a, good, that's a good segue to Mr. Rubio. Yeah, <laughs> and so we can do this if we just do it on the basis of evidence and experience and sound public health policy. Ms. Rubio, do you have anything to add? Um, the, the only thing I can add is, is that, uh, as the doctors have already said, this is a dynamic changing environment. I don't think anybody can promise you anything in the future that would be very difficult for anybody to be able to do. I mean, if you had asked us back uh, when we started this, the, the surge back in November, the, we thought that was the worst we were ever going to see. It was terrible. and. 
now we are in August here, and this is the worst we've ever seen, and it's terrible. I don't know where the next one is. I, I, I can't answer that, and that's why I think we're where we are. Thank you. Um, I know, um, Board Member Koki, you said you had one additional question, and then I have a couple. Um, through the chair, and I believe this would be for the Department of Health, we've talked about the layering of mitigation strategies and masks and disinfectant and all that kind of good stuff. We keep coming back to vaccines, um, and I know we certainly aren't requesting that information from parents, but do you have any type of idea um, how, how much parents are taking the opportunity to have their children that are eligible for vaccination? Um, how, many, how many out there are actually taking advantage of that in our county? Well, I, I, we have data as to what is the vaccination rates by certain ages. I mean, I, we, we could talk about that. But if the question is, are we seeing an uptick in, in vaccinations? Sure. Back back in the 1st of August, Duval was probably 51% vaccinated countywide, mm -hmm. all age groups that were eligible for vaccinations. I think we're at 56, 57%. So, so you know, in a percentage point for us, it, it's a little over... 700 and something thousand available for vaccines. So you figure the math is 70,000 people. Um, so, yeah, we're going in the right direction. We're, 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 and, and the health department, in conjunction with our community partners, our physicians, our, 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 um, our federally qualified health centers, and our, our pharmacies, we are available to vaccinate. Vaccines are available to anyone that wants it at any time. So the, we, data, we the data would seem to indicate only about 25% of kids between 12 and 18 are, are vaccinated. vaccinated. That number is going up by virtue of what's happening around us, what's happening around us in, in, in Jacksonville. So some parents are seeing, seeing the changes and getting their kids vaccinated. But we're well below, well below 40, well below 30% vaccinated at this point. Through Thank the chair. You. Thank you. That was the number I was trying to get to. It's the children we serve. What are what are we looking at? Okay. Thank you. That age group. Um, Board Member Hershey, you have a second round. Yeah, I just, uh, from listening to all the public comments this afternoon, um, I think that one thing we heard over and over with people who had questions about masks is the studies that have been done, the scientific study, the peer-reviewed studies and reports that are out there um, addressing uh, the effectiveness of masks. And the University of Waterloo uh, just this month came out with a, with a study uh, that said 10 per, that, that masks only prevent 10% of exhaled aerosol droplets. And I think that that goes back to um, a consideration that parents take when they when they talk to their pediatrician or when they're you know trying to do their own research, um, and I, I just kind of want to put that out there because there is mixed information, and there are studies that that make people question effectiveness of masks. Uh, but my but my question is is um, if the push is to have students wear masks, then should there also be a push? Um, to, you know, last year we didn't do activities after school. I mean, we, we stopped a lot of things that came to a halt. I got, I got emails from a lot of students, even in Brain Ball Brawl, who said, why can't we have a Brain Brawl competition? Um, my question is similar to what I think Board Member um, Joyce was saying, is at what point do we say, here are the boundaries, you know, or do we just continue to restrict students and take away extracurricular activities, um, where is that line drawn? Uh, uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, I mean, I think you know. I hope you guys can hear me, but I, I think that you know we're talking about masks indoors with schools. You know, while they're in school and they're sitting in close proximity for hours at a time. Um, when you know, when you're outdoors playing sports. Um, and they're running around outside, that's a completely different scenario. Again, you're outdoors in the open air, um, and, and you know, they, we played soccer last year. We played cross country. My daughter ran track last year. They weren't wearing masks while they were participating in the sport, um, and they stayed healthy that way. These were outdoor activities. That's completely different than sitting um, in a classroom uh, that may or may not be poorly ventilated, 
you know, for hours at a time. So, so I do think that we start with mitigation measures in the classroom during the class during the school day, um, and and still allow the kids to play sports. I'm curious what the other guys think. Yeah, I think if you don't have that mitigation process, including masks in the classroom, where the chances of transmission are much higher than in open field, uh, then you will take that infection from the classroom even to the open field, and you will make those things much worse. Uh, so I think, it, it, you know, I, I don't know that anybody can say today whether we need what we need in the, in the sports arena or outside, but I think uh, if we don't do it, what we are, I think, makes sense to do is mask mandate, and then uh, hopefully that would be enough uh, and I, I, to, to prevent uh, limiting any other activities. I, I, I say hopefully. I don't know. I think I keep reminding ourselves and most of all myself that, you know, we are learning about this. This virus is only 19 months old, so we are going to keep learning about it. And as we learn more, as, as more science and more data accumulate, we, will, we, I think, should make appropriate changes. But as we sit here today, I think at this time, uh, a mask inside uh, in the classroom or inside the uh, closed quarters is probably the best uh, uh, way to go. If, if I can comment. Dr. Goldman, I'm actually going to have you just pause huh? just a second. I have a couple questions, and you may be able to kind of get your comment into that, but in the interest of time, um, I, I want to just keep everybody moving. Um, and I'm going to ask you to just open about that. I have two quick questions. Um, one, um, Madam yeah. Chair, your mic. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize. You're muted. I know. Mute. <laughs> How many um, of you're us? You're on mute. Um, and I'm live and in person. Um, two quick questions for you. The can anyone, not all of you necessarily, but it, anyone can, if you could speak to the urgency. Do we feel like this is a matter that is urgent um, for us to make a decision today? or in the near future. Can you speak to that? Um, yes, people are dying today. This Kids are right getting right. the I disease. Think, oh. I'm going right. to have Dr. Goldhagen, Dr. Rathor, I'm going to have Dr. Goldhagen answer yes, um, for us, and then we'll come to you on the phones. Uh, kids are, okay, kids are getting the disease. They're getting sick today. Uh, they're, um, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, they're spreading it to adults. Uh, we have, we are the epicenter for the country for, uh, for COVID hospitalizations, deaths, and so on. There's a reason for that, and the reason, a primary reason for that is that we do not have mask mandates and people are not wearing masks. And so, yes, it's critically important. You represent about 25% or more of the total population when you look at the, num at, at the number of students as well as staff, you represent 25% of the population. And so it's critically important that, 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 uh, that this decision be made as quickly as possible. Let me just, just the, the issue of people getting up and quoting the results from one study is the antithesis of what science is about. If you want to look at what, how, how decisions are made, they're made by doing meta-analysis, by looking at 200 or 300 studies and looking at the results that come out of those meta-analyses because any one study can have problems with it, it can be unique, and so on. So I would urge you to look at the Lancet studies and other meta-analyses which look at hundreds of studies in order to make a make a uh, to come up with a conclusion. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rubio, do you feel like this situation is urgent? So my answer to that is yes. I mean, if, if I have two cases today, I'm going to have four cases tomorrow, I'm going to have eight cases the next day, and so on and so on. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Rathor, Dr. Joshi? I couldn't hear uh, what Jeff said, uh, but I think to me it's urgent. In fact, it's Two, uh, two weeks too late. Two weeks too late. Thank you. I'm um, Dr. Joshi. We may have lost Dr. Joshi. My next question is when we're considering. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm here. Oh. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. So let me let me go on. Um, 
I apologize. I was on mute. <laughs> but um, we, you know, right, I do think it is urgent, absolutely. We have uh, six, roughly 600 cases after just nine days of school. Um, we had 10 at this point last year. If we don't do something now, forget about sports. We're going to have to shut down schools. You know, that's the problem, right? So the more and more positive cases we have, the more and more we get concerned about people in schools. And then before you know it, we're shutting down schools and we're not even going to be able to play sports. So, yes, absolutely, um, I do think that now is the time. Thank you. And then as we're thinking about um, what, if any, measures we might take in addition um, to what we've put in place previously and we consider who that should impact, um, I'm I'm curious to know your opinions um, about grade levels or whether or not we should... um, be selective in whether we choose to mask only elementary, elementary and middle, all K through 12. What is your opinion about who should wear a mask and why? Well, um, I I think that's pretty clear. K K through 12, everybody needs to be, every single individual needs to be masked. Staff, teachers, students, uh, every everyone needs to be masked, and the irony is, as you mentioned, I think as Sunil mentioned, that unless we do this, the schools are going to uh, be impacted negatively by having to shut down classes and then and then whole schools. And remember, the mask does two things: it prevents the transmission and also decreases the chance that you're going to get the disease. So that if if any any, if any child is not masked in the, in the classroom, then it increases the transmiss- transmission. And remember also that we measure transmissibility by the R value. The R value, as we mentioned earlier, of, of uh, COVID is sky high. So every child, every individual who is positive, and most of, most of them we don't know because they're asymptomatic. Right, which is why the positivity rate is, is a good number, but it's not a perfect number, they're going to spread the disease. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rubio, while you're here, do you have an opinion on what, what ages we should consider masking? Uh, my, my comment to you, would I would be following what the uh, Academy of American Pediatricians is saying, that uh, vaccinated or not, if you're indoors, wear a mask. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rathor? Dr. Joshi? Yeah, so I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Goldhag. And, you know, at this point, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to pick and choose great. Um, you know, obviously, our youngest kids um, haven't been vaccinated, those under the age of 12. And that's, that's where you would want to see the mask definitely be in place. But once you start doing that, um, that's an enter on the slippery slope. And so I would suggest. Um, you know, for for grade K through 12. Uh, this is Marine Raffle. I'm sorry, I was talking and I was on mute. I, I would say uh, this time it's uh, all public school students should get it. I think until they are 100% immunized and it's a vaccine mandate for school entry, just like for other vaccines, I think we need to make sure all children wear masks. And we, we know that children two years and older uh, can easily wear masks. They're, 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 that's not an issue. Great. Thank you so much for um, your time with us. I do think that we probably need to move on, hear from the superintendent with her presentation. Um, so I want to say thank you so much. No, if you, you want to remain with us um, as we continue through this conversation, um, you're welcome to do so. Uh, Mr. Rubio, I'm sure we'll have questions as the superintendent goes through um, what she has to present to us and what's going on with our schools now and over the last two weeks related to cases. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rathor, Dr. Joshi. If you need to hop off, I fully understand. Um, thank you for being so patient with us as we have been here for many thank years. You very much for the, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I hope we do what's best for our children. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your leadership, everyone. Thank you. Um, Dr. Green, I know that you have um, some information to share with us this evening related to the COVID-19 mitigation measures and what's been happening in our schools this school year so far. Um, so I'll turn it over to you. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. I will say that the bulk of my presentation is about 
the data that I shared in a email to the board, um, I think it was Friday of last week. It is about where we are with the number of cases and how we made some adjustments in notification to families. Um, as stated, on day nine of last year, we only had 18 cases. Of all of last year, we had 2,498 cases. To, on day nine, which is Friday, last Friday, we had 589 cases. Today, as of this data is as of 11 a.m. this morning, we, we are we're more than this, but at 11 a.m., we were up to 757 cases. Of those, 106 involved staff, 611 involved students. When we look at the positivity rate or the percent positive rate, um, last year, when school started, which school started later than now, we started school last year, August 20th. The percent rate was down to uh, less than 8%. This year, in starting the school year, even though we started two weeks earlier, August 10th, the percent positivity rate was at 21%. And that is for our community. This is not um, uh, specifically about our schools. When we look at last year, the cases on a seven-day rolling average, it was about 136 uh, cases on a seven-day rolling average. Today, on a seven-day rolling average, we're averaging over a thousand cases. Again, this is information from our community, which um, the link is at the bottom of the uh, PowerPoint that we are getting this information um, from. It's from the CDC uh, data tracker for uh, all all districts in the state of Florida. At the beginning of the year, when we did the um, language for the code of conduct, we put in the language, the board approved, strongly encouraged all students wearing masks, but that students had and op families could opt out. We've been reporting to the board, um, not every day, but last at the very, we reported the first day of school, then that first Friday, and so every, every so often we've been reporting to you what is the opt-out, but we never reported it by grade band. So this is where we are today. Um, about 8.32% of students have opted out at the elementary, middle school 9.08, and high school with the largest at 11.09%. For a total average, um, about 10% if we look at the total average. So my letter to the board last Friday where I said I had grave concerns about our ability working with the Department of Health, which the Department of Health has the responsibility of notifying families, doing the contact tracing, and by the fifth day of school, we recognized that that was being very delayed. And I think there really are, if I had to, if you're asking for my opinion, I think there are two things impacting that. Last year, when students were uh, required to quarantine, at, if you remember, at the very beginning, it was 14 days. Then 14 days moved to 10 days. This year, 10 days has moved to seven. So if we get, not if, when we get reports of a positive COVID case, that report is immediately put into our system. And then that information is sent to the Department of Health. Um, now that families can have access to home kits, the Department of Health has to verify those home kits. And I believe we're seeing a vast amount of our cases being reported to us using home kits. And they may not have been verified. 
So now we're automatically talking a delay. Uh, and I would say, and Mr. Rubio is here, that that delay can be anywhere from 24 to 48 hours of first just verifying that report. So now go back to seven days. That's now two days of the seven. So let's just say that report is verified on day two when it is a secondary school. It is, not as, it is not as simple as elementary because generally elementary, all the children, for the most part, are right there in the classroom. For secondary, they're tracking everything and elementary from bus to their entire day. And so when you're looking at secondary, if all sixth graders are not in the same periods with each other. We have some sixth graders who could be taking a class with eighth graders because they're in advance. So the contact tracing is a little more complicated and challenging for secondary. And I explain this because people have asked, well, why can't you do what you recommended in the change for secondary versus elementary? And that is the reason. It's going to still take a significant amount of time to identify everyone who would need a letter to, to know. And so when you look at this chart, Right now, they are only closing out about 14% of all cases reported. 41% are in the pending, but the number that rose the concern for me is that 45% have timed out. Timed out means seven days have already passed, and therefore, it's a timed out. To, um, that's the period in which students would be quarantined. And so that is when we came to DOH and worked with them and said, we have to find a process by which we can notify families quicker, sooner, so they can make decisions about what to do. And that is why we came up with the uh, implementation of, at an elementary school, as soon as we have a report we are not waiting for that report to be verified. We are simply saying, a parent called, their child is positive. Um, Ms. Trisoto and her team make a, you know, the decision of finding out, well, when was the child last at school? But even with that information, the, the children in that class are immediately given a letter to take home so that they can share with their parents that there was a positive case in that classroom. Also notifying any adult who would have been in that classroom. So if it's, a, if it's an SLA classroom that may have a couple of parents who would have been working in that classroom, they are also notified as well as the classroom teacher to ensure that everyone knows that there was a, a positive reported case. The, com the complexity of uh, immediately closing the class is a, is a challenge because we have to rely on the information coming to us. So a parent calls in and says, my child tested positive. Ms. Trisoto's team has to figure out, well, when was the last day your child was at school? They may say it was Monday, but we got the report on Thursday. How Days have already passed. Monday, Tuesday, went four, we're now in the fourth day of that seven day cycle. And that's what makes it very challenging to figure out, well, why not just close the entire class? Because we do not always get information immediately. And when we say immediately, the child might have went homesick on Monday, the parent might have thought, well, they had, you know, the sniffles or they thought they had something else, it's sinuses, and then they decide, well, I'll take a COVID test, and then it comes up positive. Just those days passing makes it challenging for the district to say, this is a positive case. And I know that many of our parents, our families, our teachers, our, our staff that are in school, you see someone who has the sniffles and they go home, Immediately, everybody thinks, well, that's COVID. We cannot make that assumption. We actually have to have something that says 
yes, this is a positive case. And that's, that's why we made the decision, one, to inform the board, two, to change how we were doing notification in collaboration with DOH. The goal, hopefully, for the next four weeks is that the, the district will notify families at the elementary level and that DOH will handle the secondary cases because they're, as I stated, they're more complicated than when we just go to a classroom. The last part of that is within the seven days, if a second positive case comes out of that classroom, we will immediately close that classroom, DOH will tell us how many days, and those students will go to our Duval homeroom setup while they're on distance learning. And that, so far, will be the process for the next four weeks. Our, our goal is to ensure, one, that we are notifying our families as quickly as possible. Number two, giving the Department of Health an opportunity to um, add more staff to their, to their department so that they can get to the point where they can fully take over the contact tracing and investigations at all levels. But I do think no matter how many people they bring on, because these are coming so quickly, today I said at 11 a.m. we were at 757. I truly believe since 11 a.m. we have received over 60 more COVID cases throughout the day. So um, I'm, I think I'm confident in saying by Wednesday we will be over 1,000 cases uh, in Duval for DCPS. So when we look at our quarantine rate in comparison to last year, um, by this time we had only quarantined uh, 82 students and even with the lag, we still quarantined 279 students and 13 staff, and we closed down four elementary classrooms, two of them being pre-K. The other two, I believe, was a first grade and a second grade. If we were using our process that um, we just pivot to, I'm highly confident the 279 student quarantine would have been far more in the thousands because we would have started notifying. We would have looked at if there's a second case in that classroom, closing down the, in, the entire classroom. So I will share with the board these numbers are going to grow as we um, inform families as well as as we possibly get uh, additional cases uh, during that seven-day period. In addition to making the change for notification to families, we are also um, in the process of standing up 20 testing sites, 20 COVID-19 testing sites. These 20 sites will be for employees and students. The goal for students is that if a student is symptomatic and a parent wants their child tested, they can go to any one of the 20 testing sites with um, very similar to what we did last year when the city had a number of testing sites. We would just give them the form that says you, you qualify for testing and they just go through that specific line the city had set up for us. We will do the very same thing here except they will just go to one of our 20 school sites and do a drive-through um, COVID test. For our students, it will be the rapid indigent test, and I know enough just to be dangerous, so <laughs> don't ask me questions. I'll call on Ms. Trisoto when we get to that. It is an, a, a test that can be um, determined in 15 minutes. So that will be one aspect of student testing. The second one is for our students who are quarantined. The, the information we have now, after the fourth day, if a student tests negative on the fifth day and is um, asymptomatic, 
they can return back to school. If, they're, if they have symptoms, um, they cannot return back until after uh, uh, day seven. And so students could be coming to the testing site to say, um, I'm asymptomatic, uh, I've been quarantined now for four days, on the day five, if it comes back negative, they can go back to school. Or if students are experiencing symptoms and parents want their child to have a test, they can go to uh, one of the 20 sites. We hope that um, our sites will be up uh, early September. We are waiting on an organization that are sending us free tests. Our first um, shipment is for 4,800 and then our second shipment is for 48,000. And hopefully we will be able to provide that support for our families as, as we move forward. So I'm now open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, for giving us that update. Um, board members, questions for Dr. Green or Mr. Soto or Mr. Rubio? Board member Joyce. Um, through the chair to Dr. Green, um, you indicated on day nine of last year we had 82 cases, and on day nine of this year we had 279 cases. Um, can you speak to what the student population was um, in brick and mortar the, the student number in brick and mortar for those two numbers? On, um, I will have to get Mr. Wright to send you those numbers, but I can give you about ballpark. Um, day nine, it really, 82 was who, how many students we had to quarantine. On day nine, we, we only had 18 cases. On day nine, we probably were close to 99,000 students in, uh, in our system, but of the 99,000, probably 35,000 were either DVIA or Duval Homeroom. Of the 99? Yes. 35,000 were in Duval Homeroom. I'm, I'm just yes. specifically looking for the number of yeah. brick and mortar students. So I, I would say it's it would be hovering somewhere between 60 to 70,000 students okay. that were in brick and mortar. And then at day nine this year, how many in brick and mortar? I would, um, we have today close to 4,000 students have signed up when we opened the window, closing on Friday, of DVIA. So uh, we're about 100,000 students in brick and mortar. On day nine? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Joyce. Um, additional questions for Dr. Green, Board Member Pearson. Hello, Dr. Green. Hello. Through the chair to Dr. Green. Um, could you give us an update? We've, we've, we've all received a lot of emails, and then we heard a lot of testimony, and parents are asking about other mitigation systems and other things that we can do, and they've brought a lot up. So I was hoping you could give us an update on some of these, on where we stand. I think it would be good for us to know and then for anyone who's listening to know. Um, where are we on updating filtration systems, on uh, masking on bus, buses, on our transportation, on deep cleaning in our classrooms and providing supplies to our schools, on rescheduling or reconfiguring the code red drills, and then on the availability of the ESSER two funds, what, what the district has access to of those ESSER two funds? Through the chair, I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up and uh, ask Mr. Soares, Assistant Superintendent of Facilities, to address the facility issues. Mm -hmm. As it relates to ESSER two, right now we only have access to what, the, what we call the advanced lump sum. For Duval, that's about $66 million. ESSER II is a little over $148 million. DCPS, the, um, our portion of that is uh, probably $138 million. Um, a portion of that must go to charter schools. And so right now, that is the only portion of the funding we have access to. For the American... Um, 
for ESSER 3, I'll just say ESSER 3, that um, pot of funding has not been made available to school districts in the state of Florida at this time. Okay. And that is uh, three, for Duval, that would be $330 million. Question on um, code red drills. Last year, the state waived the state statute on the, uh, on the types of code red drills schools must implement, um, and I think the one you're most concerned about is the active shooter drill. We have requested from the Department of Education to please put that waiver back in place so that students do not have to physically move and uh, move to the spaces that they would if they were having an active shooter on their campus or what they are required to do under the act for active shooter drills. So we have al already made that, not just Duval, but all the superintendents have made that request. And it's our understanding that the Department of Education is working on to see if they can get that waived. As far as the facilities, I'm gonna let Mr. Soares address your addition, your other questions. Okay. Uh, through the chair, the board member Pearson. We do try to operate as much as we can by an ASHRAE standard for minimizing exposure. ASHRAE is the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, the ASHRAE guide talks about you know different areas of, of, of HVAC, HVAC system operation, where it, it talks about try to get a certain number, at least three, air changes during unoccupied time. So we start the air systems up an hour, and now we're going two hours before. That ensures that we'll get at least three air exchanges during the unoccupied. Outside air is assumed to be clean. So that's why you want to get at least three. We're doing that now. Um, the problem with outside air is that it's, the system has to condition it. So it comes in and saturated, and it has to cool down and get the water out. So you got to watch the mold and mildew, because it also, ASHRAE also says, maintain temperature and humidity. That's why some recommendations people, your people talk today and have said that they, we should just open windows, put fans in and just bring air in. If you do that, you're gonna bring a bunch of really humid air in and within a matter of days, you're gonna have mold. So that's why you can't do that. Um, but what you can do and what we're working on right now is filtration. Uh, the other thing that ASHRAE really recommends is if you can, and it's in their back documentation because normally an AC unit has a filtration level called the MERV level, MERV 1 through 16. MERV is just an acronym, Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value. The key thing is the number. Most of our systems are rated at MERV 8, which doesn't remove as much particle. It tries, ASHRAE recommends try to get as close to 13 as you can, and it says even if you can get to 9 or 10, try to raise it. So we're working on that now. Um, the drawback is that if a unit's designed for eight and you put a MERV 13, there's a pressure drop. You may not get as good of air conditioning, but the, the point is the systems have ranges. They're not designed to work at one level. So we're looking hard at that right now. The cost to upgrade all the filters is a little over $600,000. There's a number of schools of units that already have MERV 13. Others can be upgraded for relatively low cost. So the bottom line is we're looking at that right now. The reason that's so advantageous, if we can get to MERV 13, that moves, removes 85% of the particles that carry COVID. If you go up to 14, 15, 16, you only get to 95%. That's why ASHRAE focuses on MERV 13, because that's a really efficient level. And again, that's really what we're working on now, and I think that's gonna generate the most. It's also very careful in the standard to talk about air distribution. Don't do things that mix air. Like, you don't wanna be having air feeling the wind in here, because if there's an infected person, you're just circulating particles that more forcefully. So you, uh, that's why you want to rely on the building system, which is set up with an intake and an outtake, and try to maximize the efficiency and filtration of that system so that you don't get a lot of moving air around. So that's basically what we're trying to do on the HVAC level, and we're in the middle of that and, and going to take that as far as we can. On PPE, last year we shipped PPE out to schools every month, set amounts just going. This year, you know, a lot of schools came back towards the end of the year and were saying, stop you know, wanted to ship things back to us. And we kind of said, okay, we're, we're gonna change it this year and we're gonna let them keep their stock levels and then we're gonna ship based on request. So we've notified schools multiple times. Several schools have asked and we've shipped out a lot of different PPE and wipes and those kinds of things. Uh, not many gowns, 
That's something a lot of schools have. So that's still available for schools to order for PPE, and a lot of schools are taking advantage of it. You know, when it comes to masks, we have you know, something like uh, four million, four and a half million disposable, two million, or a million, just under a million in cloth. So we do have a lot of masks on hand, so that was needed. And deep cleaning, we work through a deep cleaning schedule now with a new contractor. He has cleaning levels that he does, surfaces and classrooms and, and tables and cafeterias, admin spaces at night. He does, uh, on certain weekends, does additional cleaning. And then on the breaks, we do a deeper clean as well. So we are sanitizing during the after hours at all schools. And that's a protocol we have. Different schools have gotten concerns. We've gone out, had staff go out and meet with them and go through the protocol, make sure everybody's aware. Because not everybody's really aware, even though we distribute it, people just aren't fully aware of what's happening, so they can't really talk about it. So it's important to understand that cleaning protocol exists and is being implemented right now as we speak. So I think that's it. If there's another point you have. I have two follow-up questions. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Soares, if you could, we heard parents talk about, and I've heard, I've received emails with constituents talking about GoFundMe and raising money to provide HEPA filters and some other, um, I'll call them appliances, um, for classrooms. And I, I would like to give you an opportunity to speak on that from a facilities point of view. It, it's very kind. It, they're doing it out of kindness and concern, but how does it affect facilities? Well, through the chair of the board member, Pearson, let me tie back to something we're probably familiar with space heaters. You've, you've heard the use of space heaters, and what typically happens is they throw breakers. People try to bring them in because it gets cold. And that's really the danger. Of some the requests that we've had, we really need to see the amperage requirement. That Because if you put 25 units in a school along one circuit, you're probably going to blow the breaker. So I, it's not really something that's, I mean, it can help some. But going back to ASHRAE, when you bring a unit in like that, if you put something in the middle of this room right now, you're going to feel air moving around you. And, and it basically creates currents, it creates disturbances. Does it help the people in the second or the third row? Nobody knows. You don't, you don't really know the effectiveness of the unit, despite all the claims. And that's something also that ASHRAE guards against. Be careful on what you choose. Make sure what you choose has proven effectiveness in a room. So I, I wouldn't, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly um, positive thought. And I'm glad that people are thinking that way, but in reality, what we really need to do is, is move forward with increasing the filtration. Now, we have an ESSER project as well, as Dr. Green mentioned, it's held up for over $10 million to increase the, uh, the actual units themselves. You know, what I'm talking about was just changing filters out and having a slight degradation in the system, which is what's so tricky about it. But if you change the whole unit out, now you're at MER 13 permanently. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're focusing on the oldest units. So we, we funded 500000 on our own and are doing three pilots right now upgrade to MER 13 and if we get the ESSER we'll go further with that uh, so we're not sitting still uh, thank you I appreciate that and then my second follow-up question is through the chair to Dr. Green so we know that the ESSER 2 money is in Tallahassee or somewhere in the state of Florida just not here um, how about the ESSER 3 money do we know if if the state of Florida has received the ESSER 3 money or what the status is of that through the chair to board member Pearson, it is our understanding that they have a portion of ESSER 3. Uh, the state of Florida has to finish its application to receive all of the ESSER 3 dollars. I cannot tell you what portion of ESSER 3 the state has received. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, board member Pearson, Vice Chairman Willie. Yes, through the chair, I have a couple of questions. Uh, thank you for the presentation, valuable information and timely information, urgent information as well. Uh, question real quick, I'm, I have three, three questions. The first one is about the COVID test that you talked about. I know you said uh, uh, a rapid home test or uh, a home test and then uh, the heart PCR. So maybe this is through the, through, to Dr., through, through Dr. Green to Mr. Soto. Um, just wondering about PCR tests versus at home and who's getting which ones and how quickly those come back. I heard 15 minutes, but just wanted to get it clarity there. First through, question. Through the chair, the vice chair, Willie, uh, is your question directed to what we use? Correct. We use PCR for our employees. Okay. The uh, test that I'm speaking of that we hope to receive is for students. Okay. And um, Ms. Trisoto keeps nodding, so I keep thinking I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying the right things. That one is a rapid antigen test that can be done in 15 minutes. You know the results in 15 minutes. If Ms. Trisoto would like to add anything to that 
I'm going to turn it over. Yes, that is correct. So um, just to reiterate what Dr. Green had already said, the um, current testing that we have available to our employees is the same testing that we had throughout last school year, where we offer the PCR testing. And the reason why we've kept that in place is because we had that established last school year, because per the Florida Department of Health, they were requiring PCR testing in order for our employees to return back to work if they were exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19. So um, with that being said, we just continued on with our current contract that we had to continue to offer that same testing to our employees. The um, testing comes back within 24 hours for the employees for the PCR testing. And um, the rapid antigen kits that Dr. Green was referring to, um, those will be 15 minutes um, with results within 15 minutes of having that test taken. And those will be available to students and we're receiving those free through the um, uh, partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank Got you, it. Mr. Tricetta. Yeah, a follow-up. Um, how does one go about getting it? If I'm a student that thinks I'm positive, where am I getting one of those tests from? I know, not, not now, but when, it, when they do come, where would I, how does that work? So we are currently, oh, through the chair to board member Willie, we are in the process of finalizing those plans, but typically how that would work is they would be offered to students who are exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19, and the students would just need to go ahead and notify their principal. We currently have a system in place through our Qualtrics reporting <laughs> system. So if an employee is symptomatic, they just would let their principal know and that principal submits that referral for testing through um, the, the Qualtrics um, system. My department receives notification of that and I do have someone on standby that receives that information and calls and gets that person um, set up for testing. Right. And so um, I um, imagine that we would have that similar system in place where a referral would be placed and that student can go ahead and get tested at one of our 20 sites that we'll have available. Got it, thank you for that. Last question is through the chair to uh, Mr. Rubio, I believe. So we're talking about this delay in the Department of Health because of lack of staff. I'm just wondering, how do, what is the plan to get more staff on board? Is there a money tie up? Is there ESSER funds that need to be drawn down that you don't have? Because we can do this for four weeks, but at the end of the day, we're gonna need backup. And I think it, it's actually, it's, it's reckless that we don't have this in place. Like it, it is, like we have, we have such a delay that folks don't know and then they just go off the list. That's not acceptable. And I'm just wondering where, where the money is, where the staff is, and what is the plan to get more folks on board? Through the chair, Mr. Willie. Um, we are working diligently to bring staff on board. Um, we've already doubled our staff uh, as of Friday. Uh, this morning, I believe, uh, we added another six staff members. I've reached out to the Department of Health in Tallahassee. We are diligently trying to hire staff. I think, um, I don't think all of your teaching positions have been hired. I mean, I think a lot of us are feeling the pain of trying to find um, trained and professionals who want to come work for us. And so we are doing that diligently. Uh, our plan is to, our goal is to bring 30, to bear 30 contact tracers, investigators to bear for the for DPSC schools. So that, that, that's right, that's our conversation with us. That's our goal right now. I don't know if that's enough or not. Uh, you gotta set a goal, you gotta try to get there, you gotta, uh, you know, you, you, you have to, you know, plan, do, check, act it so that we can make sure that it is working. We will continue our partnership with the staff and the superintendent to bring to bear what we need to be able to do to meet the needs of our children of our county. Quick follow, how many, how many uh, staff do you have right now? Duval. In Duval, handling Duval cases right now? 18. Okay. And you wanna increase it to 30? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rubio. Uh, Board Member Coker. Um, through the chair, either to Dr. Green or um, Mr. Soros, uh, two questions. One, um, similar to board member Pearson, I've had some feedback from teachers and principals and such about various items that they're wanting. Um, one question has been desk shields. 
Um, we've had some people say that they don't have dust shields available. I believe there has been some activity on that. If you could speak to that item. And then the second item is if we were to make um, a, a change tonight, a decision to move forward in some way with, mis with masking. Um, you talk about the X number of face masks you have on hand. I've heard about orders of face masks. How many days would it take to make sure that our teachers, our schools have what they need um, to, to follow through? I, what I would hate is we try to do something and then schools don't have what they need, teachers don't have what they need mm -hmm. to implement. So what does that look like? It sounds like we've got a big storeroom with a lot of stuff, but, but what is the logistics of that? What are the logistics? Through, through the chair, can I answer the first half and I'll let Mr. Soros answer Absolutely. the second half. Um, through the chair to board member Coker, our secondary schools, we did not require them to have their they could take down their old dust shields. The, the secondary, it was very challenging for them to utilize that particular dust shield. For elementary, they, we asked them to store all their dust shields, not to get rid of them, and that we found a newer dust shield that looks more like this, but not this thick. Um, and that if they wanted to use these dust shields, they could use it for small group because that was the time that they were probably closer together. Since then, we sent out, we do everything through Paltrix. We sent out Paltrix and said, I'm pushing you to put up dust shields up in your classroom. If you don't want to use your lovely cardboard ones, then put it in Qualtrix and we will get you these. So Mr. Soros has already started that order. There are at least 10,000 in stock that are being pushed out to schools with the addition, as schools keep saying, yet yeah, we'll change out the cardboard ones and get, I'm pointing to this only because it's completely clear. It is not one with a Border. frame on it. We still have not made, made that a push at the secondary level. Elementary has been our number one priority to say you need to you need to tell us if you know you're taking down you don't want your cardboards anymore you need to tell us to get the um, clear ones. As far as mask we as Mr. Soros said we have close to a million of these the cloth ones two million of the disposable ones Schools are given those because right now, if they don't have an opt-out form, we do encourage the administration to say, you don't have an opt-out form, here, here's a mask. We have been very clear not to tell, te teachers should not have to be put in that position trying to determine who's supposed to be wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. So it's available, the, the stuff we have in stock is like to whatever the shipment day for the courier to run to school is how quickly it's going to get there to them. Do you have additional questions for um, uh, My only other question, I heard, um, and I think it might be helpful for the public to know this, um, lanyards, I think there was some deliberate um, thought yeah. with that this year. Um, is that something that? Um, yes, for all students, we have ordered what, the, what I have is a mass lanyard so that um, especially for, a, this is an elementary mass lanyard. Um, it's breakable, so they can't be choked by it. But when students are outside, that was a problem last year that they would say you could take your mask off, but what were they gonna do with it? They, they put it places. So now they can simply just take it off and it can just stay on their person and hang. So we have ordered this for every, this version for every elementary. The secondary version is a little thinner, more like a rope because they already wear very thick lanyards for their ID. So, yes. Uh, through the chair, thank you, and very nice modeling of the item, uh, Dr. Green. We enjoyed that. Take a flight attendant and training. Yeah. Um, board member Hershey, questions for Dr. Green. I have a question. First, I want to say that um, I think with the opt-out um, option that we have, it's quite impressive to me that 
um, out of all the students we have, 10% uh, have opted out, which shows me that parents uh, make the right decision for their children. Um, when I was in, um, on campuses, I saw a majority of students at my schools in my district wearing masks. Um, and I think that this flexibility has been important. But my question is, as I, um, as I was on campus the first, second, and first and second days of school, um, there were problems with the app for opt out. Um, forms, as my understanding, forms are physically sent home to uh, ask students if they want the vaccine. Uh, we did not physically send forms home with students uh, for the opt out. My question is, uh, have we updated at all that the app so that that works? It was kind of crashing that first day of school. I know I was helping a parent and it, it didn't work. Where are we with the, the uh, app and the opt out? Or uh, not the app, but the opt out Fo form that's on the app. The focus parent portal. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Where are we with that? I'm going to ask Mr. Wright to address your question, Mr. I wasn't aware of any crashing or issues with opt-out form. Currently, it's still in the parent focus account as I, I, it I got was. a lot of emails, um, and, and I personally worked with a parent. He pulled it up, sure. and he, then he couldn't put his information in and got frustrated. So um, has that been ironed out? You're saying, to your knowledge, there was never a problem with uh, um, the link in focus. Some of the concerns that I've been made aware of is when the, the parent is not linked to the child and they don't have the linked account and the PGA approver approved verifying who the parent is, that prevents the form from self-populating because it doesn't recognize that the student is connected to the parent. That's really the only concern that I've been made aware of that we continue to address through the linking at this point in time. Okay, so our numbers based upon the information that we have is that only 10% of students have opted out. Through the chair and board member Hershey, that is correct as of today. And when we look at numbers uh, of students who've tested positive, we do not identify if those students are students who wore masks or not masks. Through the chair to board member Hershey, no, we do not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Board Member Hershey. Board Member Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. To the Chair, Dr. Green. Uh, la with last year's protocols in place, uh, follow up with Mrs. Joyce's question, we had um, roughly 60 to 65,000 students in brick and mortar last year, which this year I estimate about 30% more students in school brick and mortar this year. And when I look at the, the number of students testing positive, when I reduce that by 30%, you're still far greater than what we had last year this time. Is, is, is my math correct on that? Or had you Through the chair to board member Jones, uh, I'm not that great with mental math. I have to write this down, okay. so if I'm going to have to trust what you, what you stated. Um, but what we're just seeing is the quantity each day is vastly larger than it was last year um, at this time. So um, I can only speak for the yeah. first 10 days of school. And one other question, I don't know if we have the information. Do we have the number of students who opted out for medical reasons last year from the mass requirement? Do we have an idea? Through, of what through the chair to board member Jones, no, sir, we did not. We just told families they could do a medical opt out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, board member Pearson, and then I have a few questions as well. Okay. Um, this is through the chair to Dr. Green. I feel like this is a test question the way I've written it, but <laughs> um, if you could compare and contrast the consequences for unmask for an unmasked student under the current policy, which is highly recommended with an opt-out versus under the 2021 policy, which was mandatory with no official opt-out. The question is, again? can I compare and contrast the consequence? The consequence to the, an unmasked okay. student under this year's policy versus last year's policy. The disciplinary through, through the chair to board member Pearson, this year there is no consequence 
Last year, it was tied to the student code of conduct. So really, it would be insubordination if you just would not. So that's the, conse the consequences listed under that particular item, con uh, discipline consequence. Yes. So as a student, if I, what would I, first time, second time, third time, at what point, is it a referral, I, I, in school suspension, like what's going to happen to me and at what point last year if I didn't wear a mask? Through the chair to board member Pearson, the first time it's a reminder. You need to wear your mask uh, and keep it on. Second time would be insubordination. That could be, range anywhere from, it would start with a referral for insubordination. That could be anything from a call to the parent to in-school uh, in suspension. That would be, you know, kind of down on the list. However, based on last year, we had very few students that even got to that point. So last year when the policy was mandatory with an unofficial opt-out, we had very few students through the chair. Progressing to, through right. the discipline. Yes, okay. through the chair and board member Pearson, we had very few students that ever made it beyond insubordination. Okay. Um, board member Joyce, you said you had some follow-ups. Um, yes, yeah, so through the chair um, to Dr. Green, I would, I, I'm wondering if those numbers, because I really am interested in the numbers on day nine of last year and on day nine of this year, it seems like that should be pretty easy to get to the board relatively soon here. It's specifically the number of students who are in brick and mortar mm -hmm. in 2020 on day nine and the number of students that are in Duval County public schools, not charter schools, brick and mortar um, this year. So I would like to get a real definitive number there before we um, move forward with that. Um, and then also with the disciplinary action, if the board were to a, approve a mask mandate tonight, um, what would be the disciplinary action that would the students would receive or the families would receive if they did not comply? To the chair, to board member Joyce, if you're using the same wording that was used last year, it would be the same first time remind you a reminder second would be along insubordination and it's just insubordination would go up in degree um, I do need to remind the board that last year um, we had a hybrid in place our high school students only came to school two days a week right. so even if we gave you total numbers that does not mean that many students were in brick and mortar because at the very beginning for the first nine weeks, our high school students only ca they came on A day or B day or orange, and, orange day, green day, however they set it up. So they weren't there every day, uh, as well as middle school was on a hybrid. So In the first we, can, we can give you total numbers, but I'm not sure on day nine that someone could say, well, this is really how many students were in school on that day because we had a hybrid model going. I understand. I would yeah. still like that. Yes, that. We'll, they'll get you that information. Thank you. Um, I can tell you, I'm looking at an email here that says on day nine, we had 102,991 students enrolled this year. Okay. <laughs> so I can give you that number for now. Um, and then my understanding is that they're... Now, through the chair, um, that that's inclusive of DVIA, so... That has but, about four or 5,000 students? On day nine, it, it probably was more, it was closer to 3,000. That was probably last the last day for uh, signing up for DBIA. Um, perfect. That's a good segue into my question. Um, can you, as we're talking about all the different mitigation measures, you know, one of the big pieces of what we worked really hard to do last year was to reduce the number of bodies physically present in our building so that we could do things like socially distant and um, be able to control class or between class um, movement and lunches and all of those things. Um, we know that this year, Duval Homeroom um, 
isn't an option because the waiver that was in place last year for attendance requirements from the Department of Education is no longer in place. So we can't count students present in attendance at their school um, if they are not physically present in the building and we don't receive funding for those students if they were, for example, on a Duval homeroom remote and remaining in their school. So we've, we went back, we offered Duval, instruction, Duval Virtual Instruction Academy. Um, you opened up another couple of days. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about what the barriers are, why we don't just keep that open so that families have more choice? Can you tell us a little bit more about those virtual options? Through the chair to the board, um, DVIA is a, an actual school. It is an, a state of Florida certified virtual school that has very similar barriers that if you were in brick and mortar apply to DVIA. Um, for students, for us to get funding for DVIA, it is about completion. And students, secondary students need um, an, an amount of time to complete a semester if they have a semester course within a semester as well as a year-long course if we were to keep it open for many of our secondaries they would not have enough time to complete the course therefore the school district would not be paid for that those courses that we are offering it is not like Duval homeroom that you are tied you were tied to your school wherever you were enrolled and Duval Homeroom was considered a remote innovative option under the executive order. They waived state statute. State statute states that students must be present in brick and mortar to be counted for FTE, and FTE is how we are funded based on um, the, the number. I won't even get into explaining FTE because it's a little more than just the number of students. So that is why we could not offer Duval Homeroom because that executive order expired. And DVIA, because of the nature of the way that the courses are offered, you really need to be enrolled at this point in order to be able to complete the course. Otherwise, you're really kind of just doing yourself a disservice. You can't just hop in and out. Um, in the same way we might have had some flexibility with right. Duval Homeroom. Through the chair, that is correct. It is, it's not the same as Duval Homeroom, where you could leave at the end of the nine weeks and go back into brick and mortar. And at a point, we did let you even come back, but uh, it, that's different. We do not do that in DVIA. We strongly uh, discourage it. And Duval Homeroom as an option for elementary schoolers for a stay-at-home directive. It's a little different because that whole class with their teacher um, they access one another virtually, but it's not like another teacher or another staff person is required or we set up a different homeroom class. So we don't have to have the additional staff um, on hand in a school site to be able to support Duval Homeroom in the instance of a uh, stay-at-home directive. Through the chair to uh, the chair, um, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> um, in, in its most simplest uh, format, that would be correct. Uh, it becomes a little more complicated when you're just doing stay-at-home orders for some students. That's different than the whole class is going to Duval Homeroom versus, oh, they've done contact tracing and only three students need to self-quarantine. So what happens with those students? They, they would self-quarantine for the number of days that um, it would start, whatever those number of days would be, and again, after the fourth day, if they're asymptomatic and they uh, they come and take a test, it, it doesn't have to be with us, but they have a test that says negative, they can return back to school. Um, my question but is more related to during the time learning. that they're home, mm -hmm. we would offer them, whether it's access to teams, but we have to offer them similar curriculum that they would have seen if they were in brick and mortar for them to be counted present. If they are sent stay at home, but they may have become symptomatic, they still get to make up their work, but they're not considered present. They would be absent. Those would be excused absences. And the teachers are managing, kind of doing teams, world, and in classroom, or has that been a struggle? Well, we haven't had 
that many students, again, if you, um, my data shows 279 and the vast majority of those have been either pre-K or secondary. Um, we closed two classrooms, a first grade and a second grade, but that was the entire class. So they are accessing their teacher through Teams. Um, it will probably become a struggle the further we get into the school year. Uh, our teachers are phenomenal in that many of them have become very proficient in utilizing Teams and they, they have found ways to put stuff out there on Teams and they don't have to be present but students know how to access it. So um, I'm sure we'll be working alongside our friends to ensure that it's not as challenging. Thank you. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about um, what we are at this moment, given the language we have in the dress code, um, what staff are saying to students or what principals are saying to families related to masks? Through the chair to uh, well, the board, um, again, the wording in the code of conduct says masks are strongly encouraged. Uh, however, parents can opt out. Uh, families can opt out of, of our um, wearing a mask. We have asked our principals, do not make our teachers be the mask police. They really shouldn't ask them anything unless you see a child who wore a mask yesterday and today they're not wearing a mask. You really need to go talk to your principal. Did this child's parent opt them out or is this something they just decided today not to wear a mask? And if that is the case, we highly encourage principals to say, hey, your parent doesn't have an opt out. You need to wear a mask. Here's a disposable one. But just and to be clear, that directive would change if the language in the dress code changed to required. Yes. I strongly recommend it. Yes. Um, I have just a couple other questions. When we're looking at the dashboard and we're, we're trying to assess the numbers, some of the things I heard today about the statistics of how many students or the total student population, um, they're quoting the number, the entire number of public school students. But just to be um, clear, the number of DCPS students that we have enrolled um, is closer to the 102,000. Um, and we are not seeing information on dashboards related to charter schools. Is that right? Through the chair, that is correct. We do not report charter schools. We're only reporting our traditional public schools. So as, as people are kind of thinking about a percentage of our student body, we need to just consider that that number would not be captured in the dashboard? Through the chair, that is correct. Thank you. You talked about um, getting shields and masks to, to staff. I'm hearing reports of that too, where it's a struggle. They want the, the items, but they just either don't know who to go to or it's just not happening. Um, so thank you for addressing that. I think that's gonna be super important. Um, how's, how is it going with our new custodial contractor? To the chair, um, so far off to a good start. I think uh, they've, one big plus tangible is under our old contract, we were routinely under by 100 plus people a day and HES to date has been able to stay fully staffed, basically. Uh, there's some call outs for some days, but by and large, they, they're, they're meeting their contract requirement. And having enough people is the first step in the battle. And then it's just a matter of, of going through the transition. There were some issues in the first week or so, just because when ABM pulled out, they pulled a lot of equipment back in the transition year. That's always an issue. And uh, HES, the new company, had to just keep pushing equipment into the schools to make sure we had adequate equipment to be used uh, for cleaning and I think we're largely past that so overall off to a good start and a lot of one-on-one -on -one visits are, are occurring I think that's like three got set up today where they're going out specifically talking with schools going over protocols making sure people are aware of what's going on great thank you I appreciate that um, is there a scenario where you see us needing to close schools close not a school but revert to dual homeroom for the district. Through the chair to the board, we address our cases by school. We do not address, address it by district-wide. So 
in, in, in my mind, we would address it by school. Um, last year, we closed, um, I think, two, two schools, gotcha. and it was because of what was happening at that school, not district-wide. And even with our numbers where they are today, I would say we would still address it by school, not the entire district. Because I do have some schools that have no cases at this point. Um, um, I do want to, if I may, I have the numbers for Ms. Joyce. Thank you. Yep. If, last year on day nine in brick and mortar, I was, I was close, 77,336 students. In Duval Home Room or DVIA, 29,701. Um, we were talking about school closure. Last year we had a pretty clear matrix on a classroom or school closure. Is that same metric um, still the best suited for the new um, directives with quarantine and stay at home? Are, are we? My understanding is that we were looking at 20% of the population impacted, but given our inability to be able to determine how many people are impacted is that something that we'll go back and revisit through the chair um, to about to the board um, right now it's still 20 percent and we believe that what the changes we've made in notification definitely will help us move quicker at the elementary level and also support DOH being able to address the secondary level. On Friday, when we had this um, conversation, they were, uh, well, the first day, uh, Mr. Rubio and I had the, uh, and our team, uh, both of our teams had the conversation. They only had 6.5 people. The very next day, when we came and said, we need, we, this is not going to do it. You heard at that point they had gone up to 12, and today they're now at 18. I think if, if Mr. Rubio can meet the goal, we will be able to keep with our matrix um, in stating, well, once you get to 20%, uh, we would, uh, that would constitute closing a school. I've heard that other districts have gone um, and hired or contracted out with vendors to do contact tracing. Is that something we've considered? Through the chair, we have that information. And we've been, as I stated, Mr. Rubio has been very forthcoming and we've been very forthright as well. And if they can't meet that, and he's, he has a deadline for his goal, we have this uh, third party of the possibility of contracting with the third party for contact tracers. Great. Um, my last question um, is, do you know how many employees or staff people we have in the hospital currently? Through the chair, no, I do not. Do you know how many um, we have lost since July? Through the chair, um, we have lost seven. Thank you. All right, I appreciate um, all of the information and the updates. Um, I think at this point, we have, we've gotten a lot of information. We've heard from a lot of people. We've been talking again for quite some time. Um, do we need a break? Are we ready for Ms. Maris to tell us what options there are? Just keep going. Okay, let's go. Um, so at this time, I'd like for Ms. Maris to let us know um, what are the requirements for emergency rulemaking um, and to give us some different options or help us understand what's available to us as it pertains to um, facial covering policy. Okay. Through the chair to the board, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. I know that you guys have heard a lot tonight. And the last thing you want to hear from probably is a lawyer at this time of the night. <laughs> so I'm going to just try to, to get to it. There's just a couple of things I want to remind you um, of because we're not often in this position of emergency or potential emergency rulemaking. Um, so one thing that we are required to do per pursuant to Florida statute 120.54 and then we have a board policy mirroring that statute, board policy 2.25 is that we are required to publish in writing at the time um, of our action 
the specific facts and reasons for finding um, an immediate danger um, to the public health, safety, or welfare, and the reasons for concluding that the procedure used is fair under the circumstances. So whatever we do tonight, it's going to need to include that in writing. And I have already um, started drafting, and I'll share that with you in just a moment, just to get us off and moving, um, if that is the direction that we're headed. The other thing, and I know we brought this up last time, is whatever we do will be in effect for 90 days. Um, and it's not necessarily from the adoption date, it's from the effective date. Um, and I think the board will probably be thinking that if we do decide to do um, a mass mandate that it probably shouldn't start tomorrow for a myriad of reasons, um, especially if we talk about having a medical opt-out or if we talk about the idea that people have to go and get masks, even though I know we have a lot in the storehouse. Um, it's 90 days from the day we make that effective. So I think that's another thing I would ask that you guys remember. Um, I am going to pass something out to you. Um, when I learned of the emergency meeting, I immediately tried to go as your attorney to the other districts that have already been here, done that, um, and tried to pull from the policies that they've done. And I believe those other districts, um, I had a list, but were Hillsboro, Leon County, Sarasota, Broward, Miami-Dade, Alachua, and Palm Beach. And as we know, majority of those are some of the largest districts in Florida. Um, I also tried to think about where Duval is currently situated, where we have it in our dress code. We don't currently have a separate policy. Some people have very long, detailed policies. We're not there at this exact moment, and we are exercising our emergency um, you know, powers. There may be a point in the future where we have a more expansive policy on what to do with um, in times of communicable diseases regardless if it's coronavirus or something else, and that may be something we want to talk about in the future. Um, but right now, I've, what I tried to draft, and I just want to kind of um, walk through the sections with you, and I implore you, take all of it, take none of it, take some of it. I'm just trying to get us thinking as to the different minimum things we need to touch on tonight if, in fact, we are going to do a mass mandate. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you is that I do believe it to be a two-part process. Um, I think the first process um, that we're going to need to do is there would need to be a motion to invoke our emergency rulemaking authority to enact a policy requiring mask. So I think it would be a good idea to first vote on that and see if we have a majority of the board. If so, we can go forward on what does that look like. And I think there could be some, you know, discussion, um, you know, and debate about what does that look like. But the question is, are we to the point of wanting to, to do that? Um, I think once we get that done, we're going to need our code of student conduct to match um, what we do here tonight in terms of the emergency rule. Um, when we were here on August the 3rd, as you guys will remember, we did the strongly encourage. Um, well, first of all, our code of student conduct that you guys approved was the entire code of student conduct, not just for one piece of it, okay? So, um, and I know this is technical, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and tell you, I think the proper motion would be what's called a motion, it's called a bring back motion, um, a motion to amend the motion approving changes to the student code, student code of conduct as it pertains to face mask that was previously adopted on August the 3rd, 2021. So we would not be disturbing any of the other areas of the student code of conduct. We would only be revisiting that paragraph in the special note section um, of our code of conduct. So, it, the, you know, if we get past the first one, I think the second one will be very fast and much easier. I just think technically we need to do um, those two things. I will tell you that everything you find in what I drafted has been taken basically from another district. It's a mishmash of um, districts and things that they did. And primarily, I just wanted to get on paper the areas that this board would need to make a decision on if they decide to go forward. So um, I'm going to pass that out and just ask for a brief opportunity to just explain it very quickly. And again, it is open for use or not being used or or whatever. Okay. Is that okay if I pass it out now? Yes, you can you can just pass it over to board member Jones. Sure. I'll pass it down. Just 
Um, I did bring with me several copies of probably two of the um, policies I relied more heavily on from Hillsborough and Sarasota. So if at any point during now or a break or at any, you know, that you want to take a look at that, feel free. And then once it makes it to Dr. Green, I will go over the basic structure of what's been drafted. Um, for the benefit of us who are receiving this for the first time and the public, the audience who's here with us today, folks watching, um, would you mind yes. reading? Going, you want me to read it out loud? Okay. Um, okay. It's entitled Emergency Rule of the School Board of Duval County. Whereas Article 9, Section 1 of the Florida Constitution provides for a uniform, efficient, safe, secure, and high quality system of free education, and whereas to achieve a uniform, efficient, and safe school system, the Florida Constitution created school boards, Article 9, and whereas the Florida Constitution grants the school boards the right to operate, control, and supervise all free public schools, um, see Article 9, Section 4, Florida Constitution, and whereas the school board of Duval County, Florida, um, the school board is a duly elected body, and whereas the school board is responsible for the proper attention to health, safety, and other matters relating to the welfare of students, Florida Statute Section 1001.42, subsection 8A, and whereas the school board also has supplemental powers to adopt programs and policies to ensure appropriate response in emergency situations, Florida Statute Section 1001.43, subsection 7, and whereas Duval County Public Schools is one of the largest school districts in Florida, whereas the School Board of Duval County values the health, safety, and welfare of its students and the district staff, whereas the Delta variant of COVID-19 has been shown to be highly transmissible, and whereas the Governor of Florida issued Executive Order 21175, which in part directed the Florida Department of Health and the Florida Department of Education to immediately execute emergency rules to ensure safety protocols for controlling the spread of COVID-19 in schools. And whereas the Florida Department of Health executed Emergency Rule 64 DER 2112, which provides in part student may wear ma ma excuse me, mask or facial coverings as a mitigation measure. However, the school must allow for a parent or legal guardian of the student to opt out the student from wearing a face mask or covering. And whereas the 2021-2022 school year began on August 3rd, 2021 in Duval County, and whereas and listening to Dr. Green tonight, we would, I would possibly need to update some of these numbers. Mm -hmm. After only eight days of school, 492 cases of COVID-19 were reported to the Florida Department of Health. Of those, 76 involved staff and 416 involved students reported a positive COVID-19 result. And whereas a total of 24, 2,498 cases reported in total on the school's dashboard for the 2020-2021 school year, meaning that in less than a week of the 21 22 school year beginning, DCPS was already at 19% of the total cases reported for the entire 2020-2021 school year. Whereas the Florida Department of Health has admittedly been unable to complete contract tracing, case investigations, and timely notification to impacted families regarding the results of the investigation, um, whereas of the 492 COVID-19 positive cases reported this year, only 63 cases have been completed and closed by the Florida Department of Health. Whereas due to an immediate danger to public health, safety, and welfare that required emergency action, an emergency meeting of the school board was called by the chair as well as other board members to immediately address the emergency. And whereas the school board of Duval County heard from the Duval County Department of Health and medical experts and doctors at numerous meetings predating the emergency meeting as well as at the August 23rd, 2021 emergency meeting. And whereas the doctors and medical experts testified that the wearing of masks and vaccines are the most effective tools for controlling the spread of COVID-19 in schools. And whereas masks protect the wearer and those around them by protecting against the transmission of large droplets from one person to another. Whereas mask usage is beneficial to keeping children in school for in-person learning because when two students both wear masks and one test positive for COVID-19, this is not considered a close contact, thereby eliminating the need for the student who did not test positive for COVID-19 to quarantine. And whereas the U.S. Food and Drug Administration previously stated there's no adequate, approved, and av available alternative to the emergency use of face masks for source control by the general public to help prevent the spread of the virus due to face mask shortages during the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the emergency rule executed by the Department of Health does not prohibit the requirement of a medical certificate of opting out, and whereas the emergency rule adopted by the school board of Duval County gives the decision 
um, opting out of the facial covering requirement to the parent with a medical certification. And whereas the Center for Disease Control recommends children in school wear facial coverings indoors, um, and then it, we, we go into the actual policy part. Now, therefore, the school board of Duval County enacts the following emergency rule pursuant to section 120.54 Florida statutes and board policy 2.25. Um, obviously, what you see in the whereas clauses, again, we can keep all of them or some of them, is that number one, I'm attempting to meet the requirements of section 120.54, which is the basis for the emergency rule as well as the procedure, procedural fairness afforded. But what you also see happening is that, you know, as we're all aware, we have an executive order and we have um, the rule from the Florida Department of Health. Um, and I think it is important for this district to show that if they decide to do a ma mass mandate, it's not for the purpose of defying the governor, it's anything but, but instead it's because they are attempting to do their job and what they are required to do per the Constitution. So I, I am trying to establish that because um, everybody's very well aware of the um, various lawsuits as well as the letters that have come um, from the Department of Education, um, you know, threatening to to take board member salaries and and other things that have not we've not seen happen yet, but they said could happen. Um, so that's the first part of it, and then I will hurry through the other part. The other part is pretty self-explanatory. That first paragraph is just the meat. That's kind of here is the the general mask mandate. Something like that is what we would end up also putting in the student code of conduct um, as well. It, was, it should be basically the same paragraph that would go in the student code of conduct. Um, opt out exemptions. Um, if you look at the Department of Health emergency rule, it does not say what kind of opt out. I'm, we're not trying to be cute here, but they, you know, every word in an emergency rule is incredibly important. And the opt-out that I've at least provided for initially is an opt-out for physical, medical, or psychological purposes, um, as long as there is a medical certification that accompanies that. And so um, to, to say that the moment we do this, we're in violation of the executive order or the Florida Department of Health rule, I do not think at this juncture is a fair statement. Certainly there will be others that argue but I think it's necessary that we at least make it clear that we would be considering the, the medical opt-out if that's what you also choose to do. Um, the next thing is the duration of the emergency rule. I said it could be up to 90 days. You guys may say 30 days, 60 days. Um, so I would, you know, we would need to make sure that we told the public how long you wanted it to be in effect before we revisit it. The next part I think is incredibly important. Um, what I've heard from uh, comrades across the state um, who have been sitting in the same seat that I'm sitting in is that when you try to get, because this is such a complicated issue with so many subparts, and when you try to get into excruciating detail um, from this, <laughs> from what we're doing now, you end up with a bit of a mess of a rule because you have so many different um, opinions on so many other issues. My suggestion and what has been suggested by my colleagues is it to the extent that you're wanting a level of detail that the board may or may not be comfortable with deciding tonight that you turn that over to the superintendent and have a date for her to report back to you obviously sooner rather than later and there's a variety of type of things that you could ask her for um, one that i've included um, was whether or not this board, while this um, emergency rule is in play, whether or not we want there to be an automatic um, suspension of the rule if our community or our district gets to a certain level in terms of maybe positivity rates. Um, and then, if, of course, if it climbs back up, do we want the rule to be reactivated? That's an example. Um, I've heard the board talk a lot tonight about other mitigation measures. Yes, this is focusing on masks, but we've heard about filtration, obviously the word vaccines. There's all kind of other measures out there. If the board wanted um, the superintendent to go back and research certain measures, um, again, we could do a report back date on that. We would just need to say what further action um, is being required after the main mask mandate is, is approved. And then lastly, this is the basis for the emergency rule. It's just summarizing the whereas clauses and the procedural, procedural fairness afforded, um, which is, shows when we posted the notice for this, which is in line um, with our, our board policy um, 
and it was you know certainly um, told to the public when when the meeting would be and so I will that's I think that's a summary of kind of what's been drafted um, thank you Ms. Mayors just so that I can be um, clear and that the board knows kind of what what is the next step um, you mentioned that um, there is a process um, for making a motion to enact the emergency rule um, related to masking, would that be a, if someone made that motion and it was seconded, would we go through this during discussion or would we have discussion, vote on whether or not to move forward or does it, I mean. Yeah, I, I think just to, you know, to, to keep it clean that the idea would be first to do a vote to see if, you know, we have a majority that wants to um, invoke the emergency rulemaking authority. And then we could at that time discuss some of the ins and outs and see if I can't draft something um, you know, on the spot that incorporates everything everyone said. And then at that point, we could actually vote on the language of that mandate emergency rule. So would there be a motion to enact the rule? Uh, I would assume some sort of motion to adopt so it would be a motion, I mean, the, the way that I, I said it, motion to invoke emergency rulemaking authority to enact a policy requiring mask. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think initially I would keep it that simple and then whatever other detail we get into, we get into. Uh, but then how do we get to this? If we wanted to do that? So is there another motion? No. That, I mean, so if, you, right, if you do that, then we start, everybody, maybe I think it would be a good time to do a recess so that everybody could look over this and then we could start going through the individual areas. When do you want it to become effective? And then we could discuss that, you know, and go through, um, you know, what type of, you know, exemptions or opt-outs do you want? Then we can discuss that and just kind of go through, there's probably four areas that at a minimum we need in this policy that I need feedback from the board on. Okay, we've heard from Ms. Mayors. She's given us some direction. Um, questions for Ms. Mayors, Board Member Coker. Um, through the chair to Ms. Mayors. Um, it, it, my, I'm gonna backtrack to something that you referenced um, earlier and that I um, had asked you about as council at one point. Um, if we were to, um, so that we could maybe get out of emergency rulemaking at some point, um, dur if we were to, during this time period, should something be enacted, also charge the superintendent uh, to work with medical professionals and such um, and, and experts in our district to develop some type of policy around communicable diseases so that we have something in place so we don't have to put our community, our teachers, our principals through this again. Um, uh, would we include that as a part of this or is that a separate and aside request that we would do? I think it would be separate. Okay. I think we would just, you know, start the normal rulemaking process. Okay. Um, and notice it and go from there. Okay. But so I the hear your <laughs> yeah. So desire the chair to have something. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, Board Member Pearson. Um, through the chair to Ms. Mayor, um, just so I'm clear, the first vote is to invoke the emergency rulemaking, and then we wordsmith and haggle for maybe, for lack of a better term. And then do we vote again on the final wording? Okay, so yes. potentially there are two votes. So it's possible to vote to invoke. And then to adopt? Yes. And then the second vote would be either to adopt or not to adopt. Right. And we could go through this process multiple times on the adopt or not adopt to adopt potentially right which is why i'm encouraging to do a minimal amount in the policy and then give it over to the superintendent obviously all of you can speak individually with the superintendent between now and whenever you want her to report back and that's when you know all of that information can be shared with her in terms of what your desires are you're shaking your head because i think you have a quizzical face on you too. I just want to be really clear. I don't think we can go through adopting or not adopting more than once. If we vote not to adopt, then we voted not to adopt. Right. Uh, what if we want to amend? Then we can make motions to amend. Right. The, you can the draft um, language. Yes. Okay. Right. There can be like secondary amendments to the primary, okay. and we can do layers okay. of on amendments. Yes. I'm sorry that I was not clear That's about okay. that. I just wanted to make sure that we we understood the process. Other questions for Ms. Mayors? 
I have a question. Board Member Hershey. Um, I appreciate the work you put into this. I, my feeling as a board member who's been on the board for five years, I feel like we've had this meeting with an agenda and here it is. And I don't know what conversation has taken place. I know that this did not happen, you know, it, it, just since the time we've been sitting here. So I feel like there was an intent or a plan or an agenda to get us to this point. Um, and I appreciate um, the work you put in. And I just want to say that as a board member, um, I um, have a problem um, being at this point when we haven't had any discussion, but here's what you need to do. I, I, I'm real, I'm, I, I'm not going to say too much. I'm disappointed in how this is handled. I'm disappointed in this emergency uh, meeting, specifically after a meeting last week where four people said we don't want to have this conversation again. I appreciate the community that's that's shown up, um, but I, I am actually greatly troubled to get to this point. We don't have an emo but the work's been done, so it's clear there's an agenda, and that's all I want to say. And I'm going to stop talking. I would ask for a chance to respond Ms. that to Do you that have a question for Ms. Mayor. Uh, uh, no. no. I would ask for a chance to respond to that. So I, I hear you, Board Member Hershey, with all due respect that you're saying that you appreciate it, but I think what you're saying is the opposite of that, that I came in as an attorney for the I'm Office not, of General that Counsel that is not employed by this board um, with an agenda that is very difficult to take, professionally speaking. What I did do was try not to be in a situation where I'm sitting here and everyone's asking me for language and I don't have anything written down. It's no secret that the purpose of calling this meeting was to discuss a possible mass mandate and that is what I've tried to tr draft. I said from the beginning, you could take all of it or you could take some of it. In addition to that, I do speak with board members. Four of the six of you have called and spoken. That's when we would have had that conversation. Um, and I did not, you're right, you and I never spoke about it. So I did the best I could with what I have. Um, my understanding too, just for the record, is that um, as I spoke with since board member Willie's email asking for an emergency meeting and as I spoke with team members on uh, staff and with Ms. Mayors that there was a majority of the board that was interested in having this meeting today. Nothing was called here without checking in with the board members on that. So um, just, and, just for yes. clarity. And excuse me, I meant five of the seven. I said four of the six, I meant five of the seven. Thank you, Ms. Mayors. Board member Joyce. I just want to, um, I, I, I want to say that last week, you brought it before the board. I did. Do we want to revisit a mask mandate? Four board members said no. Mm -hmm. And one then of on, those board members changed their position. And then, okay, so <laughs> that didn't happen in the, that didn't did happen not. in the sunshine. It, but it also did not happen with me. They, they spoke to a staff person. I was made aware that there were, was a majority of the board that was interested in moving forward with the emergency conversation. If you'll recall, the weekend before, there was another conversation about whether or not we should have an emergency meeting. And my response was, I don't want to move forward unless we think that there is the potential for a majority on the board, which is why I didn't move forward with it further before, previously. We have new information. The superintendent sent us ample documentation. Our case counts have continued to go up. This continues to be emergency in our community and in our school district, and people's positions changed. So we are here today to review information. This is the first time that I am seeing this myself. And what I think is fair is that we have the conversation for the good of our body and rulemaking and for the good of the public and the community. At this point, Ms. Mayors has said that we can make a motion to enact rulemaking and then decide whether or not as a board we'd like to move forward with rulemaking. So unless there's further questions from Ms. Mayors, I would entertain a motion to enact, through, excuse me, to invoke rulemaking powers. Through the chair. I'd board like Member to Coker. make a statement if I could, because I'm one of the ones that did not want to change anything last week. At that time, there were multiple other factors at play. Number one, we did not have the numbers on the dashboard that we had. Uh, number two, there was a lack of information at that point to make a decision as to the penalty that was going to come out of Tallahassee. We now understand that the greatest penalty that we're seeing right now is possibly me losing my salary. That's a different story than us not being able to pay teachers for two months. Last week when we were looking at it, we had no idea what it was. Um, if the biggest risk is me losing my salary, 
then uh, let's have the discussion. In the end, we may not make a change. It may not happen. Uh, it, it will depend on the language in this as to whether we do. But the numbers are such that, again, I did change my mind as a board member because the, the situation at hand changed. And I had a responsibility to the constituents I serve to, to reevaluate. Thank you for sharing that, Board Member Copeland. Board Member Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, this, this is a issue has divided not just the city of Jacksonville, Duval County, but the entire state. It's unfortunate uh, that we, as a board, is put in a position where we have to make a decision what's best for our students. And it's not easy. You have people on both sides. I respect them. I listen to them. I took notes when they spoke. I've seen, can't say I've read every email, but I've tried to review, review many of the emails. Uh, and so I think given the data that we've received, uh, I did not vote uh, on August the 3rd when we met to impose a mask mandate. I, was, I, I came in the meeting with that, that intent and I said, well, you know, given the fact that we could risk funding for our students, then that's something I couldn't jeopardize. Uh, it seemed like now the governor has taken it off the table and is, is punishing those board members and not our students. I think that does change the, the situation. We're, we're not putting our students' funding at risk. And when you look at the data that we received over the last two weeks, it's very clear, abundantly clear, that our numbers are increasing. And the reason I asked about the positivity rate is because that's a, that's a leading indicator, not a lagging indicator. So we know it's going to get worse before it gets better until the, the positivity rate comes down. So what do we do? We, do we sit back and allow that number to increase and we become the la laughing stock of the country because we're already one of the highest in the nation? So what do we do? Uh, and I think we need to address a mass mandate. If we, had the, we had the experts. Uh, testify that we need to impose it and so we need to start that process. I would move that we invoke the emergency rule making uh, authority for this board. There's a motion on the floor to invoke our emergency Second. rule making authority seconded by Vice Chairman Willie. Um, is there discussion? I have something. Vice Chair. Uh, through the chair, uh, one of the reason why we're up here today, yes, there was a vote, uh, I guess, last week on Tuesday when the numbers weren't as high. Um, I follow the dashboard regularly. I mean, I have two little ones in school, so I see it. I see the numbers rise. I'm with the anxiety that every other parent has every single day as they look at it and refresh it at 8 p.m. at night. Um, and I, every day that we come in, I know I've been bringing it up. We should revisit. We should revisit. Um, it didn't work that day when I wasn't here. And then as those numbers in that email came in, I started to email and figure out how can we get this in front? It's an emergency. Like, it is an emergency. The numbers are, are way higher than they were last year. Even if you take out the Duval homeroom, the percentages are still tremendously higher than they were last year. So we have a responsibility to pull whatever levers we can as a group to figure out how to keep as many students safe. And that's why myself and others wanted to be here today. And I think we need to do that tonight. We have to step in and create a safer environment for the students tomorrow and the next day than, than it is right now. Because as we see it, we tried at the very beginning to put that measure in place and be creative, but it's not working. So we have to figure out how to do better and we have an opportunity tonight to do that. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Board Member Joyce. Um, I appreciate those comments, um, but I will say that the question that I asked earlier was do all healthcare professionals agree about the mask mandate for children? And the answer was, no, we all don't agree about a mask mandate for children. And so, as a board of, edu we are a board of education, not a board of public health, we're not a board of, we, that's just not what we do. We are a board of public education. And my fear is that you are taking away a parent's right to listen to the advice of their pediatrician. If their pediatrician says, 
I do not recommend that you wear a mask. I don't want my, these children to wear a mask. Then we're saying we don't that we don't care. Like we're we're smarter than you. I want to leave the the option to a parent to make a decision based on their pediatrician's recommendations to invoke a mask policy. If they wear a mask or they don't wear a mask, but for us just to say, you know, this is what we're going to do, and we are not healthcare providers. We're not doctors. And we have doctors in the room that don't agree on this. And then when you, that's just from a medical standpoint, I can't, I can't do that. From a legal standpoint, it's not about an executive order, and it's certainly not about a salary for me. But what it is about is there's a law, and the law was passed on July 1st that said a parent has a right to make medical decisions for their children. A mask is a medical decision. It is. And so we're saying we're going to override the law not just an executive order, a state statute. And whether you agree with the politics or not, whether you agree with masking or not masking, at the end of the day, we took an oath to uphold the law. And the law says parents have a right to make this decision. And so I will not support this because I'm not going to take that right away from the parent. Thank you, Board Member Joyce. Um, any other comments on this side? Um, Vice Chairman, for if, a second time. Uh, through the chair, if, if we, if we, I understand that there's law, I understand where we are, but if we do, if we continue on the path that we're on, we will see 2,500 cases in nine weeks. The second nine weeks, we'll see over 5,000. And I don't know, how do we handle it? How does our system um, handle that? How does it handle that pressure of students out having loss of learning, uh, teachers not being there, loss of learning? Um, students being at home, parents, loss of income. I just don't understand how we can not do something at this moment when we see these numbers and they're only getting worse. You just heard the superintendent say they're not getting better, they're getting worse. So these numbers that I'm putting out, they're actually light. We could see even more than that. So we have to do something, we have to put something in place because it's like watching an accident happen and us not doing anything. We have an opportunity to do something and I know it's a, a different and bold move, but we have to do something to protect our staff and our students and this is what we have in front of us today. That's how I feel. Board Member Pearson. All right. Um, when we, when it was on our agenda sometime back in July, um, before the governor made his executive order, my, what I was going to walk into the meeting with was mask mandatory with an opt out for parents. Um, and um, to make that choice. And I feel like what we settled on was the strongest we could do under that current understanding. I can, under the executive order, under the information that we had at the time. And I was happy with, I, was, I felt like what we did, we, we made a good policy at that point. Um, and the numbers show that 8, 9, 11% on opt-out, there are not tons of families opting out. It's, it's really around 10%. As I have gotten emails from teachers and school staff, um, not so much parents, I'm really paying more attention to the school staff on this one. It seems like we have a problem with enforcement and with compliance. And so I feel like we drafted something in good faith to try to give, strongly recommend, to try to give parents the opt-out option. We actually wrote it kind of as a hold harmless agreement to show the gravity of, of what opting out was. And there are, what I'm hearing is there are families in schools that are not doing either. So they're not sending their kids with masks, they're telling their kids they don't have to wear a mask, and they're also not signing the opt-out form. And I think that is the problem. I don't think the problem actually is with our policy. I think the policy is all right if people would comply with the policy. And this is what, what I've been wrestling with all weekend, is 
I think we have a good policy. I'm happy with the policy that we have. I'm happy with strongly recommend. I'm happy with the opt out that we have. I think we fit within the box that we need to fit in as far as what the governor and the Department of Education has given us to fit into. We're doing the most we can complying with the rules. What I'm having trouble with are the families who are not complying with the rules that we have and the problem that it's creating on enforcement for our school staff. And, and that's, where, that's the space I've been in all weekend is trying to figure out what to do with that. And, uh, you know, I keep hearing the words of my sixth grade PE teacher from Pine Forest when some kid would do something and he'd make us all run laps and he would say, the good gonna have to suffer with the bad. And I feel like we might be at a good gonna have to suffer with the bad situation here because for the 10% of parents, and I, and I have opted out two of my kids, so I'm in this number. For the 10% of parents who have opted out, it, it may be more difficult. I will not vote on anything that doesn't have an opt out, but it may be more difficult for them to do the opt out than it currently is. Um, and I am, I am so sorry for that because I think what we put out was a good policy and it has, it's really been ruined by people who wouldn't comply. And it was so easy. Either wear the mask or sign the opt out form through focus. This was not hard to comply. And so I'm, I'm frustrated all over the place. I'm frustrated about this meeting. I'm frustrated that I found out about this from a friend in church yesterday morning mm -hmm. because she read about it in the paper or in online in the paper. And, and as a board member, I had received an email on Friday that had this communication in it. And then I'm being told by somebody who's not on the board a member of the community that it's all over the news and that's before I got an email asking me when I was available for a meeting so we can talk about that as a board at some point but I am I'm all kinds of frustrated over this process and it's not just one thing it's there are multiple things that I'm frustrated about I will just say for for the record the I was confused um, there was no meeting scheduled prior to getting feedback from the board members about availability. I think what we saw over the weekend and the media that we saw over the weekend was related to somehow public records, whatever the media got a hold of board member Willie's request for an emergency meeting. At no point had that come from me to officially call a meeting, just, just to be clear. I understand. I, I would love to know the process of how an email that went out to us near close of business on Friday ended up all over the news media. As do many things, but it is very yeah. curious. <laughs> um, anybody, thank you for your comments. Um, anybody down here need to make a comment before you vote? Yes, board yeah, member I Poker. just threw the chair to um, uh, board member Pearson. Um, I concur with you on many of your sentiments. I too was broadsided. But in this moment, we have a safety issue, and, and unfortunately, we need to put that aside. And as a board, we need to deal with our I protocols, know. procedures, and, and whatnot with communicating with one another um, and get to the business at hand. And I know, anyway, I just wanted to make sure I concur with you, but we'll put that aside and, and keep moving. Um, any other comments about moving forward with invoking our rulemaking power? Um, I will just say that um, as we sat here tonight, for over six hours now, um, the dashboard has updated. We officially have reported 226 cases for today. So it is clear to me that this is only continuing to be more and more problematic. We have an emergency. We have talked about the many, many layers of mitigation that we are able to, to move forward with. We've talked about the limitations of some of the mitigation strategies that we had in place last year that we are not able to move forward with this year. So I think it is incumbent upon us to, at the very minimum, be able to move forward with what we can uh, for the good of our community. We heard over and over again that what happens in our schools goes back into our community and vice versa. So I will also say to the community and to parents and to families 
that do not want to have to be back here because I don't either. I sent my four-year-old to, to school today in a mask. I don't want to do that. But here we are. So please do your part. If we are in this position where we have to have these hard conversations with hundreds of emails from dozens and dozens of public speakers, this isn't what we want to be doing. But this virus is not getting any better and it's spreading through our schools, spreading through our classrooms, and our children are getting sick and they're taking it back to the community. This is a community problem and we are, I'm just saying I think we should do our part. And this is a simple layer to the myriad of mitigation strategies that we have already moved forward with. So for that reason, I'm happy to vote um, whenever you are ready. By your action, you have passed enacting the emergency rule requiring masks five to two. At this point, we will move into creating the rule, the emergency rule, um, and making sure the language that um, is in this emergency rule is what the board um, intends to be able to pass on to the community and to the superintendent um, and staff for procedures. Um, Ms. Mayors, do you want to walk us through what you need? Yes, um, I think if you don't mind, if we can skip the whereases for now because there are so many and maybe when there's a break, everybody can read and decide what they want or don't want and just go straight to the policy portion and just take it paragraph by paragraph. Um, the first, as to the first paragraph, what I would ask the board to discuss and consider is the way it's currently written is that you're going to wear... The whole thing's going to fall on his face, just so you know. You're way out of your lane. Have a good have a good evening. Thank you for coming. Okay. Really they should both be kicked out because you should not answer them. I know we have very few members left, but please remain silent as we continue to work through this process. Okay, so going back to um, paragraph one, I, the way it's currently drafted is that it's only if you're inside, um, and I'm sorry, I'm on page three, um, page three, the top of page three, um, if you're inside and that would be a, an administrative facility, a building for purposes of school related or school sponsored, of course, inside a school or on, I'm gonna change, I would like to change the bus part to just district provided transportation. I think that's a simpler way to say that. So right now it's covering all of those events. So I would need to ask if that is what um, the board is intending. And then also, do we wanna include something about when they're eating or drinking? I did see that other districts did that, and I don't know how that, if that becomes complicated because they're having snacks in the hallway. Um, and then I put at the end about wearing it outside if you can't physically distance, because I saw where other districts were concerned about when the bell rings and they all flood into areas outside and they're all together to get from point A to point B. So as to, and again, this is kind of the meat of it, um, and a lot of the other stuff is a little bit more technical. Those are the areas I would ask the board to give guidance on. Thank you, Ms. Mayors. Um, just to recap, we want to look at the inside or outside. The intention is to change the language from in a bus or other vehicle to school transportation. Yes. Sponsored transportation. So it would be um, after the, and it should, excuse me, it should say school related or school sponsored events, comma, or in district provided transportation, period. Okay. Does anybody have a problem with changing that language? Okay. Um, so really we're looking at where? Inside, outside, socially you're, distanced? You're looking at the, uh, I have, that we start off with the one opt out. So, do you is, is that opt out okay? Is that the oh, I, only? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're on paragraph one. Uh huh. So I'm on paragraph in one. paragraph one. Because it's 
it starts with subject to the process that provides for a parent to opt out. So that's all in paragraph one. So when okay. you're asking me the list of things, yep. we have to go ahead and address the, the opt out issue and then mm -hmm. the, the inside outside and then the meal time issue. Okay, so let's start, like you said, with the first, um, the first sentence here, we've got um, provides for a parent to opt out their student from this policy due to medical, physical, or psychological condition at, evidenced by medical certification. So at this point, what we are doing is asking for a medical exemption to opt out of the masking requirement um, from a licensed medical provider. I don't see the term licensed medical. It's provided instead of provided. If you go to paragraph two, we'll get into more detail okay. about the opt out. Perfect. Um, are we good with opt out language with medical provisions? Are we in section one? Section yes. one, okay. first, first sentence. So an opt out with medical provisions, I see one head nod yes, two head nods yes, I'm a yes, I'm a yes, or she's a yes, <laughs> everybody's a yes. Not everybody's a yes, I apologize. Um, so I think we're good with the medical. I, I would like to add a comment about this. Um, again, I'm gonna go back to pediatricians don't all agree on this. And so I think that, you know, by doing this, you're creating some inequity because you have some pediatricians that are just going to opt out. It's just another layer that a parent has to go through to get uh, a provision for their, not, their student not to wear a mask. It doesn't, you know, we're not dictating what that is. We're saying psychological, mental, whatever. So they can go to the pediatrician and get the opt out and then, you know, are we creating an environment where some of these parents are like, well, what pediatrician is going to give me an opt out? And we're going to be in another situation where we have kids in schools without masks. Um, so there's, you know, I want to put that on the table for some consideration because, again, it's not a universal, uh, de I mean, everybody doesn't agree. So you will have pediatricians writing opt out forms for their students. The other thing that I would like to, um, address is that when we talk about being indoors so we're talking about and that'll be later but yeah yeah I just okay. make sure I just want to make sure we say one thing at a time so I do see a majority of the board is in favor of a medical opt-out I, I think we do understand that there is um, well, well, I some interest here. Here. I, I actually me? I actually have a comment okay um, I would not have a problem with going with the opt-out that we currently have the parent opt-out through focus. I am comfortable with the numbers hovering at 10%. Um, like I said before, I'm comfortable with our policy. I'm not comfortable with the compliance to the policy. So I would be comfortable with language that is more consistent with parent a parent-controlled opt-out or a parent-directed opt-out um, and not having the extra layer of a medical certification. So it, I've got four head nods, which is a majority of I the know, board for medical. But I'm still going to say what I'm going to say. I appreciate, I appreciate your comment unless there's a change in there of heart. Mm -hmm. Did you have a comment? Um, so then we are on to in school or out of school. Um, Board Chair, I apologize. Um, one that I missed, just to be clear, is right now it has it being at school, school-sponsored events, and transportation. Are we okay with it being all of those places versus one or two of those places before we get to inside-outside? That's the very next section. Okay. So inside a building for purposes of school-related, school-sponsored events or transportation. Do we agree that that is the appropriate place to have masks on? I see a yes. I see a yes. I'm a yes. I see a yes. Okay, we've got okay. four yeses. That seems comprehensive. What's that? That seems comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next piece is what to do while outside? Yes. So. Do we want to get into the detail of if they happen to be outside transitioning in a hallway, but not in a recreation space like a playground or a sports field? 
exactly. to the chair. The only thing I would say about that is think about, um, I'm just trying to think about discretion with enforcement. You know, the more, the mm -hmm. more detailed we get, the more complicated that's gonna get, and we obviously want our teachers to have some level, so I would just caution you on that. I would take the, I would strike that whole sentence. Okay, so I hear uh, just get rid of the whole sentence and only designate inside school buildings, school sponsored events, tr district transportation. I have a question. Yes, board member Joyce. Um, when we talk about inside school sponsored events, so, you know, we, the conversation earlier was um, outside sporting events, football games, but there are a lot of indoor sporting events, wrestling, volleyball, mm -hmm. uh, basketball. And so if we're going, are we actually going to have children, you know, participating in these events wearing masks? I can tell you what happened last year is that for at least for my student is that when they were sitting on the bench, they wore a mask when they were playing because I have a volleyball player. When she was playing volleyball, she was not wearing a mask on the court. She was wearing it when she was sitting on the bench and the spectators were wearing masks. I, I think the question is, does that, does this policy do that? And do we need to add something here? I, I think it's a good point by board that. member Joyce. I don't think it says one way or another. And I think that we probably need to differentiate if we, because I don't think we want, um, at least again, what I saw from other districts is students playing strenuous activities for the mask on. I think the superintendent has a comment. So do we make, oh, did you have a hand up or did you put, oh, Dr. Green. Through the chair, we do have protocols for all of our sports and activities. If they are participating, they are not to wear a mask. It is only if you are sitting on, as stated, if you're not participating and you're, we're not able to social distance, which I can just tell you that we're not, they would wear, they would wear their mask when is they're there, sitting there on the, I hate to say sitting on the bench, but if they're on the bench. Is there a document that we can reference here? Yes, we, I will have to text to find the name of that document, but we do have written protocols for all of our sporting as well as performing arts uh, activities. If you remember, I sent an email out last week. We're 100% capacity outdoors and 75% capacity indoors. And we do have all of that written. Okay. Ms. Mayors, do you think we can just kind of put some language in there that includes the protocols that are outlined by? Yes, just cross-references it, so mm -hmm. it's in effect, absolutely. Um, the only other thing that I would say is that we heard from the doctors today that when we are outside, if we are not able to social distance, so if I'm shoulder to shoulder, even in a stadium, am I being asked, you know, at a large gathering, am I being asked to mask while sitting in the stand? Or are we saying we're outside, but even if the stands are full, no mask required? That's the only other kind of thought that I would have for the board to consider. Uh, again, in practice last year, what I observed is when you go through the gate, when this was when we had the mask policy. When you go through the gate and as you're walking to your seat, you wear a mask. While you're sitting, you don't wear the, you're not required to wear the mask. If you get up to walk around, you need to put the mask back on is what the practice that I participated in last year. Is that when we were at that was capacity football season. limitations? Uh, I think stadiums were, had some limitation on capacity. No, but I, I had football and baseball, so I experienced, and swimming, and I had high school swimming, middle school, I mean, I had it all last year, so. Dr. Green, do you know if the um, sports document covers spectators? Through the chair, off the top of my head, I do not know. Last year is a little different than this year because last year we started with only 30% capacity and then it, it increased as the school year went on. Um, but what Ms. Pearson basically described is pretty much what was done last year. I just can't tell you whether that was, that level of detail was documented about spectators. I'm comfortable with leaving the language out if we can reference whatever the sports thing is. If there's somebody that feels differently about being specific about outdoor use. Okay. Um, so what we'll do is we'll strike the, the, the last, last sentence and then add um, a cross-reference to the athletic policy or procedures. Okay. 
Um, does that cover paragraph one? Any other comments for you all from you all on paragraph one? Do we need to say anything about eating or drinking during meal time? I, I don't need to get into okay. that level of detail. Okay. Personally. <laughs> um, paragraph two. Opt out exemptions. You have a typo. <laughs> Line five is health care provider and not provided. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. And the chair and Ms. Mayors, I might strike um, the in the last sentence a form promptly created by and just say this certification will be set forth on the district face covering medical exemption form. We know the district will create it. Through the chair, you're saying strike that whole final line, this certification? No, not the whole final line, just the, the a form promptly created by, we know the district will create it, so it would just read the certification will be set forth on the district face covering medical exemption form. Okay. Just less, 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 less language. It's editing down. Dr. Green, I know that um, this may be well, I guess I can't say maybe, but is um, new having a, a district face covering medical exemption form. Um, would you anticipate that that would be provided for folks both digitally and in paper format? Through the chair, um, through the board, yes, we can provide it both written um, paper or digitally. So they could take a piece of paper to their provider and just turn it back into the school? Through the chair, yes. Dr. Coker? Through the chair to Dr. Green or potentially uh, Mr. Wright or uh, Mr. Colbert. Um, is it a possibility that parents, so that they don't, are dual working parents and whatnot, don't have to come to the school, that they could upload it and focus? And if it comes from the parent account, we know it's the parent that's done it, just to ease that burden for parents. Through the chair, yes. If, if we were doing it digitally, it's through their focused parent well, portal helped. account. Yeah. So it could be an either right. or? Is that what you're saying? Yes. I mean, my understanding is you're going to have to, put, some people are going to print the form and take it to their doctor like they would a medical. And some doctors may say, send it to me digitally. I think you're going to get a variance depending yeah. upon the technology in the doctor's office. And I think we have to be ready for paper copy or digital. I think my doctors now would do digital, but my doctors a few years ago might have said paper. I don't know. I think my child's pediatrician would have said paper. Okay. I just, I'm doing sports physical forms. I do the three of them a year. They're, phys they're paper. Yeah. And then, um, but for one school, I, um, have to take pictures of it and, and download it into an athletic portal. To be cleared, it's all done digitally. For another school, I hand in a paper packet. So I, I don't know if that's a program or technology per school, but the paper that I take into the pediatrician is a paper, is a paper that I print right. off at home and take in to them. Through the chair case in point, I just think we need to uh, have versatility um, for depending upon how your provider does it um, and, and allow parents that are used to doing paper to bring it in and those that are used to doing it digitally to have a place to, to do that. So no um, change other than striking a form promptly created by? I would just like to revisit the um, the medical certification versus the the opt out form the opt out format that we're using right now. Are we really really sure? Because we're going to get down into the duration and the start date in the next in the next section, and this is going to require someone to at the very least make contact with their doctor, if not 
schedule an appointment with a doctor, which may require a copay. And if it's not the well child checkup, it could be $50 copay to go in to get a form signed. Whereas what we have does not require any financial impact or lost time from work or lost time from school to make an appointment with a doctor and who knows when they can actually get into their doctor for this because we've already heard that pediatricians are backed up seeing COVID cases. So I would really like to, I, I'm, I'm going to continue to pitch <laughs> that we, we stick with the format that we have and not require the medical. Um, my one my one response to that is that you're leaving out an option for families and that is to wear a mask which is also free and does not cause time out of school and does not cause time off of work so you know there is another option there um, for families that might find it burdensome um, and then or until they can get with their provider and I will tell you as a licensed health care provider myself I have families call me all the time and ask for letters for a variety of things um, that I just email them, as Dr. Coker has mentioned. And so it is, I, I know my patients, um, I know what they're going through, and I don't think, um, I, I certainly can't speak for all healthcare providers, but it is much simpler in this day and time to be able to provide digital certification for, for forms. Um, I know to, that there are To board member Joyce's point though, if their pediatrician will not provide it, they may have to find a pediatrician or a, a provider who will. And we would ask that they wear a mask until such time. Okay. Board Member Coker. Uh, through the chair, I, I think we also need to be mindful. I, the, the parent of the ESE, uh, the two autistic children that spoke tonight, I think we've got some real true circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we're going to have to give some grace here to give families like that who have doctors they've been working with for years to work through those systems. Um, and, and so I, I just think we've got to think through if we're going to do this, when do we do it? How much time do you give a parent? Um, I mean, that, that woman, uh, and maybe because I worked with ESE students in my career, I've, I feel her, um, and I'm, I think we all do. I think we all do, and um, I think we've got to be realistic that we truly do have some children that need to have an opt-out medical form. They, yeah. they are going to need it. It is part of a condition that, you know, I mean, when I think of Palm Avenue and some of the centers, there's just a reality. We have some children that are, fra you know, medically fragile, and we, we've got to give some grace um, here to those families. I think that's a good point, Dr. Coker. On board, or excuse me, not board member, Dr. Green. Um, through the chair to the board, last year, our ESE families had that um, opportunity. If you remember my, my little friend uh, mm -hmm. that I worked with, you saw she was not wearing a mask, and she didn't the entire year because there was um, a situation with chewing. So for many of those families, we probably already have their medical Requirements, exemption. I hope it got put in a, 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 um, a CUM folder. That wasn't coming out very quick. A CUM folder so that we have that information. But we did work very closely with, especially our ESC families, our medically fragile children. That's why at places like Palm Avenue, Mount Her they have these, they had these last year the, because we knew many of the children uh, could not wear facial coverings. So through the chair to Dr. Green, am I hearing that if a parent submitted one last year that they could go to the school if they needed, to, I mean, that the school could then procure it yeah. for them and we wouldn't make them go to the doctor again? Through the chair, if it is okay. there, we, I feel we should not make them go again if they already have something at the school that says, you know, for medical reasons, we do not recommend this yeah. student. Through, it, through the chair, but, I think that's a, a great solution that would help a number yes, of the families in this circumstance. So thank you. If, if I could do the chair, it may just be best to take that entire sentence out because I think by calling it, it's, that would be, I guess, a new form because I, I made this name up from another district. So I'm assuming that would be different than what we have now. And I kind of feel like it bootstraps us. 
So I think if we just take that whole last sentence out and then use the procedure, you know, let the, the superintendent or the schools determine um, what that is. And if they've already done something that's obviously substantially similar and it's still applicable, they still have the medical or health condition, then why would we make them do it again? And it would be less burdensome. So I would just suggest maybe taking that last sentence out. Or, through the chair, do you say the certification will be set forth on the appropriate form identified by the district or something along those lines? So we're we saying there that. is a form and we're just not naming it. We're saying it's the one the district identifies and that way we can procure the one from last year. So set forth on a form identified by the district, something like that. Okay. I think, I think we need to clarify that it's a district form, not that my doctor wrote a note. Or an e yeah, yes. I or is sending an email. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that um, may be may be important to have with this um, is that whatever this looks like, that we give some real clear direction. For example, it's not a note from my doctor. Um, does it need to have official letterhead? Does it need to? I mean, are we? You know, those sorts of things, um, should we should maybe just ask that the district um, be clear and directive to families about that, that there's some, I don't know, guidance I, that comes along with that? My thought on that would be to, to leave that to the administration. I know that we already do that, um, you know, with like 504 plans and whatnot, and we always have to receive, you know, um, letters from doctors and yes that does become somewhat of a point of contention if it's too informal um, or if you question the legitimacy of it but i think that that's something that could be handled administratively it, that, that's just that's just my thought we could certainly do that if you wanted to however okay thinking about massaging out that language yeah vice chairman i think it, it makes sense to have some measures in place to remember pearson's point connected but not directly is just teeth like that was the issue with, with the other one and making sure that there's teeth there mm -hmm. and i think adding those pieces will help to add teeth to this so on a form on a form mm -hmm. developed on a district form and provided to parents with guidance or specifications or no, is that too much? Through the chair, could we say this certification will be set forth by a process and format identified by the district? Process and format. Yeah. Like so there's that. steps and format because we need the steps of how you're going to do, yeah. Yeah. get it to us, and then the format is the form itself. So process and format identified by the district. Because back to Board Member Willie's point, there's some steps, and then there's the form. All right, I think that that seems like a good place to land. Thank you, Board Member Coker. Board Member Jones? We're just clear that I think we resolved the issue with the students who had the medical opt out last year. They would be allowed to continue that same opt without having to go back to the district. Yeah, I think that that's part of the process that of the would, district. To okay. me, the reason I put process um, yeah. is that I think there would be a caveat within there that for students who had this form during the 2021 school year, that we will, you know, if that form is available, that that would be used. So it, that could be written in as part of the process. And we can honor whatever accommodations were in place right. for those students previously. You're good, Mr. Miller. Well, thank you for still being here. I can see, yeah. Um, paragraph three. I, I wrote the 90 day period, just putting the max in there. I should have put an underline as well under 90 day period, just wanting to decide up to 90 days how long the board wants that in effect. In, in, in reviewing the calendar, it seemed like it would be good to start it uh, on the 7th of September and end it on the 26th of November. It's not 90 days, but that gives us an opportunity to see what the positivity rate is. It happens the, the Tuesday after Labor Day. That gives people two weeks if they need a medical opt-out. Op and it ends during the uh, Thanksgiving break. 
through, through the chair, are, are, are we saying we're starting the process on September 7th or? Yes. Yeah, in my, in my opinion, I think that, that was, there's too much of a gap. That would be another two weeks, so then we could have a lot of cases, unfortunately. Yeah, we could double our case count to 1,600. I mean, not that we may not, yeah. but at least moving forward, I think I'd, I'd like to try to move forward a little sooner. I was just I was just concerned about the parents who. Mm -hmm. I know I totally understand that. Who and need to get to a doctor? I mean, they may not be able to get. get yeah. I would feel more comfortable with. A week from the day. A week. I am I am not comfortable with only a week. I mean I I think I'll lose this, but I'm just gonna say. I appreciate your input. I am I am not comfortable with only a week. It's really sometimes really hard to reach doctors, mm -hmm. and to get calls back, and um, and sometimes it is hard to get an appointment if you need an appointment. And as a working parent, and I think we've all experienced this, trying to get a call back from a doctor is really hard sometimes. Um, and so I would give people two weeks. And through the chair, I think we need to be realistic. We potentially could have thousands of children's parents who are inundating pediatricians' office in just a minute with this. So we've got to give pediatricians time to get through this process as well. Um, anyway, and to that your is, point. That is a fair point. And I know in my neighborhood, m most people use one or two pediatricians. Um, and that it's probably similar in other neighborhoods that there are. So what's a date you're comfortable with, Board Member Coker? Um, I could go, I, I like the idea, a week and a half to two weeks, um, I, at least a week and a half. But I can go to two, uh, to I, the, at the majority of the board um, on that. With the caveat that we're encouraging, let's get started on this too. With so the population in general. September 3rd, the Friday before Labor Day. Be, which means yeah. when, when students come back on September 7th. Yeah. I mean, That's I, why I use the effective date, September the 7th. Why, yeah, yeah I, I will tell you, I, and I may lose this one, but I will <laughs> say for the record, what I'm hearing is a lot of trying to accommodate folks and being able to opt out. And for me, I would like people to be masked. We have a real problem on our hands. So um, I think we need to get masked and we need to have more kids masked um, sooner. Um, but again, I may lose this one, so i Through the chair, I was in the same notion. I mean, if we, we call an emergency meeting, we just got 200 new cases. If we think it's gonna mitigate it faster, and I get that there's pieces that we have to put in place, but hopefully we won't have 10% that are getting a medical opt-out so we have less cases and less pressure on the system. So I think the sooner we do it, the better, um, and the less cases we're gonna, gonna have. And that middle period is, it, 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 it gets dangerous if you okay. don't know and, and whatnot. I would, if not effective immediately, I would do beginning of next week. The 30th, is there Correct. any is there any appetite for the 30th? No, not for me, no, no. We got, that's four no's. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so it's September 7th is the next commencing date. I don't understand the including. It, it's, it, it, it's not well written there. Okay. So you either want to put what period of time, 30, 60, 90, 45 days, or you want to put an end date, one or the other. So I think more importantly, just to discuss how long do you want it in effect for up to 90 days? Well, I think as we get into section four, where we have the opportunity to look at our community health data um, and to allow the district to work with our Department of Health or other health professionals, you know, and the, and the possibility for this to be able to lift, right? I mean, this isn't something I think we all want to do. So if our data comes down, then we revert, we can lift this mask policy. For, so for that reason, I would be comfortable with just the full 90 day period. Okay, so for a 90 day period, and did y'all say commencing on September 7th? Is that where we landed on the commence date? Okay, 
Are you all comfortable if that if the data allows us to switch it up? And if not, then we would extend through the full extent of the, the rule, emergency rulemaking authority at 90 days. Yeah. Uh, through, uh, through the would you repeat one more time all the way through to make sure I'm processing correctly? So we have authority to set to with the emergency rule to set an emergency rule that would exist for 90 days right. commencing on. Um, in the next paragraph, what it says here is that the superintendent shall develop procedures to be approved by the board. Um, September 7th happens to be our next board meeting um, that provide for certain health data points to result in an automatic suspension or, or activation of this emergency policy. So the superintendent would come back with, after consulting and say, if the community transmission gets to this, then that would suspend this emergency rule. Mm -hmm. And I think it should, I think it should read reactivation because if you guys pass it, it's going to be activated. So the question is, does it ever get suspended and then so reactivated? So I would change that to reactivation. Thank so. you. Thoughts for member Coker? We're kind through, of combining through, in paragraph four here. Through the chair to Dr. Green, um, I'd like to know her thoughts on being able to put that together and feel comfortable. We've heard how this Delta variant's different than other variants. And so the data you used last year is different than this year. Um, how do you feel about being able to hit a metric that you're comfortable with in that short a period of time? Or do you feel you need more time to, I, I just want to, I, it's a, that's a heck of a call. And I want to make sure that Dr. Green has the opportunity, if she needs more time to get to that point, then um, I just, and if she's good with it, then she's, you know, I just want to be respectful of the fact that she's going to have to talk with people. They're going to have to, yeah. Through the chair to board member Coker, we are constantly in conversation with our medical health professionals who have been giving advising us. And so I think we still will have it completed um, by September 7th. The issue uh, is at a certain point, the agenda has to post for the public. And so it's really not September 7th. And I just need to see what that March 31st would, or uh, August would be seven days. After. August 31st, seven days. Yeah. So we will, we will meet with the, our health professionals between now and before next Tuesday. Okay. Um, I will say for the record um, that as we consider what data points um, to look at here. Um, I am curious, and as I've spoken with health professionals in the community and um, whether or not there would be an interest in including not, maybe it's cases per 100,000 or percent positives or whatever it is our health officials say, but whether or not we also look at a, me a vaccination metrics um, and if our community is able to reach a certain point of vaccination, um, that that may also be a consideration because I do think uh, what we continue to hear over and over again is that the best way to really get through this is going to be um, vaccination. So it wouldn't be the only, but maybe a piece of the data that we might look at as a threshold um, if people are amenable to that. So through, through the chair, so if, you, if we enacted something with vaccination rates and percent positivity, we could, if it was before the 90 days, we could suspend it. But then it also says activation of this emergency policy. So if it went in a different direction, even past the 90 days, we would go back into this? I think the rule only exists for 90 days, so within the 90 day period. So you go up and back in and out of it in 90 days? Yeah, yeah. until you establish through normal rulemaking a, a regular policy dealing with, you know, the superintendent's authority during communicable diseases and giving her that or putting in those, those guidelines. Right, we'll have to keep going back to it. Dr. Coker. Through the chair, and I wanna make sure I, I very clearly communicate, I already mentioned it earlier, that, that that's going to be my end game, is to get us out of emergency yep. rulemaking and into an expansive policy around communicable diseases. And, and let, I, I recognize, I, and I wanna make sure Dr. Green has the right amount of time to craft a policy that really makes sense but I, I, I think we've got to get there and get out of this emergency rulemaking place. 
Great. So that parents know what to expect, teachers know what to expect, principals know what to expect. We're all, we, we know where we are. The nice thing about this kind of window is that our community would know. They could rely on it. They could, they could look at the data and say, oh my gosh, we're getting close to that. Oh, the school district is going to have us put masks back on. You know, and, and so we all take a shared responsibility for our kids and our community in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. You're good. I'm just going to say that sounds exhausting to me as a parent. It does. And, so and, how do we, and, how do and we I don't this? even have little kids. How do we keep this beat? No, that's not what I think is exhausting. Is the fact that we're going in, you know, we can be going in and out and in and out. And that I, well, we can talk about that more later, though. So you're good on paragraph three, paragraph four. We're almost there. So, so the ending date would be 90 days from September the 7th. Is that what right. we agreed to? So we might we the language would say for the 90-day period commencing on September. Or for 7th. a 90-day period, yes, commencing on September 7th. Period. Okay. Oh. Huh. Maybe. The, All right. So for 90 Base. days. And that's, that takes, that's that's uh, total days, not school days. Total calendar days. Total calendar. Calendar days. And should, and, and should I also put something about subject to paragraph four? Because, again, depending on what she comes back with, that can affect that 90-day period. So I think I should put something in about it being subject to. But the whole rule, I mean, that's part of the rule. Right. The whole rule is in effect for 90 days, and the rule includes paragraph four. Right, but if the rule is seen as, I know, I understand what you're saying. It's a little bit of a logistical, but if, the, if yeah, the rule is a mask yeah. mandate and then we get to a certain, a, a lower level that causes the mask mandate to um, be suspended, was that the, I'm sorry, yeah, suspended, then I don't want to confuse people by them thinking that the mandatory mask rule is still in effect for the 90. That's fine. I don't. Okay. Is anybody opposed to adding subject to paragraph okay. four? Sorry. Paragraph five, basis for the emergency rule. The only other thing that I would consider adding is the, uh, the additional ample testimony we've heard from what, you know, even if it wasn't just tonight, we've gotten The lost. testimony we heard tonight, add that to? Not just tonight. So mm -hmm. communication maybe from communi the community, is okay. that, because we've gotten lots of, lots of communication. Well, communication from the professional health community, health providers. Yes, and. and I mean, we had almost a dozen doctors at our August yeah. meeting that wasn't tonight. Yeah. I don't know if it strengthens the case. Okay, so I'm sorry. I understand you want it to be um, communication that even predated tonight, but do you guys, do you want that from a professional, the professional health community or both the professional health community and community at large? I, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure. I would say the professional, professional health community. Yeah. They're, they're the experts. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can add that. Dr. Green. Through the chair, I'm sorry, Can I was raising my hand for number four. I apologize. No problem. We'll go back. Um, when we look at, this is, this section of number four is only for the 90 days. Uh, 
I, I do not feel comfortable that I would be taking students in mandatory, out of mandatory, back in within 90 days. I would think if, if, hmm. if things drop that low, it needs to be for a period of time that that suspension is going to take you out of the whole 90 days. Because that's all this is for, 90 days. I could see if you wanted this, if this was your permanent rulemaking, so for communi uh, communicable diseases, mm -hmm. then certain things activate. But since this is only for 90 days, I truly feel it, it, it's a um, medical professionals are going to tell me that, oh, if you're at 15 percent for seven straight days, that's when you used to su suspend it. So mm -hmm. what happens when it goes to 16 on day 10 later? Even if it would need to be a huge swing to say, oh, no, we're coming back to mandatory mass, if that's what um, this section is saying. I, I really feel like since it is temporary for 90 days, it should only be about an automatic suspension, not suspension and then come back and activate. I mean, because the suspension could be coming like day 80. I agree. However, I'm going to do whatever the board asked me to do. But so another, as I'm sitting here thinking, about another thought then would be to potentially keep the 90, but to go ahead and start the regular rulemaking process as to a, you know, communicable diseases. I mean, we could get that started um, instead of waiting until after this expires. That's just another idea. Oh yeah. I mean, I I certainly think that that's an important piece of this process. Really, this for me, in my mind, is 90 days is kind of a long time. You know, we asked our staff to be masked for 30 days and then we would revisit it. Um, so while I am a proponent of masking and I don't want to talk out of both sides of my face here, um, you know, I do think that there are times where our community may get well, where we may see our vaccination rates go up. Um, and this won't be as pressing of an issue. And then I would love to be able to afford the flexibility to kids and families um, accordingly because it isn't fun and it is hard um, to be in a mask for seven hours as we have done here tonight. Um, so I'll, I'll just bring it back to the board one more time, paragraph four. Do we, we, we want to have provisions within the 90 day period that may suspend the emergency policy um, with masking requirements. I'm fine with the word suspension. I would strike or reactivation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So it, we, because we'd have to go through a process of declaring an emergency unless we change the policy. So if if the policy, if, if the rate went up again, we, it would be automatic suspension, which I think gets us where we need to be, and we wouldn't. They could not be re. We couldn't reimpose that policy until this board acted again. Uh, Dr. Cooper, sorry. Through the chair to Ms. Mayers or potentially um, to Assistant Superintendent Young, um, if we were to start moving forward on a policy like we've talked about on communicable diseases, say it takes us four weeks to craft it. I mean, I, we need to be thoughtful and this is not something we're gonna do overnight. We also have to advertise for it and then we have to put it, uh, what what kind of a time frame are we looking at um, on that? Because I would hate, anyway, I just wanna make sure the times of all of this are choreographed well. And, and I, I believe that would be, if you're saying approximately four weeks to craft and then we have the 28 20 day days. Um, notice. And so we're looking at then about two months. Is that correct, Ms. Young? The first of November. That would be 56 okay. days. M Mr. Rubio, mm -hmm. do you mind if I call on you for just a second? Um, when we're watching the health data in the community, how quickly are we seeing big swings? Is that something that happens within a day or two? Or usually we see um, maybe a, it kind of bounces around a couple percentage points and then slowly trickles up what is well how does the data behave 
So to answer your question to the, to, to the, to the board, to, through the chair, um, what we've seen with this variant, seeing the start of uh, August, really the end of July, is we saw numbers go up quickly, and now we're seeing it kind of bouncing. So, so one day we could easily have, you know, 12, 1,300 cases in the, in the community, and the next day we could be down to 900 cases. So um, it, it's quite difficult to see that, but I think what we've seen in other countries with, with this Delta variant is that if we can get a hold of it, we might see it decrease quickly. And I think that's where this opt-out maybe is looking at, but I think we need to have some discussions with the epidemiologists and with the medical professionals, which is what Dr. Green would like to be able to do, to really come up to say, if this set of circumstances occur, we feel confident that we think we're on the downside and things are getting better. I, I don't want to... You know, we have to be very careful because what we see for one or two days doesn't mean that we're seeing a change. A 5% case swing. How quickly do we think we could see something like that? From a, an 8% to a 12% maybe. Again, you, you know, that, I know, it's very, I know it's very difficult to say that because it all depends about, are, are you talking about a, a vaccinated, unvaccinated population? Are you talking about a dense population versus a rural population? Ours. Well, right. So, I mean, so, so right, for, for, but, but again, even within a community like, like Duval, what we're saying is we have different circumstances. I have people in high density uh, uh, living situations. I have people who have single family homes. I mean, even, even those factors can make a big difference as to the spread of disease, and, and especially when you're talking about a highly contagious communicable disease like COVID 19. So I, I, I would defer to allow us to, to work with some of the epidemiologists and the medical doctors and seeing if we can get with Dr. Green and get something for you that would, that would work for you. That okay. Simply not answer your question. I'm very sorry. No, that's, but I mean, that's fine. I'm just trying to decide whether or not we want to keep this language in here. Um, it sounds like there is some satisfaction with the suspension, but there is a desire to remove the reactivation. Is that... Accurate. Okay. In the meantime, we're working on policy. We are good with paragraph five, paragraph, I think we're good with paragraph five, paragraph six. Um, I don't, there's nothing. See anything. Okay. I think that just leaves the whereas clauses and, and understand as your attorney, once I, if, if I am drafting this with the thought that my board is going to make it a certain decision, I'm going to write in everything I can to protect you. That does not mean that it needs to, um, to, to stay here. And so certainly, you know, take a look at those and, but I, I know they're, they're lengthy. So it, you know, you may need a break to do that. I have one question. <laughs> Board Member Jones. Sure. On the, on the second page, I see you have the 2020, 2021-2022 school year began on August the 3rd. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. 10th. 10th. Okay. There's probably a couple if we of could, days. If we could Teachers. update the next whereas clause to include today's numbers. Yeah. Okay. And the following whereas mm -hmm. to have the appropriate percentage reflected. On the second one, yeah. <laughs> the second warehouse is lowercase. Um, I think what is appropriate is to be able to get um, to get this document finalized and this language nailed down by Miss Mayors um, for us to be able to uh, adopt the rule. We would need to take a break. Contract. I would also. Uh huh. Uh, through the chair, there was a third page, third page, third whereas, third whereas where it speaks to. I don't know if that's the accurate information. Mass usage benefit of keeping children in school for in person learning, and it says it's not considered close contact. Is that how we describe close contact? The way we describe it? I when, I, two, when two people have a mask on. Right. If DOH has two people have a mask on, 
I don't think it. I think if there's a timing issue element in there, if they're close to each other for a certain amount of times, I just I don't know if that's how we determine if it's positive or if they don't have the quarantine. I, the way that this was written is not what we did last year because yeah, right. we wouldn't You're have right. had many kids quarantine because they were all wearing masks. Right. You're right. So this is not accurate for what we did last year. This would have been nice, out. actually. That's fine. So um, I think. We can take that out or we can make it accurate either which way. Um, I, I mean, I can look I and like see what the I like the spirit of the whereas. I think you can just eliminate everything after the first COVID-19. Yes. COVID-19 period. What? Wait. But uh, I don't think it makes, but I'm not sure it no, makes it sense. No, it doesn't because you have when. Yeah. Oh. I mean, we could just stop at or learning or after masks. learning. Yeah. Through the chair, I would, yeah, Ms. Mayors, I agree. Mask usage is beneficial in keeping children in school. I, I think you could stop it right there. And after, after the word school? For in person, in -person learning, learning period. period. Yep. Okay. After the because. Okay, can we take a break to get this um, language worked out? If you have additional, um, you know, minor, uh, what is it called? Grammatical comments for Ms. Mayor. Um, let her know and then we will reconvene. Um, let's take a recess and reconvene at nine. How much time do you need, Ms. Mayor? Can we do 20, or excuse me, can we do 920? Can we be back there? We can definitely try. Yes. Okay. We will be recessed.
Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Not thirty, not thirty, not thirty. Not 30. <laughs> I don't think it's for me. I don't think it's for me. I don't think it's for me. I do Was that school board that you saw, Cindy? Where, where was that? Um, the, the, the one that needs to be capitalized? It was on um, three. I got it. Three. Page three. Page three, the bottom, second from the bottom. Got it. Okay. 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 You can probably go if you want to. You can probably. Okay. She's pretty. 
go unless the superintendent needs you. I don't, I think we. You can hang out if you want, but. I can't see it through. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. We're almost there. I see it through now. I know. I did. I sent it to me. I have it memorized. Your sentence is right there. I mean, I can try again. Yeah, normally I do it in there, but because it's so high. It has a tendency to go Oh my god, she hasn't Yeah, because I'm changing one more thing. I am not defecting from one Yep, I am. Yep, I forgot to take one sentence out. So oh, a couple more hours. Okay, I'm doing it right now. Unless we're well outside, yeah. I can take that out. Okay. All right, save as version two. <laughs> this is almost tomorrow morning, Kelly. <laughs> okay, B2. At what time? Okay. I need to go through the list of the people in the class and just kind of start meeting with people because you didn't really get to know people.
This is the code of conduct I'm writing. We need, a, we need a printer up in our classroom if we're going to keep waiting on this. I feel like last time we made an emergency rule. I was like, we don't do this. We're going to have a little unusual. Here we are. Well, I think that's Kelly's point is it should be. Hey, uh, Kelly, you know, we don't have a lot of time. Should be. I can go on with this. I can go on with this. I can talk to them. We go on with this. We have to talk to But, like, in July, we can look at <laughs> I think we all just thought it was going to go up. I mean, I don't think there's not another. Yeah, what do you think about that? Because we just didn't think it was going to be a forever thing. Well, I don't think it's a forever thing. Yeah. It'd be interesting if it was permanent, but so I could. You still don't have to. Hot paper, hot paper. She got him. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I, I was just going to wing it. Okay, well, here's the whole thing that what the motion's called in the actual paragraph. This, this is code of conduct. Joy, can you email that to me? Okay. Can you just email it to me? Yes. I have my email right here. Okay. Okay, I think we all have nice warm papers off the printer. Um, so we will go ahead. Duval County School Board is now reconvened in a special meeting. We have our newly drafted emergency rule of the School Board of Duval County. Um, Ms. Mayors, if you think it's appropriate, we'll read through this and then we would need a motion to adopt the rule. Okay, do you want me to read it? Is that it? correct? Yes. I can read it if that would <laughs> your brain has been working hard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Emergency rule of the Duval County of the school board of Duval County, excuse me. Clearly my brain's struggling too. Whereas Article 9, 
Section 1 of the Florida Constitution provides for a uniform, efficient, safe, secure, and high-quality system of free education, and whereas to achieve a uniform, efficient, and safe school system, the Florida Constitution <coughs> created school boards, Article 9, and whereas the Florida Constitution grants the school boards the right to operate, control, and supervise all free public schools, see Article 9, Section 4, Florida Constitution, and whereas the School Board of Duval County, Florida, the school board, is a duly elected body, and whereas the school board is responsible for the proper attention to health, safety, and other matters relating to the welfare of students, Florida Statute 1001.42, subsection 8A, and whereas the school board also has supplemental powers to adopt programs and policies to ensure appropriate response in emergency situations, Florida Statute 1001.43, Section 7, and whereas Duval County Public Schools is one of the largest school districts in Florida, whereas the School Board of Duval County values the health, safety, and welfare of its students and the district staff, and whereas the Delta variant of COVID-19 has been shown to be highly transmissible, and whereas the Governor of Florida issued Executive Order 21-175, which in part directed the Florida Department of Health and the Florida Department of Education to immediately execute emergency rule to ensure safety protocols for controlling the spread of COVID-19 in schools. And whereas the Florida Department of Health executed emergency rule 64-DER-21-12, which provides in part, student may wear masks or facial covering as a mitigation measure. However, the school must allow for a parent or legal guardian of the student to opt out the student from wearing a face covering or mask, and whereas the 2021-2022 school year began on August 10th, 2021 in Duval County, and whereas after only 10 days of school, 815 cases of COVID-19 were reported to FDOH, of those, 111 involved staff and 704 involved students who reported a positive COVID-19 result, and whereas a total of 2,498 cases were reported in total on the school's dashboard for the 2021 school year, meaning that in less than a week of the 2021-2022 school year beginning, DCPS was already at 19% of the total cases reported for the entire 2020-2021 20, school year, whereas the Florida Department of Health has admittedly been unable to complete contact tracing, case investigations, and timely notification to impacted families regarding the results of the investigation, whereas of the 895 COVID-19 positive cases reported this year, only 106 cases have been completed and closed by the FDOH, whereas due to an immediate danger to public health, safety, and welfare that required emergency action, an emergency meeting of the school board was called by the chair as well as other board members to immediately address the emergency and whereas the school board of Duval County heard from the Duval County Department of Health and medical experts and doctors at numerous meetings predating the emergency meeting as well as the August 23rd, 2021 emergency meeting and whereas the doctors and medical experts testified that wearing of masks and vaccines are the most effective tools for controlling the spread of COVID-19 in schools and whereas masks protect the wearer and those around them by protecting against the transmission of large droplets from one person to another, and whereas mask usage in benef is beneficial to keeping children in school, and whereas the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, previously stated there is no adequate approved and available alternative to the emergency use of face masks for source control by the general public to help prevent the spread of the virus due to face mask shortages during the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas the emergency rule executed by the Department of Health does not prohibit the requirement of a medical certificate for opting out, and whereas the emergency rule adopted by the School Board of Duval County gives the decision opting out of facial covering requirement to the parent with a medical certification, and whereas the Center for Disease Control recommends children in school wear facial coverings indoors. Now, therefore, the School Board of Duval County enacts the following emergency rule pursuant to Section 120.54 Florida Statute and Board Policy 2.25. Paragraph 1. Subject to the process that provides for a parent to opt out their student from this policy due to a medical, physical, or psychological condition evidenced by a medical certification, see paragraph 2, all students must wear a face covering that covers both the nose and mouth at all times while inside a school or any administrative facility, inside a building for purposes of school-related or school-sponsored events, 
except as provided in administrative guidance for district athletics and performing arts, which will be conspicuously posted at district athletics and performing arts events, or on, non, or on district approved transportation. Paragraph two, opt out slash exemptions. A face covering will not be required when it would cause an impairment due to an existing health condition as evidenced by medical certification. To claim an exemption opt out due to an existing health condition, the district will require a medical certification from a licensed healthcare provider that the student has a medical, physical, or psychological condition that prevents the student from being able to safely wear a face covering and a description of the medical reason. This certification will be set forth on a form identified by a process and format by the district. Paragraph three, duration of emergency rule. The emergency rule was approved by the school board on August 23rd, 2021 for a 60 day period commencing on September 7th, 2021, except as set forth in paragraph four. Paragraph four, further action required. The, the superintendent shall develop procedures to be approved by the board on September 7th, 2021 that provide for certain health data points to result in an automatic suspension of this emergency poly policy while such policy is in effect. Paragraph five, basis for emergency rule. This emergency rule approved is based upon the school board's findings at the emergency meeting held August 23rd, 2021, including but not limited to the number of students and staff in the DCPS reporting positive COVID-19 tests, FDOH's admitted inability to conduct timely case investigations, which has a direct impact on the spread of the virus throughout our schools and communication predating and occurring at the August 23rd, 2021 meeting from the professional health community. Paragraph six, procedural fairness afforded. This, the meeting was properly noticed on August 22nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. and amended and reposted on August 23rd, 2021 at 9 a.m. Is there a motion to adopt the emergency rule of the school board of Duval County? In discussion, okay. is there a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Vice Chairman Willie, seconded by Board Member Jones. Discussion, Ms. Pearson. Yes, I would like to point out three typos. On the second page, the third whereas from the bottom, it's a semicolon, should be a comma. Okay. Whereas the 895. Okay. And then. Page. On the fourth page, first paragraph. Board member Pearson, is your mic on? It is. It's just pointed to the side. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on the fourth page, first paragraph, near the bottom of the paragraph, we have the word district. It's capitalized once and not capitalized twice, so we should be consistent. You have capitalized it throughout. Yes. I'll so go ahead. Okay. I would go ahead and do that. Got it. Okay. So there's some non-substantive adjustments to be made there. May I um, make one more non-substantive, if you don't mind, on paragraph three, where it says duration of emergency rule. I would just like for the parenthetical to be moved to after for a 60 day period. So it's not confusing. Paragraph four does not affect the commencement date. It affects the length of the rule. So I just would want to skew that directly after the word period on paragraph three. So I, I also have this circled because I thought our conversation was a 90 day period. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Then I will correct that. So I thought we landed on 60. I'm sorry. Is there a motion to amend this language to a 90 day? So moved. Second. Move to amend at paragraph three. Okay. To a 90 day period. Is there a second? Do I hear second board member Jones? Motion by um, board member Pearson. Can, can we just do a voice vote? Okay. Um, all those in favor of amending paragraph three to, to a 90 day period commencing on September 7th? We'll do a voice vote. Board member Hershey? No. Yes. No. Yes. 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 By your action, you've approved the amendment five to two. Um, back on to the original motion uh, as amended. Any other discussion on the item as amended? 
I have one other yes. um, question on the second page. One, two, three. The fourth, whereas. I'm not sure that this percent of total cases is accurate, or is that, I just want to double check. In less than a week of the 2021 school year beginning, so DCPS we, was we at 19%. Is that an accurate? I think what, Mr. Zito, we didn't recalculate the 19% because we kept that at a week instead of the 10 days. Um, I mean, we can, that's why that paragraph is going back to a week, whereas the rest of it's a 10 day count, just because we didn't recalculate that. But so okay. I think it's technically accurate, but if. I just wanted to make sure the num the calculation I did based on our counts today brought us today to a different percentage. It, it would but be it, different it, for today. And so if you want me to change that and um, that I, that's why I put that in less than a week. As long as that's accurate, that's yes. fine. I just wanted to double check. We didn't have missed okay. calculated data. Um, okay. okay, so then what we have on the floor is a motion to adopt the emergency rule of the School Board of Jubal County as amended. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I call for your vote. By your action, you have approved the emergency rule five to two. All right, our next item of business tonight, um, in order to align the dress code with the emergency rule that we have just adopted, um, we need to consider a motion to amend <clears throat> the previous motion approving changes to the student code of conduct only as it per pertains to the face mask portion, um, which you can find in the code that I provided to you, page seven under note eight. I think we've had a chance to take a look at this and I see um, I, I see what you've what you sent me but can you go ahead if you wouldn't mind and explain um, what your recommendation would be to align yeah. this so if you look at what our current um, code of conduct says and again what you were referring to note 8 where it says face mask on page 7 give me just one moment So I think the um, appropriate motion would be a motion to amend the motion, approving changes to student code of conduct only as it pertains to face mask, which was previously adopted on August 3rd, 2021, by deleting all the language currently under note eight, face mask in the student code of conduct, except for the last two italicized sentences and replacing it with, um, and then it's basically that first paragraph from what we just did. So you're taking out everything after face mask except for the italicized sentence and you're replacing it with, um, is it okay if I read it? Please. Okay. Subject to the process that provides for a parent to opt out their student from this policy due to a medical, physical, or psychological condition evidenced by a medical certification, all students must wear a face covering that covers both the nose and the mouth at all times while inside a school or any administrative facility, inside a building for purposes of a school-related 
or school-sponsored events, except as paren, except as provided in administrative guidance for district athletics and performing arts, which will be conspicuously posted at district athletics and performing arts events, or on district-approved transportation. And then I put C, emergency rule enacted August 23rd, 2021, and effective September 7th, 2021, for a 90-day period. So that's what would go in the actual code of conduct, followed by the two italicized sentences. Thank you, Ms. Mayors. Is there a motion to amend the motion approving changes to the student code of conduct? So moved. Moved by Board Member Coker. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Board Member Jones. Um, Ms. Mayors has just read the replacement language. You can find the language again in the emergency rule that we just adopted under paragraph one. Um, and that would replace all of the words except for the italicized sentences currently um, in the code of conduct. Um, is there discussion on the motion to amend the motion? Previous motion. No. Um, I have one question, Ms. Mayors. Is this good for 90 days? Well, we yes. have to come back and address the dress code again. We're going, it's the same, it's the 90 days. So, so we'll all of it has to be revisited again. Correct. Okay. Any other discussion? I, hold on. And through the chair. Pearson. This paragraph states the what, but it doesn't state the for how long. Um, So Ms. Ms. Mayor's recommendation would be to include the sentence that says, see emergency rule enacted August 23rd, okay. 2021, effective September 7th for a 90 day period. So if- so it takes the first sentence of the paragraph. So if the superintendent got the guidance to suspend, then that would also be consistent with what's here because we're referencing this. I think so. Got it, okay. Do you feel like that's accurate, Ms. Mayor's? Let me just Since we're citing really the emergency rule. Sorry. Yes, because we're referring them for to the to actual the rule. rule itself. And I think that we've got subject to paragraph four. But it, I mean, if you want me to further specify, um, for a 60, um, I can, why don't I put the same thing in here, subject to paragraph four of the emergency rule. Except And then it will be a question. So at the end where it says for a 90 day period, I can say paren subject to paragraph four of the emergency rule. And then there's not a question. Okay. Through the chair, where, did, where would this, like this is living in the student code of conduct, where, did, where would the emergency order live? Like where would someone? It's going to be like a, um, a, a policy. It's gonna be in the policy manual. Um, okay. It's I, I don't, I, I mean, I'll leave that to Ms. Young. I don't think it will get a number since it's temporary, but I, that's where it will live, it. is in the policy manual. Board Member Coker. Through the chair to Ms. Mayors, just as a, I'm just making sure, and I'm sure this is an easy answer and it'll work, but um, at the school level, everybody's already signed off on this um, document. They sign off on the document as to whatever format it is mm -hmm. in board policy, or did we just, Through the chair to board member Coker, because you just passed an emergency rule, um, it would probably be in our best interest to send something else out because I assure you, someone thinks it starts tomorrow. Another group says, well, no, it doesn't. So we will probably send something out very formal. Um, we'll do it electronically and paper wise for those who can't who don't have their parent portal. Okay, all right. Thank you, good question. Um, the only other question I have, Dr. Green, um, when we look at this language, Ms. Pearson brought up previously the idea of, um, you know, giving some authority to teachers and schools 
to ensure that these protocols are being followed. Does the language um, here, do you feel like that allows your staff to be able to um, move forward with authority and requiring masks unless there is an opt out? Through the chair to the board, um, this is under dress code. So the fact that it states mandatory and the only options that are available to opt out of it is um, a medical, we would need medical documentation. Um, I, I was trying to find last year's to see whether well, there's something different, but I, I'm not, I haven't been able to access it. Um, any other discussion on the motion to amend? Seeing none, I call for your vote. action you have amended the previous motion of the section of the code of student conduct previously adopted on August 3rd 2021 pertaining to face masks by a vote of five to two I think that brings us to the end of our business I don't even know where my script is anymore So I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Board Member Coker, seconded by Board Member Jones. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Fashion.